The Justice League just broke the source wall, and the ramifications are far-reaching. This is Comic Story. I create audio dramas of your favorite comic books, leaving out enough that there is still something for you to collect, be it the extra plot, context, or the artwork. All alterations are for copyright purposes, and I do these dramatic readings because I have fun doing it. Now today we're going to be covering the 2018 Justice League run that took place right after Dark Knight's Metal. Dark Knight's Metal concluded with the Justice League breaking the source wall, which was at the edge of the universe. So what happens when the edge of the universe is broken? Well, that's this storyline, which is Justice League No Justice and then the entire Justice League run, which I hope you enjoy. Since before time, the Green Lanterns have been tasked with keeping peace across 3,600 sectors of space. But today, the Green Lanterns face something that they never thought they'd see. As Hal Jordan flies to the crowd, he asks John what's with the call for every ring in the universe. And John tells him, simply put, we're dealing with a cosmic ocean of destruction. Anything that we send it just disintegrates. It's like our universe is a leaking raft into toxic sea. Hal then says, I know the Justice League didn't mean to do whatever this is. We had to do whatever we could to stop the dark multiverse. This is just a crack. How bad could it be? Guy pushes Hal aside yelling, Really? This is the source wall! You and your friends broke the damn universe! The old rule book just went up in smoke. At that exact moment, all across Earth, all of the different hero factions are called to action against a threat that would require them all. Brainiac is invading Earth. As he battles Earth's heroes, he tells them, I see you for what you are. And hear me when I say you are not prepared for what you have unleashed. Superman flies in, punching Brainiac, yelling, I will not allow you to take this world. Do you know how many protocols we have at the slightest hint of danger? Right now, the entire city's being evacuated, meaning I don't have to hold back. He hits Brainiac again, sending him through a nearby building, but as Superman grabs a hold of him, again, Brainiac says, You delude yourself. Allow me to illuminate. Brainiac grabs Superman's head, and small probes shoot out of his arm, showing Superman a vision of the future. The one where he, Brainiac, can easily defeat them. But he did not come here to adopt this world. He came here for its heroes. Not as they are, but as they can be. Superman struggles to free himself, telling him, We will fight! And Brainiac tells him, yes, and you will fail. Which is the precise reason I have come for you. A flash of light washes over everyone, and the heroes soon begin to wake back up, but not on Earth. In one room, Starfire and Beast Boy wake up alongside Zatanna and Harley Quinn. Beast Boy, already in the form of a bear, snarls at Harley. And Zatanna jumps up yelling, okay, we all need to calm down here. No one is killing or eating anyone. But as they all do begin to calm down, Zatanna looks at her clothes, asking, were these the outfits they were wearing when they lost consciousness? As all of them look at their uniforms, forms and the lights attached to them, Beast Boy says, Huh, this is some next level creepy. Zatanna heads to the door and says that she really doesn't understand what's going on, but they need to focus on getting out of here. Harley looks around and says that all of the heroes are so polite. My squad would have just blown a hole in the wall. In fact, that's what the others are probably doing. She pulls a panel off the wall, exposing some wires, and as she crosses them, she's shocked. But the door Zatanna is working on suddenly opens. Zatanna quietly says that she doesn't like this, but Starfire walks ahead, stating that she can hear voices ahead. Hopefully, their friends are doing better. Up in the next room, Damian Wayne yells at Dr. Fate, stating, If you tell me to calm down one more time, I will tell you your fate! If you're not gonna help me find Brainiac, I will go out myself and... But as Damian turns, he bumps into Brainiac and Batman tells him, Calm down. Brainiac, leading the members of the Justice League, tells them, It's alright, you're among allies here. Starfire begins to shout, asking, Allies, what are you talking about? As Superman says, I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. Starfire then asks, How can you be so sure? And Brainiac holds up his hand, holding Wonder Woman's lasso, stating, I believe you all understand what the Amazon's lasso is capable of. I do not have time to ask you kindly. It was to illustrate your weakness and prove my course of action. What we are about to face is something old, older than even my civilization. There is a myth of four brothers, impossibly powerful cosmic gods, each embodying one of the fundamental energies of sentient life. They are called the Omega Titans. Anthropy, wisdom, wonder, and mystery. Each believed that their core energy would be the dominant power of intelligent life. And to prove themselves, they have planted the seeds of cosmic energy into world after world. At the end of the universe, the story says that they would return to these civilizations that grew over eons, and the winning brother would reabsorb that world. With the source wall breaking, it has set these beings into motion. They are ready to begin the systematic destruction of all sentient worlds until nothing is left. It is, however, possible to stop all of this. We need to restore balance to the four energies. Thus, I have redistributed all of you into four teams. Each team represents an embodiment of an Omega Titan, and in these new configurations, success may not be likely, but at the very least, it is possible. 
Batman says, I understand the nodes in our costumes, but looking at the teams, they appear to be uneven. If this is about balance, then there must be other heroes. A voice calls out to Batman stating, I'm not sure that I would call us heroes, but hey, if the shoe fits. Everyone turns to see Lex Luthor and several other villains, and while Brainiac's plan is now set into motion, Amanda Waller is busy working on a plan of her own. She tells everyone that they need to make sure that Task Force 11 is primed and ready to go. She didn't kidnap the most powerful psychics in the world just for fun. It's time to hack Brainiac. Up in Brainiac's ship tempers flare as Starfire shouts that she will never fight alongside a tyrant like Sinestro. Sinestro yells that he was saving planets and she was swaddling clothes. You dare suggest that you are too good to fight alongside me? But the other heroes and villains begin to weigh in and Brainiac shouts, That is enough! We have arrived at Kulu. Everyone stops and looks out the window to see one of the Titans and Superman says, My God. Brainiac tells him, They are not gods, they are destroyers. Kalu is the home of the smartest race of sentient life, my race. Therefore, wisdom is who has come to consume this world. The other energies are weak here, but if the balance is reignited, we may have a chance of saving this world. You must do exactly as I say, any deviation, and you would not only doom Kalu, but every other world. As Brainiac begins to explain, though, he begins to feel a sharp pain as Amanda Waller's psychics are attempting to hack his brain. Superman rushes over to catch Brainiac as he falls, asking, What's wrong? And Brainiac says, I can't think. And then his head explodes. As everyone watches, Beast Boy says, So, what are we gonna do? And Lobo says, We are so fragged! Amanda Waller makes her way to the Arctic Circle. As she drives closer to her destination, General Lane radios in, telling her that she needs to turn back right now. Amanda tells him that she needs him to shut up. She will not be turning back. This is far more important than her life or his ego. Task Force 11 is prepared to shut down any attack that comes within 60 miles of her location. Lane says that his intelligence shows that her psychics are all in a comatose state, and Amanda asks, who's he going to believe? The United States government or her? After a few moments of silence, Lane tells her that she has one hour, and she ends the radio transmission. As she parks her snowmobile, sighing and calling Lane an idiot, she steps out, and a green arrow is shot into the ground. Green Arrow himself then says, The next part of this conversation is going to be real easy. I know you're responsible for this, so tell me, where the hell is the Justice League? Meanwhile, over on Kalu, the Titan of Wisdom begins to make his move on the planet. The people of Kalu begin to run in panic, but they're not only running because of the Titan, they are running away from the heroes, shouting that our heroes are Brainiac's minions wearing his technology. Flash yells to the people that they are actually here to help, and Superman tells him that it is no use. These drones are programmed to destroy anything associated with Brainiac. While the teams defend themselves from the drones, some of the teams begin to notice that their abilities aren't holding up like they used to. Harley says, yeah, well, that thing might might have something to do with everyone's powers. Cyborg scans it and says that it's fascinating. It's like a real tree. It's made out of information and it's broadcasting a signal. This must be how the Omega Titans determine the dominant energy on a planet. And on this planet, it's wisdom. Starfire says that she can sense a pull, but not from the tree, somewhere south of where they are. And Zatanna adds that she does too, but hers feels more northwest. Beast Boy asks, so what? Four teams, four energies, four trees? And Batman tells him, the League will take point. Everyone else reform into your own teams and explore these locations. And Lex looks at Martian Manhunter and asks, are you going to tell them or should I? And Manhunter says, by all means. Lex steps in front of the group telling everyone, like it or not, Brainiac is one of the smartest beings to ever live. The next smartest, besides myself, have all lived here on Kalu. They are currently running for their lives like frightened children. As much as it pains me to say, a lot of us don't come close to measuring up. We aren't going to solve this without their wits and will. Our best chance for survival is to follow the plan that Brainiac set. Remember this, if we fail, not only will Kalu fail, but so will Earth. The nodes on your costumes are drawing you to the four energy poles. Brainiac said that they need to restart the three dying energies to counteract Wisdom's control. Superman says, Luther's right. I wish he weren't, but we don't have any other leads. Batman looks at the teams and says that there's at least one leaguer per team. I could live with that. Damien grabs Batman and tells him, This is a bad idea. Are we really going to be trusting Brainiac and Luther? And Batman tells him, That's enough. I was going to say it's the right decision. For now. We have a world to save. And Lex says, Correction, teammate, we have two worlds to save. Back on Earth, Green Arrow pulls another arrow pointed at Amanda and tells her, Four hours ago, every device in Queen Industries' satellite network exploded after tracing the signal it led to you. So the question is, what in God's name are you up to? Amanda ignores the question and says that if he's going to shoot her, just shoot. The world's going to end today, so either shoot her now and save her the trouble or get out of the way and let her do her damn job. Green Arrow says, Not before you tell me what's going on. 
and Amanda sighs, pulling out a small device, using it to shoot a rope that ties Green Arrow up. She then says that after the invasion of the Dark Multiverse, the Justice League informed the government that the battle had broken the Source Wall. Their intelligence didn't know that there was even a wall at the edge of the universe. So when Brainiac came to Earth, she gathered up the world's most powerful psychics and ripped every piece of data out of his head. From what we've learned, Brainiac managed to put Earth next on the list for the space gods and blackmail the heroes into fighting them on his home planet. So as for what she's doing here, she's cleaning up the mess that his pals left behind, because a few hundred feet from where they are now is the only thing that's going to save them. Now, if he and all of his superhero friends would just leave her alone, she'll get them out of this. Green Arrow says, that's the thing. There's no other superheroes. It happened right after you went off the grid. The rest of the superheroes are in some kind of stasis. Brainiac must have implanted a failsafe. Why it went off, who knows? But we're on our own now. Green Arrow then asks, so what are we supposed to do now? Tell me the plan so that I can help. I will follow your lead. Amanda pauses and tells him, next time I say shoot, Shoot. As for the plan, we need to dig up Earth's dormant cosmic seed. Back on Kalu, each of the teams begins getting closer to their respective trees, each having a general theme around them. The Tree of Entropy is located in the prison known as the Ultra Penance, whereas the Tree of Wonder is at the top of a temple and nearly petrified. The Tree of Mystery has no signs of anyone or anything guarding it, and the Tree of Wisdom is located within the city. But as everyone begins to get close to their trees, each team is attacked, and each with different types of beings, some robotic and some undead. Super Superman's group manages to get into their tree first, but as Manhunter looks down by its roots, he sees a nursery. A nursery of cities. And Starro tells him, Not cities, planets! And he yells, We have to free them! While Sinestro tells him that he's mad, they would be releasing tens of thousands of worlds into this room. These are ancient alien races never seen before. Do you realize the chaos that you'd create? And Manhunter tells him, Not chaos, a mystery. Batman and his team are the next to start heading into their tree, and as they fight their way through, Deathstroke asks why is the Teen Titan with them? He shouldn't be here. Lobo pulls Beast Boy aside and tells him, Look, I know you're scared here, but you're on Team Crazy! Didn't what Deathstroke say make you want to let go? Throw yourself at his one good eye and not give a flying frag as to what happens next? Beast Boy tells him, Yeah, I can do that. And he transforms into a giant-like creature. But as all the teams begin to get closer to the source of the pull, they begin to feel something. Manhunter and Cyborg begin to reach out to the other teams, and there's something wrong with Brainiac's programming that's preventing them from doing so. Batman's team finally reaches the source of their pull, and through the shadows, a voice asks, did you really think that there was any hope for Kalu? Brainiac may not have put his faith into the Earther heroes, but his plan required him at every step. The second that he died, this planet, as well as yours, was doomed. Lex asks, who the hell are you? And Batman tells him, his name is Vril Drox. Vril steps out and tells him, that is correct, but you can call me by the name that my father gave me. Brainiac 2.0. Within seconds of freeing Viril from his cell, Lobo gives Viril a hard elbow to the chest, stating, You better start talking and quick. Viril asks, What is there to talk about? Kalu is out of time and about to be eaten. The second that you managed to kill my father, all hope was lost. Lex tells him, We did not kill Brainiac. However, I may not be able to stop Lobo here unless you explain why our suits led us to you. Viril then asks, Do you think that it's just a coincidence that the psychic signal that killed him came from Earth? It was your allies who doomed Brainiac. Did you really think that Brainiac, the smartest entity in the universe was counting on 20 alien heroes to save Kalu without him? You were meant to act as tools, each of you with a specific role, and you functioned for him to wield. Batman says, that's right, which is why you're going to help us. Any plan of Brainiacs would have involved a backup plan. Your father's programming is inside of you. So either you help us fulfill Brainiac's plan, or we feed you to the Omega Titans as an appetizer. Vril tells Batman, you don't understand! Why would Brainiac trust you to clean up a mess that you created? When the source wall broke, the rules of the universe changed. The thing is, Brainiac is the missing piece. Your suits were designed so that he could channel the energy directly into him. I myself cannot replace Brainiac because those suits were made to absorb me. Brainiac set this whole thing up so that once he managed to divert the Omega Titans from Kalu, they could head straight to Earth and devour it in Kalu's stead. Once that happened, he'd be able to rule the universe without the nuisance of Earth's heroes. Beast Boy shouts, you're wrong! We can fix this! Maybe we broke the universe, but you can fix anything if you work together and trust your teammates. Vril sighs, ha, the youth of Earth, just as blind as your mentors. It doesn't matter anymore. Soon you will be able to fully comprehend just how small you are. Meanwhile, down in the Arctic Circle, Amanda Waller and Green Arrow stand in front of one of the energy seeds planted on Earth, and Green Arrow yells, It's hopeless? You're just assuming that the Justice League is going to fail to save Kalu? Maybe I can get a hold of Hal Jordan. All we need to do is redirect a few satellites to boost the signal. Amanda tells him, No. 
is hopeless because those heroes are the ones who caused all of this. The only call that I'm going to make is to drop the largest nuclear weapon and the US arsenal right here. So you better make peace with whatever higher power you want because you're going to be seeing them soon. Green Arrow points his bow at Amanda telling her, over my dead body, if you drop a nuke, you're gonna end up killing so many people. Amanda grabs her gun and yells, it's either a handful of people or everyone, Oliver. Back up at the tomb of the ancient scient priests of Kalu, Team Wonder attempts to balance the Tree of Wonder, but quickly realize that to do so, they would need a powerful magic source. While Zatanna holds back the spirits that are attacking, she calls out that she tried to focus her magic, but these suits are limiting their capabilities. Wonder Woman then says that where she comes from, magic isn't defined by limitations, it's about belief. She isn't sure if there's enough raw magic inside of her, but she knows that she has been blessed by the gods, and right now she can feel the tree calling out to something within her. She she takes her lasso and she wraps it around the Tree of Wonder, shouting, For Kalu, for Earth, for Wonder! And as the lasso begins to shine, the Tree of Wonder's energy begins to be restored. Wonder Woman then sends a message to everyone that they did it. The Tree of Wonder is alive. They still have a fighting chance. But over at the Tree of Wisdom, Cyborg says that that's easier said than done. However, are we supposed to outthink the smartest alien alive? Harley tells him, It's about thinking outside of the box. You're being way too literal. Plug A into B and download C. Why not plug into a unicorn and download a tornado? Cyborg tells her that that doesn't make any sense, but suddenly it does. We don't need Brainiac, we just plug into the tree with my mother box. Brainiac is smart, but he can't reprogram multiversal tech. Cyborg then connects into the Tree of Wisdom, and he starts to take in all of its information, but as he does, he shouts that there is just so much data! As Cyborg maintains the data stream, the tree slowly begins to become darker, and just then, Cyborg sees a small fruit growing out of one of its branches. He reaches out, stating that this is the seed that the Omega Titans planted from the fruit of the tree. The AI is telling him that it is important. Over at the Tree of Mystery, Jond tells everyone that it's up to them. They are to protect the minds of these people on these frozen worlds. We have to free them from the nursery. Superman asks Sinestro if he can create a construct that will carry these worlds out, and Sinestro tells him, Yes, but I still feel this is a dangerous idea. The second that they are out of containment, they will grow to natural size. Starfire? But as Starfire looks at the wall of worlds, she quietly says no. This is Tamarin. We have to free my people. Jeans asks Starro if he could, and Starro tells him, okay, okay, I'll try to calm their minds and tell them that it's okay. Don't make me a liar, Marty. While Sinestro tries to free the collected planets, the Omega Titans appear, and they begin to reach down towards the Tree of Wisdom to collect its fruit. The Justice League all gather together, and they slow the Titan down, but the Demon Etrogen then tells everyone, it sees us as ants and flies to be swatted away in a breeze. As the Titan effortlessly knocks everyone away, Starro tells Adam that he's going to need his help on this one. Invert the frequency of the door star in his belt and fire it at him. Adam then says, there's no telling what that's going to do, but here it goes. And as soon as Starro is hit, his body begins to grow and grow, and soon it becomes big enough to cover the Titan's face. He latches on, shouting, ha 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 I have conquered worlds upon worlds! The beauty mind of an Omega Titan is no match for me! While Starro keeps the Titan busy, the heroes all begin to evacuate the planet, fearing the worst. But then, it happens. The Titan reaches up to his face, and he rips Starro in half and off his face. Harley then says, wait, the Titan killed the starfish? We were winning. And Damien tells her, No, my father and the League were wrong. We're lost. And that's when they hear a massive crack a doom as the Titan begins to devour the planet of Kalu. Back on Earth, the sound of the seed being activated can be heard, and Amanda asks Green Arrow if he can hear it. His friends have failed. Lower the bow and the arrow. And Green Arrow yells, Either you shoot me or you give me the radio to make the call to Hal. I will not let you kill my friends and family, no matter how many space gods there are. Amanda pulls the trigger, and Green Arrow releases the bowstring. His arrow shoots down down the barrel of Amanda's gun. She drops it, stating that it's too late. He's doomed them all. Green Arrow grabs her radio, shouting that whoever is on the line, he needs them to redirect all satellite signals to boost a signal from his location to the Green Lantern Corps. And just as he says that, the energy seeds begin to sprout, bringing forth trees and star labs, the Tower of Fate, the Fortress of Solitude, and Bell Reef. With them, the Omega Titans appear over the Earth, and Green Arrow says that the Justice League will come. She'll see. And Amanda tells him, no, they won't. Welcome, Mr. Queen, to the end of the world. A short while later, over at the Source Wall, where this all began, Green Lantern Corps continues to try and hold everything together to avoid anything spilling out into the universe. But as they do, Hal's ring notifies him that there's an incoming signal from Green Arrow. He answers the call and he says that he's sure that whatever Green Arrow needs is important, but the Corps is dealing with the end of the universe thing right now. And Green Arrow tells him, Hal, yeah, I know, you're doing a crap job. The four space gods just entered Earth's atmosphere. And if you don't get here fast, we're all gonna be eaten. 
Meanwhile, outside of the wreckage of the planet of Kalu, everyone looks out the window of Brainiac's ship, stating that they just let it blow up. None of those green folks have a home anymore. Superman asks Cyborg what about the ship, and Cyborg tells him that the blast damaged the ship's core. Perhaps Vril can, but before they can finish, Vril tells everyone to have a good hard look outside. You want me to help? You just released Kalu's nursery. All of those planets have thousands of neighbors that they never asked for, and among them are the refugees of Kalu, home of the most noble and ancient race. The Omega Titans would have just remained at rest were it not for you. So, can I fix your ship? Of course, but will I? Not a chance. You deserve precisely what you have coming to you. Vril then turns the ship's core and begins calibrating its circuits and starts to fade away. But before fully leaving, he looks back at everyone stating, I am Brainiac 2.0, and it's about time I started to live up to that name. Cyborg runs over to try and stop him, but as Vril fades away, Cyborg shouts, The core! It's surging worse than before! I won't be able to hold off the explosion! I am! Jean stops him, stating that they must find a way together. I know that you all feel tired and the fear is radiating off of you, but Brainiac could not have predicted the things that have happened. Like Starro, one of our greatest enemies, sacrificing himself so that we could escape. We need to think big. We need to do what we never could of before. Something Brainiac never expected. What Vril docks couldn't have seen a million miles away. A short while later at the Fortress of Solitude, Supergirl flies around the Tree of Mystery looking for Green Arrow's last known signal. But as she makes another pass, Vril fires a gun from the tree into the air, hitting Supergirl, and he sighs, stating, I forgot Earth had so many heroes. The blast hits Supergirl, knocking her out of the air, and Vril says that it matters not. When he is done, he's going to accelerate the tree's growth, and it'll be unstoppable. Once that's done, he'll retrieve everything that was taken from his father and watch this full planet get torn apart. Moments later at Bel Reeve, the Tree of Entropy looms over the prison, and Amanda gets off her helicopter, telling her assistants that she needs a line to the President and General Lane. She's ready to discuss the nuclear option and also do her a favor, arrest Green Arrow since he's the one to blame for the space god showing up to eat them. But before Amanda could walk in, Vril appears behind her and says, Hello, my name is Brainiac 2.0. You killed my father. Thanks. Just as Vril aims his gun, he's suddenly punched in the face by a giant green fist, and Hal tells him, not so fast. I heard Green Arrow needed a hand, so I brought a few. Vril picks himself up, stating that he and Amanda understand each other very well. Only someone as ruthless as her could have murdered Brainiac. The heroes seek to save everyone, calling it justice, but Amanda here, she knows that it will only bring chaos. The fact is proven when Bel Reeve grew the Tree of Entropy. I've accelerated the process by which the planet's dormant force becomes supreme. See how fast it's growing? You are species of chaotic monsters. You ooze entropy. The only way to combat the chaos that you bleed is to do what she does, survive. One of the assistants comes out, opening up a briefcase for Amanda, stating that she has full authorization to deploy whatever weaponry she sees fit. As she takes the nuclear switch, a guy tells her that there's no way that they're going to let her do that. The death toll could be, but she stops him, stating that she is well aware, but the cold truth is that there is no justice in the universe. It's an illusion, and there are certainly no damn heroes who can save them from this. Just then there's a loud boom, and Batman's team jumps out, and he says, maybe not, but we're sure as hell going to try. As the group lands, Batman begins to scan the tree, and then says that Viril sped up the growth of the trees. They're sending signals to each other rapidly, but Entropy has taken the lead. We need to hurry and balance out the growth. Then we'll have a fighting chance. Hal and Green Arrow look at Deathstroke and Lex stating, uh, did you make some new friends in space, Batman? We were kind of expecting the Justice League on this one. And Beast Boy tells them, Right now, we are the Justice League. Batman radios to Cyborg, telling him that they need to move fast to get everyone to their respective trees. And Vril starts laughing, stating, this is good. Now you can all die together. Soon, all of the teams arrive at the trees and they begin to remove Vril's devices that are speeding up the growth. As everyone attempts to attack the devices, their attacks seem to bounce off though. Wonder Woman radios that this isn't working, they need something more, and they do in fact have a Brainiac. Vril says that Brainiac's data was downloaded to Earth, right? And Cyborg says, she's right. We need to find the source of the Brainiac hack and find out who. Green Arrow jumps in the conversation, stating, You don't have to look that far, I already know. Stand by. Green Arrow then turns to Amanda, telling her that the only way to do this is the League way. So please, give Cyborg the Brainiac files. After a few moments, she radios to her team, telling them to get the uplink ready. Let Cyborg in. Soon, Cyborg connects to the uplink, and he scans the file, stating that he can appreciate Amanda's thoroughness, because right now, they have themselves a Brainiac. With this, they can steal Brainiac's moves and supercharge the seeds. If they see another, they can redirect the Titan's attention from Earth entirely. All of the heroes begin to supercharge their trees, and as they do, they begin to notice the trees bearing seeds. 
seeds. Cyborg takes the wisdom seeds and begins to charge it directly using his own wisdom. And once it's ready, Cyborg says, all right, now we just need to do that with all the others. Flash hurries back, taking more seeds, giving them to Wonder Woman and Jean. Both of them charge the seeds with wonder and mystery, leaving the remaining seed to be entropy. But as Deathstroke attempts to charge his seed with his own lack of order, nothing happens. Lex tells him to hand over the seed and Deathstroke asks him, why? You're a hero now. You wouldn't be able to charge. But as Lex takes it, he concentrates his entropy and soon it charges the seed. Superman takes the seed, rushing back to Cyborg, stating, all right, we have all the seeds. What now? Cyborg tells him that they're going to take this and fire it right into the entropy Titan. It's not charged with one energy. It's charged with four. Once the seed lands into the Titan, his brothers will feed on him instead. However, their plan is also based on whether the Titan would be full, which hopefully is for another millennium. Hal takes the seed and creates a construct gun, stating, this is going to be insane, but okay. We just need to trick the space gods to eat each other. No big deal. But before loading it, Green Arrow tells him to hang on. No offense, but you're a lousy shot. Let me be the one to do that. Hal begins to make a giant ballista, and he tells him that he's going to give him one hell of a comment for that later. Soon, Green Arrow fires the arrow, and as he does, the predictions come true. Vril, seeing the League's plan as actually working, quickly teleports himself off-world before they know, because he also knows that this is not the end of the Earthers. As the arrow pierces the entropy titan, its brothers begin to feed on him, and as they finish, they all fade away. As the skies begin to open back up, Harley says that what if what they did with the Titans just made the whole situation worse? Jean tells her that it is possible. But if they've learned anything, is that the universe is changing. It's becoming bigger, wilder, and more dangerous. Old assumptions about the multiverse, about each other, must change. For the better or the worse. And just as he says that, Lex communicates to Jean, stating that once before he said that he would burn him if he ever tried to read his mind again. Jean tells him yes, but he can sense it now. He is leaving. Lex says that he said it himself. They've been thinking far too small, and what he saw here changes everything. It means he's been wrong. John says that the Justice League could use his help, but Lex stops him, stating that the Earth is tipped towards entropy, not justice. He needs to prepare, as they should also. He'll be seeing them, perhaps sooner than they like. With that, the League members begin to make their own preparations for whatever is next. Batman begins to build a team to deal with the things that the League can't handle publicly, involving Black Lightning. John gives Green Arrow something that could very well be the most dangerous thing on the planet. He says that when there were no heroes on Earth, he stood up against the impossible. That is why he's trusting him with this. The League is changing, and if they step out too far, they need someone who can stop them. He must keep the box safe. It is the key to destroying the League should the need arise. Wonder Woman works with Zatanna to search for answers as to why she was able to charge the Tree of Wonder with having no powers in the field of magic. And with that, the Justice League holds their first meeting as the new Justice League. With Jean being elected as the chairman, and now with everyone branching off into their own paths, it's time for the world to see new justice. There is no warning once it breaks free. It simply does. There is no stopping it once it finds its target. It just moves towards it. There's no stopping it. Not in the future. Not in the past. Not in the present. For those who have seen it, they already know what's about to happen. And there is no preparation for what's about to come next. However, for the Justice League, they know not of the coming danger, only the task at hand. Neanderthals started to appear across the globe, and members of the League broke off into six teams to combat the threats. There's something different about these things. They've achieved high levels of evolution, and they all want to claim Earth. And all above them sits the Martian, Jean Jeans. The one keeping everyone in touch with one another through his mind. The Martian of Manhunter. These are his allies, his friends, even his family. He's been away for a long time, but still marvels at the sight. As Jean watches, he knows that this is an attack 50,000 years in the making, and it is the work of one of the League's greatest enemies, Vandal Savage. The battle begins to lean in the favor of the League, and that is until there's a sudden turn. All across the globe, the heroes feel a shift in the ground, and it's going up. Voices begin to fill Jean's head, asking what's going on, and as he sifts through everyone's thoughts on the planet, he finds what he is looking for. He tells everyone what just happened. The Earth's crust is being pulled towards the moon. It's a molten iron ring that has become a cyclotron, and they need to destroy it. He shall strike the moon at full speed, as a Quinar, an extinct moon nester, dragon-like monster. At that very moment, they're going to need Batman to activate the bombs that he placed in the moon long ago. Bruce asks, why would I have placed bombs on the... And John stops him, and Bruce says, fine. John changes his form and flies towards the moon with enough force to destroy it with Bruce's help, but watching them is Vandal Savage. The primitive man shouts that they were supposed to have the Earth, and Vandal tells them that it is a slight setback. This is the first part of his plan. The next starts now, and it will make good on the promise to their new Injustice Gang. But then a voice calls out telling him that his plan failed, and Vandal Savage yells asking, Who dares? 
Lex Luthor steps forward, telling him, I do. And I'm here to tell you that all of your plans will fail because you have chosen justice. Vandal tells him, you have some goal to come here. And justice? Aren't you the one playing hero now? Vandal Savage gets ready to attack, but Lex shoots him with a blast, freezing him in place, telling him, I am a hero. And I know what's been hidden from me and the others of this planet, the darkest secret of the universe. So I am here to rescue you from life. The Neanderthals all begin to retreat, and Jean tells everyone that there is something that he saw, something big, and they all need to meet in the psychic boardroom. Within a blink of an eye, the League members find themselves sitting in a cosmic boardroom, and Barry Allen asks what's going on. Jean tells him that he brought them all here because he detected something while at the moon, something bigger than Vandal's plan. Cyborg says that it did feel premature, like the tribes were ready. And Jean says exactly. Vandal's real hope is that the Earth, once its crust is shed, will drift out into orbit and move out of the way. Superman then asks, move out of the way from what? And Jean tells him, you all know about the battle with the dark multiverse. The source wall was broken. Moments ago, something came to life, something containing all of the wall's energy. This totality is rocketing towards the Earth and it will impact in three minutes. Batman asks Cyborg if he can get a read on it, and Cyborg scans it, stating, Whatever that energy is, it's older than anything in the multiverse. It's moving with a kind of purpose. Superman asks, Could it be possible that it's coming here for a reason? If our multiverse is dying, maybe this thing could help. Cyborg tells him that he's not sure. It's sending out some sort of code, and he can't decipher the whole thing. It's mathematical, architectural, like this. Cyborg begins to draw lines, and Batman says that there is a myth on New Genesis, that the source wall was an incubator. When our universe was ready, a messenger would come. It would come with a code to evolve the universe. Back with Vandal Savage and Lex, Vandal shouts, UNFREEZE ME! But all the Neanderthals shout, Lothar, we pledge allegiance to you! Lex then asks him, huh? And one of the Neanderthals tells him, yes, we are leaders of proud lines and heritors to this planet, and we will follow you. We will be your injustice gang. Lex says that, He'll have to give him some time to think about that. And he presses a button on his wrist stating, no. And suddenly all of the Neanderthals begin to drop into a pit. Back at the cosmic boardroom, Cyborg asks, how are we supposed to stop it? And Batman tells him, I have a contingency plan. And he just called me. Just then, John Stewart radios in that he's standing by, and Bruce explains that John has a bullet that contains a miniaturized omniversal wormhole. It's encased in the 10th metal, and it should transport the totality outside of the source wall and destroy it. All he needs is the order. Back with Lex, he tells Vandal, I want to hear it from you. You knew what the source wall really was and what was inside of it. Vandal struggles, shouting, don't do this. And then there's a knocking sound. Lex asks, who could it be? And Vandal yells, we can join forces. And Lex stops him, telling him, no. You're the one human being who knew the truth and you hid it from everyone. You built an injustice gang. When what we really needed was a damn legion. In a flash of light, Sinestro, Gorilla Grodd, Joker, Black Manta, and Cheetah step out, and Joker says, Language, Lex! There are freaking children listening somewhere! Lex holds out his hand, seemingly with nothing, and he asks, Can you see this? It's like a doorknob. You probably can't see it. To see it requires inner vision. It was the key, and it happens to be made of the only thing that can kill you. Vandal struggles more, telling him, You can kill me if you must, but the truth that you seek, don't. It's too horrible, Lex. Lex tells him, Oh! I know, and I cannot wait. While the League continues to decide what to do, Lex takes that doorknob and he begins to beat Vandal to death with it. Cyborg then says, this is for justice. Jean gets ready to make the call, but then he hesitates, and he hears a shriek, and it's so loud that it shakes him from his connection to the others, leaving him alone. He saw things that he would never want to know about the past, about the sins committed, the abominations unearthed. He saw what was coming, new armies across space, ancient gods revived, and behind all of this there was an evil laughter. What he saw was himself alone, just months from now, at the end of everything. The last living thing in the Omniverse. Everyone else, gone. All of it built over an unseen door, a secret that no one has known. And Jean told himself that he needed to go back to change everyone's mind. But when he went to go to the boardroom, his friends were gone. As Jean watched the thing come, he told himself that what he had seen wasn't true, that whatever inside of the totality was good. And elsewhere, Lex holds up the bloody doorknob stating, oh Jean, here we go. In three, two, one. Doom. 
Sometime before, there was a point in where Lex did not know about this doorknob. He happened to come in contact with it by chance by buying the old Legionnaires Club in Kansas. His father used to attend the club, and so to honor his family, he took the building and loaded it with explosives. Just as all of the men began to run out of the building, Lex noticed a door that no one was using. Upon further investigation, he saw that there was a symbol on that doorknob, and not just anyone could see that doorknob. Back in our current time, John makes his way through space with the prisoner Greelock in custody. Guardians radio to him that once they have a cell ready, he can teleport the prisoner over. John tells them all right. But if I may, the cosmic membrane, the readings that I'm getting, Greelock laughs, telling him that <laughs> the cosmic membrane is getting weaker, isn't it? You and your friends broke the source wall, and now forces are unleashed. Ancient, dark forces. As Greelock goes on, John gets up from his chair, punching him back into his cell. Just then, Swamp Thing appears over the blue Mobius flower that John kept at his station, and John asks, what are you doing here? Swamp Thing tells him, I come only to bring a message, and his form begins to change into that of Batman. Batman tells John, we tried to contact you, but you switched off your comms. And John tells him, well, the Guardians didn't want anyone to know about this mission. Batman tells him, I have a bigger request to make. Join us on the Justice League right now. As you know, a week ago, an energy source containing all of the power of the Source Wall landed in the Nevada desert. We're calling it the Totality. It started a protective shell around it, and the object looks like a head. Deep inside this shell lies the Totality itself. It's sending out a code. As the Lanterns learn, the multiverse is dying, and I think that this may be the key to fixing it, but we're going to need your help, John. If anyone knows anything about what we're up against, it'd be you, and I know that you know something, but that's not why I want you on the team. John begins to sit back in his chair telling Bruce, I'm sorry, but I got a job to do out here. And Bruce yells, We're running out of time, John! The Justice League Dark has hidden the totality from the public as long as they can. The other day, Killer Croc entered the energy shell, and a few moments later, he rematerialized near Bell Reeve Prison, but he had been transformed. There was a loud roar over the intercom, and John asks, What was that? And Batman tells him, That would be Croc. Back on Earth, a giant mutated croc charges at the Justice League, even having oxidized kryptonite breath that can stop Superman. Batman tells John that whatever happened to Croc changed his cells, allowing him to adapt to make the perfect monster to fight against the League. Ever since Zanshi, you've been nothing more than a soldier, John. We need you to come back and be an architect like you once were. We need the John who uses his knowledge to build things that can reach beyond what seems possible. John sulks in his chair, stating, John, Martian Manhunter was there with me back on Zanshi when I screwed up. If he's forgiven me, then why isn't he calling me, Bruce? Batman tells him, that's because his hands are full turning into a giant gorilla to fight against Croc. Batman calls back to John again, but he hears nothing. Once Croc is taken down, Martian Manhunter asks, how did it go? And Batman says, I can't tell yet. My hope is that he's thinking about it at least. Also at this time, Lex's new Legion of Doom arrives in a base deep in the sea, and as Black Manta looks around, he asks... How have I had no knowledge of this base? Lex tells him, no one knows about it, except the people who built it a hundred years ago. Did you know that the original form of the word doom simply meant fate? Three months ago, I opened up a door that revealed to me my own fate. And not just my own, but everyone and everything's fate. Grodd says that he didn't sign up for a mystical mumbo jumbo. I joined so that I could get my revenge on that speedster for what he's. Lex stops him, telling him, you will, but on a scale not imagined before. Look here. Lex holds up the doorknob, stating, This totality is the key to everything. But to control it, we must first unlock the seven hidden forces of the universe. Each force is something each one of us has been looking for our whole life, whether we know it or not. Lex then motions towards a case, stating, I've already unlocked the first force, the one that will destroy Grodd's foe. I couldn't have done it without the help of a true evil genius who happens to be right over here. Say hello to your new partner, Grodd. Grodd looks in a case and he sees a baby. As he picks it up, he asks, What the hell is this? Wait, is this who I think it is? Lex tells him, Connect with him and find out. And as for the second hidden force, Sinestro is already on his way to claim it. A section of the emotional spectrum that is off limits to everyone. That is, until now. Meanwhile, over in the Hall of Justice, the Flash gets to work building a vehicle, and Kendra Saunders, Hawk Girl, asks, What does he think could be the cause of all of these speed bumps? The Flash says that if he was to guess, it would be an old villain of his named Turtle. He believed that there was an opposing force to the Speed Force that he called the Still Force. This car is for the Titans so that they can handle Turtle, but the totality is our number one priority. We need to get there before anyone else does. Martian Manhunter's voice calls out that that is correct. In fact, we need to go to the totality today. The Flash says, good, I've got about a thousand tests to run, and Martian Manhunter stops him, telling him, you aren't coming. The Flash shouts asking, what, you're sidelining me? 
as Superman tells him, we can't risk losing you. If your powers fail, that's why Jean and I are going in. The Flash says, well, at least I can vibrate fast enough to, but Batman pops on the screen stating, vibrating won't work. The only members that can resist the pathogenic mutagens long enough are Superman and Martian Manhunter. With a bit of help staving off the cells, they could reach the totality itself. Ray Palmer and myself have created a size, transmutable protective vehicle that, and the Flash stops him asking, wait, where are you, Bruce? Batman tells him, inside Clark's body. And Superman says, that is something that never needs to be said again. But we have a second pod that needs to go inside of Martian Manhunter. Jean then tells Kendra, I'd like you to be the pilot. You know the weapons of war and this will be a war of endurance. Kendra shouts asking, you want me? I'm still trying to figure out my powers. My wings used to be made out of feathers, now they're metal. The Flash shrugs stating, you know, she can take my spot. But while the Justice League makes their preparations back in space, John reads the scans of the cosmic membrane stating that it's all falling apart. He can almost see what's on the other, and a voice comes over the comms asking, what is on the other side? The thing that some have sought for eons, the pathway to where all of your hidden feelings lie. Your darkest emotions, hate, bloodlust. John shouts asking, who's there? And the voice comes in louder stating, right here, Stuart. Just then, a purple force begins to wrap around Jon Stewart, and Sinestro floats forward, stating, You have known me to wear green and yellow, but now I am back in the colors that I sought from the start. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I am Sinestro, the lantern who just unlocked the invisible emotional spectrum, and you will be my first recruit. Back under, Superman and Martian Manhunter suit up, and they begin to make their way to the totality. As Batman and Hawkgirl sit inside of their pods, inside of the two of them, the Flash says that he scanned the face, and nothing matches the face of the totality. Hawkgirl then stares for a moment and says that it looks so familiar. As Superman tells them, whatever it is, it's time that they found out. Superman and Martian Manhunter place their hands on the totality shell and start to push through. But at the same time, back at the Hall of Justice, a voice calls out. By the shield of day and the shield of night, we feed and grow beyond all sight of unseen light. John comes crashing down, now wearing a purple uniform, and as Diana asks what's going on, John tells them, I am the head of the Ultraviolent Corps, and now you will all die. Back at the Legion of Doom hideout, Alex says that they will be the ones to lead the world towards truth. Cheetah scratches her chin, stating that she's not so sure. She's got a pretty good nose for when somebody is lying and well. Cheetah then lunges forward, swiping and ripping off Lex's face, and Black Manta laughs, stating, well, well, a Lexbot. So much for a team, huh? As the Lexbot tries to stand back up, Cheetah asks, if you aren't here, where are you? The Lexbot says, believe me, I say I've been many places around the world, hell around the universe. But of all places that I've been, where I am right now just might be one of my favorite places. Lex then begins to laugh, an evil, maniacal, planning laughter, while piloting through the red blood cells of a pod, similar to Batman and Hot Girls. Superman and Jean make their way towards the outer shell of the totality, and Lex could practically hear the hero scream, the smell of sizzling blood, and he could see it all just ahead. He just can't freaking wait. And with that, we will be leaving you here. Lex is inside of one of the bodies of Superman or Martian Manhunter. Batman and Hawkgirl are also inside, trying to survive the journey while Superman and Martian Manhunter are making their way towards the totality to see what is going on, while Flash has been sidelined. And there is a new still force. And all the while, Jon Stewart has been converted to a force of evil. Back at the Hall of Justice, Jon Stewart stands up staring at everyone, now consumed by a new light, by the ultraviolet light. And Diana shouts, you are better than this. Whatever this is that has a grip on you, we are your friends here. No, I'm not stronger than this. I've seen what's inside of me as well as what is inside of everyone else. There is no helping me or any of you. He holds out his ring as several demon constructs fly out of the ring. Diana charges forward with her lasso, stating that they will soon see the truth of what is really going on. But before she could snare John, a construct shoots up between them, punching Diana away, and John tells her, no. Soon the demons begin to beat down at each of the league members, but Arthur spots an opening in the fight to get to John himself. He thrusts his trident, but before he could reach John, John tells everyone, you will all die here because your flesh is weak. Using the league's shame and hatred, John begins to create a giant monster shouting, do you hear me? Flesh is weak. As the monster begins to bring down its massive arm onto Arthur, Cyborg runs and shielding him, telling him, yeah, no argument about that. John yells at him, there is still enough man inside of your body to reveal your darkest self. Allow me to rip it out of. But Cyborg stops him, telling him, sorry about this. 
and he hits him with a sonic blast, knocking him away. Everyone begins to get back up, and Diana asks, Gods, what has happened to him? And Cyborg says, I'm not really sure, but clearly he's lost his way. Back over at the Totality Shell, Superman and Martian Manhunter fight their way towards the center, while Batman and Hawkgirl begin to battle against the pathogenic mutagens trying to invade their very bloodstreams since the both of them have been shrunken down and placed into the bodies of Superman and Martian Manhunter. As Hawkgirl clears out another wave of mutagens, Hawkgirl begins to notice that these mutagens aren't even attacking the brain, they're coming straight for her. Batman tells her that that wouldn't make sense. Use the white dwarf pulse. And Kendra shouts that that would kill millions of brain cells. Batman says, Martian Manhunter can regrow them, but he can't regrow you. Do it now! Hawkgirl presses the button releasing the pulse, telling Martian Manhunter that she's sorry about the headache, and she destroys the group of mutagens surrounding her. While the two continue their journey, behind Batman's pod, Lex Luthor listens in while fighting his own group of mutagens, and he smiles. A short while later, over the Hall of Justice Infirmary, Jon Stewart slowly begins to wake up asking, What just happened? Cyborg tells him, You're probably going to want to explain. You were in deep space when you caught wind of an unidentifiable energy signature and it came back with you. Diana then asks, What was it that we just fought? And Jon Stewart tells her, It's something called the Invisible Spectrum. While the Lanterns control the Emotional Spectrum, the Invisible Spectrum controls the user. Flash asks, Why haven't we heard of this before? We have like a whole crayon box of lantern colors already. Where did this one come from? John tells him, It's something that I first saw many years ago when I battled against the anti-life equation on the planet of Zanshi. I was with Martian Manhunter, but with his fear of fire, we were slowing down. So I decided to go on ahead alone. Because I was acting so rash, millions of lives are gone. Afterwards, I went back to try and search for anything that could bring Zanshi back. But then I found something completely unexpected. The book described a spectrum beyond one that any of us knew. It was supposed to be a warning. The book was one man's mission to make sure that it was never unlocked, and that man was Sinestro. What he described in the book was terrifying, and in the heart of it, there was a phantom galaxy powered by a sentient black sun called Umbrex. Umbrex moves unseen through space and is drawn towards the planets where self-destructive forces are the strongest, usually in primitive nature. It then surrounds these planets, animating them with its energy and pulling them into its galaxy. There's no stopping it once it's locked onto a planet. Arthur asks, The source wall breaking is what caused the door to be opened, huh? And John creates the symbol that he saw, stating that that is what kicked it off, sure, but there's more. Sinestro wrote that the invisible spectrum was linked to six other forces, all of them locked by some sort of cosmic stasis that had to be accessed first. I wasn't sure that any of this was real, but apparently it all just took over my brain and tried to force me to kill everyone. Cyborg tells him, yeah, I used a radiated ozone to cosmically sunblock you out of your trance. The problem is the energy's getting stronger. Flash calls out, all right, we'll divide and conquer. You guys go try and locate the living galaxy while I look for the still force. Back with the other Superman and Martian Manhunter, make it out of the woods and out into an opening. Superman says that they need to take it slow. Something is off here. Batman radios that the mutagens are starting to slow down and Hawkgirl adds, yeah, a calm before the storm. Superman looks back towards the totality asking, what is that? And Martian Manhunter looks up excitedly stating, my God. He flies over to the totality stating, these look like the giants that were trapped in the source wall. We've never understood who or what they are, but I can sense life in them. Superman tells them to be careful. They don't fully know what they're dealing with. And Martian Manhunter yells, the totality is trying to talk to me. I can read their minds. Superman calls out that he needs to slow down, but inside of Superman, Lex Luthor says, no, don't slow down. Martian Manhunter reaches out to one of the giants, allowing himself to see through the giant's mind and convert it into something that he can understand. But instead of seeing wonder, he sees something else entirely. He stumbles back asking, what did I just see? The giant tried to communicate with me, and it says that you, the first abomination, you must be destroyed. Over with the others, the Flash's triangulation on the still force has led Diana, Arthur, and himself to the location deep in the sea. As the three walk into the facility, Diana looks around stating that this place is practically Amazonian in design. And Arthur says, yeah, but there's Atlantean tech. But as the three of them pass by some test tubes, Flash asks, what's inside of there? He wipes away the dust to see what looks like a white Martian, but more animalistic. Suddenly the Martian's eyes open and it begins to bang its head against the glass. The Flash tells everyone that they might have a problem here and then all of the Martians begin to break free from their test tubes. But while everyone is having their own fights with Diana, Arthur, and the Flash battling against the Martians under the ocean, with Superman and Martian Manhunter battling against the creatures of the source wall, with Batman unaware that Lex Luthor is behind him, as one person who doesn't appear to be in a battle just yet. A shadow begins to rise up behind Hawkgirl in her pod. 
and the Joker almost lets out a laugh as he holds out his chainsaw. He places his fingers on his lips to keep himself quiet. And up with what remains of the watchtower from Martian Manhunter's attack, John and Cyborg search through the computer to try and see if they can locate the traces of this ultraviolet light, this unknown energy. Cyborg says that it's strange, the power is strong, yet there is no sign of this unknown galaxy anywhere near the outer rim. What the hell did Sinestro take? Just then there's an explosion of ultraviolet light and Sinestro floats down with John shouting, Why are you doing this? You're the one who helped lock away the invisible spectrum. Why would you set Umbrax free? Sinestro tells him, I wasn't going to. The truth is that I came to that lonely sector to lock it away once again, but when I arrived, Umbrax had slipped away. The bonds were already broken by the activation of the still force. John yells, asking, Where is it then? As the Nestro says, as I wrote, it's drawn to worlds of the darkest, most self-destructive energy. Connect to the spectrum and see where it is. As the invisible spectrum ring appears on John's finger again, he begins screaming, no! And Cyborg asks what's happening. Sinestro tells him, John is seeing the truth, the truth that everyone will soon see. The world that Umbrax is drawn to is yours. The invisible spectrum is already here and Earth has joined its ranks. Back at the totality, Martian Manhunter and Superman begin to fight against the giants, the ones that were once locked away in the source wall, with Martian Manhunter shouting, You lie! Get out of my head, foul beings! And Superman asks, What are they telling you? Say something! The giants attack, yelling, We are her architects, and you were her downfall! The first cell is removed, die, abominations! Martian Manhunter begins to slow down, stating that this must be some sort of defense, something to try and test him. He'll look for the truth behind. One of the giants begins to focus its attacks on Martian Manhunter, so Superman rockets through, knocking him out of the way, telling him, snap out of it! But inside of Martian Manhunter, the Joker begins to laugh as he starts his chainsaw, and Hawkgirl radios out to the others. Joker says, I wouldn't bother trying! They can't hear you! Hawk Girl swings back, stating, Joke's on you. My wings are in metal. That thing won't even put a scratch to them. She then looks into Joker's eyes, and she realizes that he didn't bring that to clip her wings. He brought it to cut off her head. He begins to bash her with the motor of the saw, and Batman calls out asking, What's happening? Why are communications cut? And then he hears it. The worst sound on Earth. <laughs> Batman tries to put things together. There's only two or three people smart enough to have pulled this off. Brainiac is dead and Luther isn't a villain anymore. But that's when the bullets start to hit his pod. So many that Batman is forced to eject. As he plans his next move, he asks, which will be... What? He planned for every outcome, but now he couldn't have planned for a human evil so deep inside, targeting both him and Hawkgirl. The pathogens shriek as they approach, but before Batman can make a move, the pathogens swallow him whole. Back on the moon, Jon Stewart creates a construct cannon telling Cyborg, We need to hit him with everything that we got. Sinestro gave the Earth to Umbrax. This is now war. The two of them blast into Sinestro with him easily deflecting the attack, stating that he understands that they may think their will is stronger than the ugliness inside, but they can only avoid looking for so long. See it, John. Embrace the real you. John yells, Just shut up! As long as I have this ring on my finger, I will always. Sinestro releases an attack of his own, stating, Do go on. As John holds up his arms to block the attack, he begins to feel something give, and then his ring shatters. No more Green Lantern. Cyborg calls out asking what just happened, and John asks, What's happening to me? Sinestro tells him, It's simple. I just infused the last of your cells with the ultraviolet energy, making your transformation permanent. Welcome to the core. You will never be a Green Lantern again, John Stewart. John and Cyborg jet off to the moon, and Sinestro says, That's right. Run. Down in the sea below, though, Diana, Flash, and Arthur continue fighting off the White Martians, with Arthur asking Flash if it's possible for him to check the rest of the base. Flash tells him that he would, but the Still Force is still messing with his powers. It's like when he fought the turtle. He seems to be running slower when he tries to run faster. It doesn't make any sense. But when they fought, the turtle was old and weak. Someone must have stolen his abilities and enhanced them. But how? Just then, an energy pulse hits the room, stunning everyone, and a voice tells the Flash, It was easy. It was like taking candy from a... Well, you get the idea. Grodd walks out with a child from before strapped to his chest, and Arthur shouts, Only a monster would use a child. The Flash yells to Grodd that they need to stop this. The still force is universe-ending stuff. And Grodd says, I know, we're counting on it. Aren't we, Junior? And the baby laughs. <laughs> Grodd hits everyone again with another pulse, and the Flash gets up, looking at the baby, stating, 
That can't be. And Grodd laughs, telling him, Say hello to Turtle. In fact, this whole place is full of old acquaintances. Just look around. Diana looks around to see Cheetah, and Arthur sees Black Manta. Flash shouts, Just leave them alone! The fight is between us, Grodd. Grodd asks, You want me to release your friends to fight? I'd be happy to, because the combat they are actually in is with each other. You see, Diana is seeing Cheetah, but it's actually Aquaman. And Aquaman is actually seeing Black Manta, but it is actually Wonder Woman. They're about to kill each other because the real Cheetah and Black Manta are right behind Grodd. Flash gets up shouting, I won't let you. And Grodd hits Flash with another blast, telling him, please try and give it your all. Back at the totality, one of the giants calls for the others to wait. There has been a change. The energy that we feel, it's the first force. The still force is almost... Lex, inside of his pod, laughs, looking at the doorknob, stating, Yes, it's almost unlocked. While the giants are distracted, Superman grabs Martian Manhunter, flying back, asking Martian Manhunter, What did you see? And Martian Manhunter tells him it has to be a lie. It has to be. The Superman tells him, That's enough. We are always connected to each other, but never to you directly. Why, Martian Manhunter? Martian Manhunter begins to speak, but then he looks away, stating that he is sorry. While he was away, he was on a mission to discover what really happened with the destruction of his planet Mars. Their people had a collective mind, but there was one of them tasked with retaining the history of Mars itself. It was a secret position hidden off the planet, the one called The Keep. The Keep was located on Thanagar, homeworld to the Hawk people, but her memory... It was whole. Even still, she confirmed that what killed Mars was a telepathic plague that she called Horanmeet's Curse. It took psychic form of whatever its hosts worshipped and turned that against themselves. For them, it was fire. As the totality approached them, Vandal Savage sent him a vision. It was a Martian child taken and imbued with something ancient and terrible, like a curse but older. He saw more too, so many horrors that are to come. The end of everything. But what if it is all lies? What if he's been leading them, the whole multiverse, towards destruction? Superman reaches out, placing his hand on Martian Manhunter's shoulder, telling him, We're all friends here, so believe me when I say, yes. Yes, it is your fault. You're the doom of everything. So thank you, Martian Manhunter. He looks at the cracked smile on Superman's face asking, What? But then Superman speaks again telling him, No, not Superman. Martian Manhunter tells him, I know that voice. Luther! And Lex tells him, I did warn you that we would be seeing each other again. All right, Joker, show your hand. Martian Manhunter subtly shouts out in pain and Joker speaks through him. Ah, <laughs> there we go. Now could I please cut off a head? Hers, his, someone's. The Joker latches on to Martian Manhunter and Lex tells him, as many as you want, we just need to wait a little bit longer. For now, we are doomed. One of the greatest evils ever, Lex Luthor has control of Superman. And one of the most psychotic evils ever, Joker has control of Martian Manhunter. But meanwhile, over at the Hall of Justice, Jon Stewart sits down stating that he can't do it, he can't access the green power battery anymore. All he feels is a pull towards the ultraviolet. Cyborg says that the costume that Sinestro is wearing, it's allowing him to channel the energy of the invisible spectrum so that he can harness it himself. He's sending out a call right now to draw people in, and John asks who would he target. Cyborg tells him that the readings that he's seeing, he's targeting everyone on Earth, and back below the sea, the Flash tries to push through Grodd's attack, but Grodd laughs, telling him, yes, that's it. Keep coming, keep coming while your friends fight to the death. The Flash shouts for him to shut up, but Grodd says, this is exactly how the turtle beat you. He saw the core of the Speed Force was the energy pointing towards stasis and death. With each fight, Turtle learned more, but his experiments aged him. This hatching is the fourth generation of his line, and he is fully attuned to the Still Force. The Flash screams as he tries to get closer, but as he does, Grodd lets out another even more powerful pulse, blowing the Flash away. John and Cyborg try to reach out to the others, but they notice a change in the Still Force. It has reached full power. Cyborg looks over at the scanner, stating that the universe stopped expanding and the membrane just disappeared. That's when John asks, that means the barrier to the invisible spectrum is gone? And Cyborg tells him, correct. Between the planets that Umbrax controls and the people succumbing to his call, Sinestro now leads the largest core in all of eternity. All of the cores put together couldn't even come close to the size of the ultraviolet core. Down below, back at the totality, Lex in Superman's body looks at the doorknob as it hums. And through Superman's eyes, he says, look at it. He directs Superman hard towards the center of the totality while Joker controls Martian Manhunter right behind him. The totality, the multiverse itself is right in front of them and all they need to do is reach out and take it. There was no warning 
As tears filled the Scarecrow's eyes, he realized that something in the world had changed. How, he does not know. All he knows is that it did. But he wasn't the only one. This feeling travels all the way from Arkham Asylum to the skies of Conduct. The effects even reach hell, where Neron nearly drops a finely aged cask of human souls. Because right now, in the center of that change is Lex Luthor as he pilots Superman's body forward, going towards the totality. Lex takes a moment to stop and smile because everything in the world is as it should be. It all began when Lex Luthor took over the Hall of Doom for himself, casting out the original members into the fiery depths below. He upgraded the fortress's arsenal and made changes to its interrogation chamber at the request of the Joker. But perhaps the most dangerous item of all rests inside of Lex's private quarters displayed on a pedestal, or at least it should. Instead, it is carried with him, sitting comfortably inside of his pocket. However, this story actually takes place just before Doom was ever really a thing. You see, up in space, the Green Lanterns fought against the horrors that poured out of the damaged source wall, and it was a fierce battle. Even Sornik Natu told her Yellow Lanterns that they need to work with the Green Lanterns. That call for aid reached the ears of Sinestro, the person that the Yellow Lanterns had based their entire livelihood on, and even he agreed reluctantly. A voice called out to him, stating that they know exactly what he is thinking, and Sinestro spun around to fire a blast of yellow energy. And then he sees that voice came from the most evil man in the entirety of the universe, Lex Luthor himself. He asked, how is he here? And Lex told him, it's something called quantum folding. It allows me to take one step and travel from one end of the universe to the other. But that's not why I'm here. I understand that the great Sinestro would believe that the best thing to do here is work with the Green Lanterns. Sinestro tells him, Speak plainly. And Lex says, What if I could promise you everything you ever wanted? Sinestro tells him, I've always taken what is needed. And Lex tells him, No, not need. Want. I know the secrets that the Owens have been hiding. I unlocked the secret history of the universe in full. I hold the key right here in my pocket, and I'm starting a group. Join me, and I will give you the invisible spectrum and more. Sinestro pauses for a moment, and then he tells him, I'm listening. Days prior, Lex Luthor helped save the world as one of its heroes, and he learned that the dominant energy of the human life was entropy. This all happened in a storyline, no justice. In a world of entropy, there would be no certainties or predictability. Everything would slowly decline into disorder, and Lex would not allow that to happen. So he compiled together all of the data from his shell companies that had been working on time travel, and he built himself a real lifetime machine. He had a rough map that went forward into a millennia, but that wasn't far enough. He drifted in hyper time, jumping from timeline to timeline. It was painful, yes, but he would soon learn who was right. He took off his goggles and he stepped into the future one million years from now. There were no gods. There was only Luther. As Lex stares at a statue of himself, a group of this time's villains fly down asking if it's really him. The tachyon particles gathered here for weeks, showing that someone was coming from the 21st century. Lex asked, what is this place? And the villains told him that it is Lexor's city. Lex then asks, how did this happen? And the villains said the society stopped fooling itself. People were told to aspire to become some fictional better version of who they were, but they couldn't ever hold on to it because it was all a lie. The cycle repeated itself until an archaeologist found the lost works of the great Lex Luthor and broadcasted that to the world. The people were inspired by your early teachings, and they embraced what you really were on the inside, no matter how ugly it was. People stopped pretending to be heroes, and the villains conquered the universe in your name. The people in this time call it the Great Tragedy, the one who saw the truth but missed the key to unlocking it in his time. Lex asks, what is this key? And the villains told him that they couldn't do it because it could very well rewrite the course of human history. All they can do is show him the symbol at the heart of it all, and they call it Doom. The villains hold up their hands, revealing a ring with a particular symbol etched into it. And after a few moments of silence, the villains ask Lex if there's anything wrong, and he stares at them in disgust. Shortly after returning to the present and waking up from what could only be described as a dream, Lex went to meet with Gorilla Grodd. He asked what was the point of being right if no one realizes it for millions of years after you die. And Grodd tells him, You went to the end of the time to learn that you were a fool and a failure. I could have told you that in an instant. If it wasn't for your psychic blockers, I would have had you rip your own throat out. Lex says, 
I like your spirit, but you're missing the point. We need to think bigger. I can offer you the world. Grodd looks out at the United Nations General Assembly, having all of the people inside kill each other, and he says, I already have the world. The leaders of your idiot species grovel at my feet, and I will not bow to any man. Lex tells him that these are nothing but witless bureaucrats. This is a pointless show of force designed to intimidate the Flash. But we both know it'll accomplish nothing. Grodd grabs Lex by the neck, stating, Enough games! And Lex tells him, Just listen! I was wrong! We've all been wrong! I know how to stop the Speed Force dead in his tracks so we don't have to wait until the end of time to win. The universe wants us to take it now. And Grodd lessens his grip and he tells him, How? The villains of the future told Lex that he had missed something, which would have meant it was under his nose. That statement poked and gnawed at the back of his mind, but what could he be missing? The only thing out of place was a forwarded invitation to his father's old Legionnaire's Club. After taking the opportunity to let off some steam and blow some things up, Lex found a door that no one could ever See. A secret chamber beneath the building, decades older than the crumbling facade above. The papers described a strange and twisted history of the universe. It marked the coming of the great totality and the end of things anew. Lex wondered for that moment about his father. Did old Lionel have deeper secrets than he ever knew? And just then he saw the symbol, the mark that he had seen at the end of time. This is what those future idiots said I missed. The path towards my actualization of my own time. The path towards doom. I hadn't realized when I carried the loose knob with me that I had been holding an object far more powerful than a hundred atom bombs. With it, I could unlock the hidden energies of the universe. The doom would come in our time, and I would see it. So Lex unlocked the invisible spectrum, but he needed someone to command it to bring justice to its knees. He would find the scion of the turtle and through him unlock the arresting powers of the still force to stop creation in its tracks. That too would require someone capable of controlling the scion. Lex laughed as he realized what he was building. A legion of horror had built itself in his mind and he had reached for the doorknob on the table in the strange Kansas basement. Each participant best suited for one of the seven forces described in these papers. A legion that represented the true face of the universe with all of its selfish, vindictive pride. A legion that did not stand for people as they should be, but as they were and will always be. And as Lex took that power into his hand, it echoed all across space and time. It echoed all the way back to Lexor City and humanity's end. And as the wall of light engulfed the future, the villains knew what it meant. Lex had found the key to unlocking the truth to his own future. With rapturous cries, they cheered on their annihilation. And back in the current time, Lex now pilots Superman's body as he has taken control of him. And he begins to understand his purpose and yours. If he could, he would ask you a question that he has asked the rest. Why should you be better than your nature? Why should any of them? The universe made them what they are, all with their selfish animal impulses. Why feel guilty for them? Celebrate them. You should be who you really are, to embrace your true self, just like Lex wants you to, and choose the right side. Screw justice! Side with doom! As Umbrax, the ultraviolet lantern sun inches closer to Earth, it slowly begins to absorb and transform its energy. You see, Sinestra had discovered a different spectrum, a totally different thing from the green lantern and the emotional spectrum. And among that was the ultraviolet core. And recently, he joined that core, and he forced Jon Stewart to join it as well. Now down in the Hall of Justice, Cyborg and Jon Stewart watch, and Jon says they need to do something. Sinestro is pulling half of the damned population into the ultraviolet core. Cyborg tells him it's worse than that. Umbrax is infecting its target's primal life forces, the red and the green. If we don't act fast, then the Earth will become a living evil planet. Jon then asks, can we try calling for help from the multiverse? And Cyborg says that they can try. Just then, there's a loud boom coming from outside, and Sinestro calls to John, telling him, I'm coming for you! You killed a whole planet. The hate that you hide inside. The guilt. The energy. Your potential is limitless. Come and join the Ultraviolet Core. You could become the most powerful lantern ever. Warrior Supreme, even. All you have to do is embrace it. Meanwhile, inside of the totality, Lex Luthor and Joker have taken control of Superman and Martian Manhunter's bodies. In order to get close to the totality, only two individuals could withstand the forces that the totality was putting out, and that is Superman and Martian Manhunter. Inside of them, we had a shrunken down Batman and Hawkgirl going for the ride, but Lex and Joker also snuck into the bloodstreams of Superman and Martian Manhunter, and now have taken control of their bodies. 
and they find themselves steps away from their goal. Lex looks at the totality, knowing that it wants him to take it. He even starts to reach out for it, and then something reaches back. Batman punches through the glass, grabbing and throwing Lex out of the cockpit, causing Lex to release his grip on the cosmic doorknob. Lex asks him how. Superman's cell should have eaten you by now. And Batman tells him, I have a kryptonite ring. Mutated or not, it's still Superman's DNA. Lex then asks him, Really? You brought a kryptonite ring inside of Superman? With friends like you, who needs enemies? Lex activates his shoulder cannon, but Bruce rolls forward, jumping up, punching Lex square in the jaw. Back in the underwater Legionnaire's base, Flash struggles to get up, telling Grodd, Stop this! Grodd is currently in control of the Still Force, brought by the baby turtle that Grodd has strapped to his chest. The Still Force has the ability to shut down the Speed Force, defeating the Flash. Grodd asks, why on earth would I do that? I've spent years dreaming of this moment, it's impressive really. The amount of speed inside of you to even move a single muscle against the Still Force, to fight through the cosmic essence of stasis. Keep it up and you might reach the door in a century or two, if you survive the implosion of course. As Garad turns and walks away, he calls out to Black Manta and Cheetah, asking if they've gotten what they came for. Black Manta and Cheetah look upon their newly discovered artifacts, the key to the Graveyard of the Gods, and the Tear of Extinction. Manta picks up the tear, stating, Yes, we've located what we needed. Back inside of Superman, Batman pins Lex to the ground, and Lex shouts to the Joker, I'm gonna need a hand over here! The Joker laughs as he begins to turn Martian Manhunter's fingers into tendrils, and he reaches into Superman through his eyes. Joker tells Superman, I really hope you don't mind! I'm just trying to pick your brain a bit! <laughs> One tendril shoots in, cutting away at Batman's side, and Batman calls out to Hawkgirl, stating, We can't let Lex get his hands on the doorknob. We need to do something now. Before he could finish, Hawkgirl pulls herself up from the floor, cracking Joker in the head, telling him, I got your punchline right here. Hawkgirl then takes control of the probe, with Batman struggling with Lex to claim the doorknob. Lex manages to snatch the doorknob before Batman can, and he asks, Can you feel it? The power in my hand. It is only a fraction of what I will soon claim. You thought your friend Martian Manhunter was the key to this whole thing? You thought it was him who was destined to hold the totality? He's not. Now let me show you how small and fragile you are. Lex holds out the doorknob, releasing its power onto Batman. Batman screams as his limbs are bent and snapped. And Lex tells him, Can't you see? Good. Now you may go. Seconds later, Batman, Superman, and Martian Manhunter are teleported back to the Hall of Justice. Martian Manhunter is the first to wake up, and he says, Lex, he beat us to it, but where is Hawkgirl? As the heroes look over their situation, the frustration begins to set in. John shouts, You should have told me about the invisible spectrum, the exact opposite of the emotional spectrum. And Martian Manhunter tells him, You should have told me about your doubts. And Flash says, You're the one who opened up the door. John asks, what are we supposed to do? Umbrax's energy is saturating the Earth. I can feel it. Hell, I'd be a part of Sinestro's ultraviolet core if it wasn't for Cyborg blocking him. Cyborg tells him, actually, I'm not blocking him. I've got every ounce of power in the shields. There's only one person controlling it, and that's you. John steps back and tells him, yes, I can feel it. What are these ancient forces being unlocked? The Still Force, the Invisible Spectrum. What if we're not supposed to fight them? Martian Manhunter asks, are you stating that we stop battling these powers and let them in, use them? If we can connect enough people, break Sinestro's hold. John tells him, yes, I can show you how to use the emotions fueling the invisible spectrum, accept them and turn them into a strength. I might not be a Green Lantern anymore, but maybe I can light this path. Question is, how the hell do we get around the whole planet fast enough to show them all at the same time? Flash radios in asking, the real question is, can you drive stick? A few moments later, John gets into the car that the Flash was designing, and Superman gives them a little push. John begins racing around the world, while Martian Manhunter sends out a scream to everyone lost in the grip of darkness that took the light. Look at it! Because it shows the truth, and the truth is, Lex Luthor was right. Their nature may be cruel and small and full of fear at things that they will never understand, but perhaps if they acknowledge this together, if only for a moment, they might climb higher than they were supposed to, to someplace new, to someplace surprising. But back with Lex as he stands before the totality, getting ready to open up its door, Hawkgirl grips her mace as she jumps forward, ready to strike Lex. John radios back that something isn't right. The light that is starting to shine, it's not green, it's... My god, as the light returns to the planet, the bright symbol of the White Lanterns shines throughout space.
Back at the totality, Lex focuses the doorknob's power on Hawk Girl, and he asks, Why does it not work on you? Your wings! Why are they glowing like that? What is your connection to all of this? With all of the lives that you've lived, you must have learned something. Hawk Girl pushes through the attack, telling him, Yeah, she did learn a few things, like how to perfect her swing. She bashes Lex, sending him flying, and she says, If you were smart, you'd stay down. Stand, and I'm gonna kill you. Lex gets back up, hitting Hawk Girl, yelling, No! Whatever the hell it is, I'm taking the totality. It's calling to me! I can hear something inside. Back over with John, his car suddenly stops as Sinestro appears before him, creating a construct roadblock, launching him out of the driver's seat. Sinestro then asks, Do you really think that your plan worked? All you've done is doomed the lives of millions, as you did on Zanshi. A construct of Hal Jordan flies out of Sinestro's ring, asking John, Why? Why did you do it again? Sinestro goes on stating, Life on this planet is powered by the dark and secret desires. Earth's meant to become a part of Umbrax, the ultraviolet core. But now, because of your stunt, Umbrax's planetary army will unleash its full power on Earth. Of course, the Force will destroy most of the population. John yells, No! I won't lose Earth! Superman looks up into the sky and says that all of the planets surrounding Umbrax, they look as though they're powering up and they're getting ready to fire on the Earth. Cyborg tells him to stand down. They're radiating more electromagnetic energy than is even quantifiable. In this state, there's no way that we could. But that's when a loud foom comes over the radio and Cyborg asks, what went foom? Did you just... All of the planets outside of Earth's orbit begins to charge up and fire down on Earth. Sinestro laughs, asking John if he can see it. He's done nothing but damn his own kind. And so, the League does what it always does, and they fight. Aquaman sets out to hold Grodd and the others back as Flash tries to contain the still force. John pushes Sinestro back with every fiber of his being, and Hawk Girl stabs Lex in the back before he could touch the door. Flash slows every cell in his body to attune to the still force, and then there he was, the center of everything. Terror grips over him, and yet, at that very moment, standing outside of all physics, he feels what Vandal Savage felt all of those years ago, a desire to turn back, to hide from what he saw. For better or for worse, it is not who he is or who they are. And so he pushes on, and suddenly there is nothing. Umbrax is gone. Sinestro looks into the sky, asking, What have you and your friends done? I would have made you a paladin in the greatest core in the universe. You should have known better. All Jon Stewart will ever be is a foot soldier. Jon fights through the grip of the ultraviolet constructs as a green light shines, stating, Actually, I'm also an architect. At that moment, a giant green skyscraper slams down onto Sinestro. Back at the totality, Hawk Girl reaches out and Lex shouts, No! The totality is calling to me. It calls to... But as the light washes over the two of them, Lex blinks and he finds himself in the Legion of Doom halls. And Joker looks at him, telling him, Ha ha ha! Welcome home! Let's hope the others had better luck, huh? Lex grinds his teeth, telling him, Call them back now! Later, at the Hall of Justice, Martian Manhunter looks at the totality and Martian Manhunter says that it's thanks to Hawk Girl that they've been able to do this. So, what do we do now? Make no mistake, this mission that we are on, the fate of the multiverse, is at stake. Everything that we love hangs in the balance. Our enemies, we know now that we are up against the Legion of Doom. This Legion believes that the true shape of the multiverse, its destiny, hidden inside of the totality, inside of us all, is evil. However, we do not. Let them be Legion. We will be a whole universe united against them. We will unlock the answers before them and use them to win. Even if those answers change everything that we know, everything, we will not change. That is why I will return to Thanagar Prime to find out what the Martian Keeper of Memory is hiding. I would like Hawk Girl and John to accompany me. John looks at his Green Lantern ring and he says he's not sure. This ring just appeared on him and he'd rather not let them down. Martian Manhunter tells him that he should have recruited him himself. He should have let him see how he had forgiven him for Zanshi so long ago. He just simply hadn't forgiven himself. John hugs Martian Manhunter, telling him, Thanks, old friend. Martian Manhunter then says that he has fears, though, that if they open up the totality and they learn that the inevitable ending to everything is cruel, that the universe and life were meant to be something dark and predatory, what are they to hold everything back? What are they as villains? What does the Justice League do if it finds out that it is on the wrong side of everything? Superman tells him, simple, we, but Batman speaks over him, telling him, we justice harder. Flash laughs, telling him, now that's a Batman voice. And just then there's a loud boom and from within the Hall of Justice, a beaten and battered man appears before them. The man tells them that his name is Starman. He's come from the past and he has all the answers that they seek, but to learn them, three of them must die. Meanwhile, back at the Legion of Doom's hideout, Lex knows that he underestimated his enemies, and he can come to terms with this fact. 
He thought the totality would aid him in some way, but the test was more than that. He understands it now. He walks down the hallway and he says, You were right. I do need your help. And with that, there's a slight laugh. And the Batman who laughs says, I never thought you'd ask. <laughs> When he was a boy, Arthur Curry would go out with his father on their fishing boat. He wanted to find new oceans, new waters to explore. His father told him, though, that the waters had already been mapped. Now as an adult, Arthur Curry is Aquaman, and he is in the Arctic Circle with Wonder Woman and Firestorm following a magical ship in a bottle. They are searching for an ancient hidden ship, in which is locked the legendary key to the graveyard of the gods. They search for the dead god Poseidon. The ship is buried within the ice, deep beneath the surface, and hidden within the bow of the ship lies what they seek. Suddenly, a strange creature lashes out, and it is vast, with its watery limbs created by some strange alien liquid. The trio try to fight with Firestorm caught within its liquid, and Aquaman dives in to rescue him, but it's too late. His friend is mutated, becoming some strange aquatic creature that he has never seen before. The monster grabs Arthur next, and the world goes dark. When the light returns, Arthur is confused. His armor is gone and his skin is covered in some strange symbols. What is going on? Where am I? You are in the Blood Reef, Sea King of Earth. Welcome. The speakers are some of the sea gods, the ocean lords, and they are the invaders from the stars. And the Earth is under attack. MST Bay, in the past. Lightning flashes in the skies as the waves pound against the shore, and despite the storm, Tom Curry runs to the beach, his young son Arthur in his arms. Atlana, don't do this, he calls against the wind and the rain, and his wife, Arthur's mother, stands surrounded by sea creatures in waist-deep waters. Tom doesn't understand. They aren't safe with her around. She is doing this for Arthur. And Atlana begins to drift under the water. She leaves them with one last parting. Goodbye, my loves. In the growing storm, Arthur calls for his mother yet. She is already gone. The Blood Reef now. On a piece of alien coral floating in another dimension, Arthur Curry is bound in chains. Strange creatures from an alien sea surround him. Their language is indecipherable, their thoughts lost to him. He tries to speak with them, yet his words bring anger and blows. The creature's hands are stayed, however. His death belongs to the Ocean Lords, Admiral Tin states using her power to drown the creature as Arthur looks on in horror. You would kill your own men? What kind of queen are you? But Tide and the other Ocean Lords are not royalty. They are the gods from alien oceans, come to Earth to see its destruction. The others check in, and Captain Gaul informs them that their fleet has blockaded the Earth. Commander Drog controls the flood and soon the Earth will be drowned and the people transformed into hideous monsters. Arthur begs them to stop. They need not have war. We can have peace. But it is far too late. In Gotham City, the waters have risen. The people are drowning in the streets. Commissioner Gordon struggles to get an old lady inside before she almost drowns, but everyone who comes in contact with the strange liquid is transformed. Behind him, Batman appears. Gordon's men are gone, and Batman informs him that he is coordinating with the Justice League to try and save as many as he can. Batman wants Jim out of there, though. But before his friend can respond, the old lady tackles Jim. She is now a strange fish creature, sending Jim to the watery streets. Gordon emerges, now a monster as well. Shut the door and barricade it. Get to the roof. Batman orders to the survivors and then turns to his friend. Jim rushes the Dark Knight, his claws raised. I'm sorry, Jim, I'll fix this, I swear. And with that, Batman disappears. Meanwhile, over at the Hall of Justice, Batman orders Magan to end the mental transmission that he was sending to Gotham. The League's top scientists are trying their best to figure out a solution, while the rest are trying to save the world. Batman, his body in a cast, is coordinating everything with the help of Magan's mind link. Batman orders an evac of the Hall, and he informs her that he'll be staying behind to guard the totality, the mighty secret of the universe that the Justice League recently acquired. He then begins to check in with the rest of the League. Over in Metropolis, Superman is overseeing the evacuation. Thankfully, Lois is safe at the Fortress of Solitude, but across the planet, moving at blinding speeds, Flash is helping everywhere that he can. The heroes of the world are doing their best to protect the people of the Earth. In Atlantis, Queen Mera fights against her own people, transformed into the creatures that the oceans have never seen before. Her magics keep them at bay while she climbs. She needs assistance. And finally getting high enough, she rips the bars off of the prison windows, revealing the Ocean Master. Orm, are you with me? He agrees. 
Back at the Blood of Wreath, Aquaman's prison, Arthur watches helplessly as the heroes of Earth try to save his people. Aquaman questions the gods why they would terrorize his planet. In the past, the heroes of Atlantis and the god Poseidon locked away the Ocean Lords. They watched as their own worlds died without their protection and guiding hands. For this, they have returned, and they will punish Arthur and the Earth. They are not alone. From the waters behind him rises Aquaman's oldest enemy, Black Manta. The Legion of Doom sends its regards, Arthur. In Metropolis, protective measures have failed, and the city is now underwater. Floating above it, Superman is contacted by Batman, with the League having pinpointed the source of the alien flood, a strange creature in the mid-Atlantic. His eyes glow red with anger. Tell me where this thing is now, Clark orders. Superman arrives fast. The creature is huge, made of living water, and it turns its strange eyes on the Man of Steel as he acknowledges it. I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're here, but I need you to understand something. This world is under my protection. And with these words, the Man of Steel brings his hands together in a clap so powerful that it sends a shockwave through the beast, dissipating it. I heard that from Coast City. Flash shouts as he arrives at the scene, running so fast that his feet never actually come in contact with the water. So fast, in fact, that he can't stop as the creatures begin to reform around him. Unable to stop, the Flash runs straight into the creature's open mouth. Superman watches as that creature reforms in the ocean before him, and from behind, a voice calls out. Its name is the Flood. It comes from a race of Krakens native to my home world. Commander Drogue rises out of the ocean atop his demonic seahorse steed. Drogue wraps his hands around the Man of Steel's throat, and your world's reckoning has only just begun. Back on the Blood Reef, Aquaman and Black Manta begin to do battle as Admiral Tide watches on, Manta taunting Aquaman for not knowing his true power. Aquaman doesn't know of what he speaks and demands the villain fight. Tide agrees and shows him, showing him Mara. And Atlantis, Mera, and Ocean Master are fighting for their lives. With Arthur reaching out to Mera, he tries to warn her. But Orm knows that they are running out of time. He sends her to the Hall of Crowns, where the remains of the greatest heroes and kings of Atlantis rest. He tells her of the legend of Orion, of the heroes that fight against the evil creatures from the stars. And with this legend, he shows Mera the crown of Orion, which should lead them to the weapon that the hero used to strike down these evil creatures. Suddenly, the wall crashes inward as Captain Gaul arrives. Mera trying to use her magic to hold off the invaders, but Orm knows that it's only a matter of time. Sacrificing himself, he buys Mera time to escape. Back on the surface, Drogue is using his powers to suck the life out of Clark's body, out of the Superman. The Man of Steel is drained and almost lifeless, and releasing him, Drogue watches as he plunges towards the surface of the water. But the Flash is there, somehow unaffected by these flood waters that are changing mere mortals. Scooping Superman up, the fastest man alive retreats from the conflict. And in the Hall of Justice, Batman orders Magan to begin an evacuation, staying behind to guard their piece of the source wall, the mysteries of the universe, the totality. On the Blood Reef, though, Arthur watches in despair as the Earth falls. Triumphant, Tide grabs him, her energy pulling his true power from him, the power of the life force from the ocean. Ripping it out of Aquaman's body, she releases it into Black Manta. Arthur crumbles to the floor. It's gone. I can't feel it. I can't feel the ocean anymore. This is what you felt all this time, Aquaman? Black Manta calls out. You had this much power and you used it to speak to fish? The Earth has fallen. The Ocean Lords will build a new empire, and nothing will stop them. But outside, the guards see a ship approaching in the fog. Suddenly, they are cut down by a sword, and a shield spins through the air with a glowing lasso wrapping around the final guard. Now tell me, orders an armor-clad Wonder Woman. Tell me, where the hell is Aquaman? Back at the Hall of Justice, Batman is trying desperately to reach any member of the League that is left. Trapped in his hover chair, he asks Jaro, which is actually a portion of Starro in a jar, to reach out with his telepathy. I'm getting nothing, Dad. No one! The little alien tells him. The totality is safe for now, but the outside walls won't hold against the waters forever. From the static finally comes a friendly voice. Batman? Flash, thank God. Were you able to defeat the thing? But Flash and Superman couldn't even make a dent in the strange alien creature. What about the rest of the team? They're right here, unfortunately. Behind them, the rest of the Justice League and the reserves, fully mutated by the alien's waters, are chasing Flash as he pushes Superman across the ocean. Superman, weakened by Drogue's touch, can do little more than smack some of their former friends away when they get close. But luckily, 
He sports an awesome symbol eye patch now. Suddenly out of the ocean in front of them springs Swamp Thing, his body molded into tentacles. Caught in his grasp, Superman and Flash are powerless to break free. How the hell do you fight a magic fished out element? Flash yells as the tentacles squeeze tighter. He's a tree, you chop him down! Mara cries, her sword severing the former hero's limbs. We can't take them alone. We need the forces of Atlantis, Superman tells her, but Mara informs the heroes that Atlantis has been destroyed. Using Orion's crown, she transports all of them, hopefully, to where the weapon that will destroy the Flood awaits. On the Blood Reef, Aquaman is being made to walk the plank. Below lies the Charabo Vortex, a black hole in the universe's great whirlpool. Everything is ripped apart in its tides, and the ocean lords stand at his back. Long ago, they walked this plank as well, and they spent eons in the graveyard of the gods before finally breaking free. Aquaman's eyes are downcast, stripped of his power. He's already been broken. It doesn't have to be this way. He pleads, but oh, it does. You've taken my power. But Aquaman isn't done yet, and he turns on his captors, leaping against Gaul. But I live with Batman, and I've learned a few tricks. Using his enemy's blade, he severs his chains. Striking out, he gathers a weapon, rushing into combat. He swings the blade against Tide, but he stayed by Drogue's hand, stopping the blade as if it were nothing. With a simple gesture, the god throws Aquaman into the void. But instead of being ripped apart, he is saved, landing on the small ship that Wonder Woman pilots. Get up and sail. We need to get back to Earth, she orders, but no. Aquaman pleads with her. They have to go to the graveyard of the gods. Diana, please. God help us. So be it, she yells as she smashes the key into the deck. But I fear we are charting a course for nowhere. Mera, Superman, and Flash have now arrived at the Atacama Desert, the driest place on Earth. They are searching for Orion's tomb. It's hidden in that desert where no one can find it. Before their eyes, Flash begins to mutate, his jaw shifting into some sort of fin. Using his speed, he is holding off the infection, but he doesn't know how long he could do it. As his powers begin to return under the sun, Superman believes that he can see the tomb. So Flash runs, uncovering the long hidden structure. Meanwhile, Arthur and Diana are sailing across the hidden rivers of the cosmos, charting a course for the graveyard of the gods. Beneath their hull, the stars transform into water once more. And before them lies a strange palace made of bone. They have arrived. Back in Orion's tomb, Superman pushes inside the entrance. They are looking for the Tear of Extinction, the weapon that will allow them to defeat the Ocean Lords. Mera is shocked. The tomb, it's desecrated and the tear is missing. Suddenly a voice speaks out of the darkness. Black Manta, and in his hand he holds the tear. The only weapon that might save the Earth. Mera rushes towards the villain, her sword raised in her hand, and Drogue is at Manta's back as the tomb begins to fill with floodwaters. In the graveyard of the gods, Aquaman and Wonder Woman have managed to escape the guardian of this place, but they now come face to face with the decrypted remains of Poseidon. He's been locked here, never to escape. Aquaman informs the dead god of the situation, begging him to return his powers and show them how to defeat the Ocean Lords. Arthur Curry, if you think I am your savior, then you are already dead. And with these words, Poseidon thrusts his trident into Aquaman's chest. Meanwhile, the Hall of Justice's walls cannot withstand the force against it. Inside, Batman is calling out to any member of the Justice League. Can you hear me? But Jaro cannot sense anyone. Are they okay? The small creature asks, fear in its voice. And Batman tells the little starfish, it'll be all right, we're gonna win. He picks up Jaro's container, and they begin to evacuate. From behind, a blast of energy destroys Batman's chair, and over him stands the Legion of Doom. Meanwhile, Mara, Superman, and Flash are trying to withstand the might of the Flood and the mutated creatures of Earth. They continue to battle, holding back to the end, but Flash begins to mutate farther, his mind now calling out to Black Manta's new powers. And back at the Hall of Justice, Batman has managed to escape, slipping into the trophy room. Lex Luthor stands over the totality, a piece of the source wall, the power of creation at his fingertips. In the trophy room, Batman attacks clad in the old Luthor armor, his fists punching through a wall, sending Gorilla Grodd flying. Visiting hours are over, but I think there's an exhibit or two that I can show you. I do love this part! The Joker laughs, and the rest of the Legion prepare to attack. Meanwhile, back in the graveyard of the gods, Diana has leapt to the aid of Arthur, her fists impacting against Poseidon. But the god shrugs her off easily, allowing Arthur to return, his wounds seemingly healing. 
Arthur doesn't understand. Poseidon was only trying to use his trident to imbue him with the power of life, but his strength has waned. He stood alongside the hero Orion eons ago and fought against these beings, so why not help now? So Poseidon tells him the truth. When the gods known as the Ocean Lords came to the Earth before, it wasn't as invaders. Orion wanted to share the life force of the oceans with the others, so he sent out the call to the stars. When the others arrived, Poseidon did not trust them, nor want to share his power. He tricked Orion, convincing him that the Ocean Lords were evil. Together, the two locked them away in the graveyard of the gods until they escaped and became the evil beings that they are now. What was happening on Earth was Poseidon's fault. There must be something we can do, some way to make them see the light. But Poseidon knows what the graveyard can do to a god. They cannot be saved, they must be destroyed. Meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice, Lex has the totality. When suddenly the wall explodes with the force of Sinestro and Grodd's bodies, as they fall to the ground, Batman stands there, Joker's throat locked in his fist. Step away from the totality, he orders, and Joker waves. But Lex now has the power of the totality in his hands, and he simply teleports the Legion of Doom away, leaving Batman stunned. Mara, Superman, and Flash continue their fight, yet it is a losing battle and they know it. Suddenly, Mara realizes that the energy from the Tear of Extinction still lies within the bones of Orion. Using her magic, she forms a blade from the tears. Drogue screams, calling out to his Kraken to destroy her! But it is too late as Mara swings her new weapon. The creature dies with one blow, forcing the floodwaters to retreat. She moves quickly, blade piercing Drogue next. Yet he is strong, and with a wounded cry, he throws her away. They have the power to destroy us! We must retreat! Black Manta protests, but it doesn't matter. The villains are gone. The heroes of Earth now have a weapon to use in this war against the Drowned. Back at the graveyard of the gods, though, Poseidon could feel the Dark Realm beginning to crumble. We are not dead yet. There's still time to make this right, Poseidon. Poseidon stares at the former king. Perhaps there is a way. The three begin to head towards Wonder Woman's boat, with Poseidon handing his trident over to Aquaman. Use it as a weapon, as Orion did years ago. Fuel it with the tear of extinction. Make it rich with death. Arthur and Diana have no chance of escaping the realm without Poseidon's help. So with the last of his power, he pushes their craft from the crumbling world. Back on the Blood Reef, the Ocean Lords sense Aquaman and Wonder Woman's escape. Now the heroes of Earth have weapons that can defeat them. They have no choice. Release the Death Kraken! Black Manta calls out. Still trapped in the Tomb of Orion, Mera, Superman, and Flash continue to fight their way out. His powers returning, Superman is still wearing the super simple eye patch, so he only uses one eye for heat vision. It looks cool, so no one says anything. Despite the fact that they killed the Flood Kraken, though, the infectious waters still surround them. When suddenly they are saved, as above them floats Wonder Woman's ship. Ahoy, greets Aquaman. Mera and Arthur reunite, embracing in a lover's kiss, and the team sets sail for the Ocean Lords. Flash is Superman dressed as Pyrus to protect them from the infectious waters, because why not? Everything's gonna be okay now. Arthur knows how to stop the Ocean Lords. Using Poseidon's trident to fuse with the Tears of Extinction in Mera's sword, they have a weapon that can destroy them, but he doesn't want to do that. Knowing what happened in the past, Arthur believes that they could end this peacefully. The rest of the team are not quite so sure. To get past their barrier, there is only one way that they can do it. Launch the ships that Orion has hidden within Atlantis, destroying the city once and for all. Arthur believes that it is the only way. They have to destroy Atlantis. The team agrees on the plan when suddenly above them the sky split open, and from the depths of another realm emerges the Death Kraken, its massive tentacles reaching forth into our world. Commander Droke, if they make it through the barrier, you may set the beast upon them, Tide calls out. Diana will launch the city towers. Aquaman, Mera, Superman, and Flash will hold back the Kraken. Wonder Woman dives, and the rest set sail for battle, fighting to hold the world against the tide. In the depths of Atlantis, Diana tries to unlock the towers, but it is assaulted by Cheetah. The two begin to lock into battle, with Diana knocking her enemy away, quickly trying to continue with the lock. A claw slashes at her back, though, and blood is drawn. Cheetah roars, the Legion has won. Nothing can save them now, when suddenly, a blast saves them by throwing Cheetah away. And standing before them is our broken Batman. Sorry, was she talking? Batman had programmed the teleporters to take him to the League's leader. With Jean off world, that's Diana. The two then launch the city towers. Aquaman tries again to call out to the gods, pleading with them to stop this, to end things peacefully. They hear his words, yet they ignore them. Beneath them, the waters begin to turn, and breaking the surface, the towers begin to launch. Batman to the Justice League. The Towers of Atlantis are making their ascent. You may want to move. 
Batman orders, and he also wonders if Wonder Woman has any way to steer them. Clinging to the ship, Diana calls out to her friend over the roars of the engine. I'm riding a 4,000-year-old spaceship, Batman. It's safe to say that I'm winging it. The heroes watch below as the ships launch forward, ripping through the barriers of the Ocean Lord's ships. Now is their chance as Aquaman and Mera ride forward to face the gods, while the rest of the League hold back the Kraken. Luther Samantha. The tide is turning in the favor of the Justice League. Finish what we set out to do and I'll teleport you out. But Manta has tasted true power now and he no longer needs Luther or the League. Mera and Aquaman grow closer to the Ocean Lords, with Mera calling out for Arthur to finish off their enemy, yet Arthur still believes that there is a better way. He refuses to kill unless he has to. The Kraken's massive tentacle crashes down on their small ship, smashing it to kindling. But Flash is there still holding onto himself, his body mutated, his words little more than gibberish. The Flash deposits both Mera and Arthur on the enemy ship, speeding away to continue the battle. Shaking Mera back to consciousness, she now realizes the Deer of Extinction has changed her, shifting her heart to the Black of Death. Arthur is right, there is another way. He has to tap into his power, changing the Deer back to a weapon of life. He is connected to all life. He could do this. Mera believes in him. And with that, it's worked. The shell that held the Tear of Extinction now hums with the force of life. Arthur hands it back to Mera, surprising her. Because long ago, the Monarch of Atlantis called out to the universe. I'm not the Monarch. I can't play that role anymore, but you can. See the world as it should be, he tells her. So she places the shell to her head. And despite the death, the destruction around them, the Kraken's massive tentacles reaching out and grasping, Mera sends out a signal to all of the universe, to all that would hear it. Unknown in countless worlds see her vision. A life connected through the sharing of knowledge, of good faith. Above them, the Ocean Lords hear this message as well. Droke, least the Kraken! Tide orders. She is ready for a trick, for some act of aggression. And Arthur arrives with Mera, but they are not here to fight. Kneeling before these old gods, his hands offering the trident of Poseidon. You would give us this trident when we claimed your seas, your people? Tide questions. Arthur would, for the past mistakes of his people. This was the fate of the trident all along, for the original vision that was sent forth by Orion. The Ocean Lords stop, for maybe it is time for a parlay to end the bloodshed. But from behind, the Blades of Black Manta find their way into Commander Drogue's spine. Blades that are coated with the Tears of Extinction. Drogue perishes before their eyes, and retrieving the bone crown that Drogue used to control the Kraken, Manta reveals his plot. Say hi to Earth's new sea god. Steel flies through the air as his blade finds its mark in Captain Gull's chest, and another god falls. But before Tide can meet her own end, Arthur manages to block the blade with his hand. The tide is still wounded. Manta stands victorious, the words of Lex Luthor ringing in his ears. The oceans are not the League's concern. But Manta doesn't care. He has everything now, and as she lays bleeding, Tide takes the powers back from Black Manta, returning them to Arthur. It matters not, though. So what? Go ahead and talk to Fish. Arthur, what good is it to you now? He gloats. But suddenly Arthur appears with the entire might of the Fish mutated League behind him. Well, when every hero on Earth is a fish, plenty. He orders the other heroes to stop the Kraken. What about Manta? Questions Mera. Manta is mine. Trident and blade meet. The two titans locking blows as the battle for the very future of the planet comes down to these two men. The Kraken will not listen to Manta. He is but a man. And finally, Arthur gets the upper hand, twisting Manta's arm, defeating him. Arthur, the Kraken is too powerful. It's going to reach the ocean. Mera is panicked, for once the creature reaches the waters, all life on Earth will end. Staring up at the massive creature, Arthur knows what must be done. Not on my watch! He adjusts the ship's course, steering for the massive jaws of the Death Kraken. Arthur carries the life force in him. The chain reaction of hitting the Death Kraken will kill it. He can hear Mera's pleas. He can't do this. He'll die. You call me your queen while I command you. Come back! Do not do this! She watches as the ship draws nearer to the end. The creature filling Arthur's vision. My heart, I wish you fair winds and following seas. Always, I will see you again, Mara. In his last moments, the memories of sailing with his father fill his vision, and he is gone. Three days have passed since the end of our conflict and the supposed death of Aquaman. The waters have receded, and the people of Earth have returned to normal. Vague memories of what happened are all that remain. They know the heroes of Earth saved them, and that's enough. But meanwhile, in the Hall of Justice, a statue of Aquaman has been erected in dedication of our fallen hero. But not everyone believes that he is truly gone. Because somewhere, unknown, Arthur Curry washes ashore.
Now with the loss of the totality, Earth's heroes are trying desperately to learn the secrets behind the unknown subject. And that quest for knowledge has taken Martian Manhunter, Hawk Girl, and Green Lantern Jon Stewart to the far reaches of space to Thanagar Prime to seek out the Martian Keeper. As the three fly down closer to the planet, Jon looks around at the massive city, stating that he's only ever heard stories about this place. It's pretty rare that the sight of a place lives up to the dream of it. Hopefully they won't have a problem with them coming. But before John could say anything else, Thanagar Prime's guards, the wingmen, fly down with their weapons drawn, telling them, HALT! Martian Manhunter tries to tell the guards that they come in peace, only seeking answers. But the guard shouts, Many have tried and none have succeeded. Now yield! Hot Girl readies her mace, stating that she's really not in the mood for yielding. Are you ready, boys? But before the brawl can start, a voice calls out to the guards to stand down. They are threatening the Justice League of Earth. They have saved the multiverse more times than one could count. We will be gracious, hosts. The wingmen lower their weapons, and as Hot Girl asks who's there, a woman flies down telling her, You know. My name is Sheora Hall, Empress of Thanagar Prime and the last of the Thanagarian Empire, and I welcome you to the secret core of the universe with a solemn heart. She looks directly at Martian Manhunter, stating that she is sorry, but the one that he seeks, the Martian Elder, she is dead. Sheara then leads the three through the city, stating that she is terribly sorry that they have come so far. The Martian Elder was a kind woman. She even consulted with her when they took control of their world back from the mad god Animar Sin. She lived to see a brighter Thanagar, so at least there was that. Please forgive her. She should have sent word the moment that it had happened. Martian Manhunter tells her that he understands, and there is no need to apologize. But that's when Hawk Girl stops the group, spreading her wings, telling Shaara to look. The multiverse is dying, and they need to know everything that they can to win. The nth metal in her wings has been glowing bright and strange with a map to something on them. Please state that there is something on them that she can understand. Or maybe there is something in their vaults to help them make sense of what they need to do next. Shara stares at the wings quietly, stating, By Chathon. The design is beautiful, but I cannot read it. I feel bad that you've come so far looking for answers and I cannot give you any. At the very least, you have arrived on the eve of the great Thanagarian festival. It would be an honor if you would attend as honored guests. So later that night, as the three of them stand alone, John looks at the architect, stating that he's got to pick the brains of these engineers. Hawkgirl tells him to marvel at it all he wants, but there is something wrong here. Her history may be complicated, but Shiara was the wife of Carter Hall, one of the incarnations of Carter Hall. So if it's true, shouldn't they be the same person? How can there be two of her, two Hawk girls? The laws of nature aren't working here. When one dies, the next should be reincarnated. It's the lore of the Hawk individuals within the DC universe. Martian Manhunter asks what does she suggest. Forcibly pry answers out of the leader of a planet whose help they might need as the multiverse creeps closer to death. Hawkgirl walks away, stating, maybe she's just being stubborn or stupid, but damn it, she will find out what's going on here. Hope they pack something formal. As the night begins to fall over the Great Gardens, the people of Thanagar Prime gather in celebration, and Hawkgirl asks Martian Manhunter if he's okay. He tells her no, he supposes no. He was mourning. Not just at the loss of answers that he hoped to find, but to now be the last survivor of the Martians. Hot Girl then asks, how about they dance? She has danced in every human civilization that he's ever heard of, and at least five that he hasn't. It'll help take his mind off things. Martian man at her side, stating that there was a dance on Mars that he never quite mastered. His wife, on the other hand. So Martian man pulls his arm back, telling her that he can't. And that's when Shiara walks over, asking if they're enjoying themselves. Martian Manhunter phases through the ground, telling her thank you for inviting them, but he must excuse himself. Shiara asks Hawkgirl if she interrupted something, and Hawkgirl says no. But Shiara tells her that she can sense that she is lying. Why is that? So Hawkgirl pauses and then says that she just doesn't really know. She has lived hundreds of years, and out of all of them, she remembers that they were spent with Carter Hall. One of Carter Hall's lives was her late husband, Carter. So in theory, they should be the same person, but they aren't. Shiara and Hawk Girl should be the same individual. However, the same can be said about her. She saw something on the wings, didn't she? Shiara tells her that it's not a star map, that she is sure of, but instead it's something bigger. Hawk Girl yells, you're still lying! And Shiara places her hand on Hawk Girl's shoulder, stating, there's no need to lose your temper. But at that moment, Hawk Girl sees something and says, oh God, before flying off. Shayara calls out asking what is it, and Hawk Girl tells her that it's nothing, she just needs to go. She then telepathically yells out to Martian Manhunter, telling him that they need a side link now. So Martian Manhunter connects with John, and as soon as they do, images of the Martian Keeper can be seen in chains, led by Shayara and her wingmen. 
John asks, what is this image? And Hawkgirl says that she's not sure. But when Chiara touched her, she got this memory. But that doesn't matter. The Martian Keeper is actually locked away deep in the vaults. So the three of them gather together quickly, with Hot Girl telling them that there's some secret, something powerful and dangerous, and it may have to do with the totality. The answer is behind the door to the most secure vault in the universe. And that's when a voice shouts out to them, telling them that they will never learn it. Take down the Earther heroes! The wingmen shoot by, knocking all three to the ground. And as Hot Girl's mace is taken, Shiara asks, do you realize what you have set in motion? The simple act of seeking the truth is sending ripples throughout the universe. For the multiverse to survive, some things must stay secret. Isn't that right, my love? Standing over Hawk Girl's body is the not-so-dead Carter Hall, the Savage Hawkman. But also, at this time, back on Earth, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman have to face their own problem. The injured Starman is rapidly gaining power, and he's about to explode. Back on Thanagar Prime, Carter holds up Hawk Girl's mace, and Shayara tells Hawk Girl that perhaps she will find it in her to forgive her in the next life. Do it, Carter. Carter gets ready to strike, but just then the person Carter is holding turns back into a guard, and she shouts that she isn't the Earth hero. Shayara asks, what in the seven heavens? The Martian got into our minds, everyone to the vault. As the wingmen gather themselves and take flight, Shiara tells Carter that soon she will restore him fully. She won't let the Justice League destroy all that they have built together. Carter listens, but doesn't respond. Elsewhere in the city, Martian Manhunter removes the veil, reverting the three of them to their normal selves, and Hawk Girl yells that she is so sick of these damn secrets. She held the totality in her hands, saved her from Lex Luthor, with a universe of power flowing through her wings, and she still doesn't know why. And now Carter? Martian Manhunter says that it is strange. Carter had no mental shield, but his mind couldn't be accessed. Perhaps it's time that they cut to the dark heart of this place. John then says that with all due respect, this is Thanagar Prime. He's heard horror stories about the vaults here, like how robbers get trapped for decades with no escape. Hawkgirl then asks, so the space cop doesn't want to rob a bank? Shocker. John throws his hands up stating, whoa, it's more than that. This is a violation of sovereignty. Particularly if the Corps has a treaty in place of Shi'ar. Martian Manhunter asks, What if what Hot Girl saw was true? What if the Martian Keep is held against her will? Would that suffice? John tells him, Hell, if it doesn't, it should. It's not like they can exactly take my ring away from me at this point. The next morning, lines of aliens form to seek entry into the vault, with one group in particular depositing a rather large shard of the dead planet Krypton. After all the security checks are cleared, the wingmen bring the aliens to their deposit room, and a hand slowly reaches out from the shard. It punches down onto one of the guards, and a second later, John Hawkgirl and Martian Manhunter all burst from it, having snuck into one of the greatest vaults in the universe. John says that he really needs to brush up on his isotopes. Making kryptonite out of sheer willpower isn't easy. None of them should hug Superman for a couple of weeks when they get back. The three quickly dispatch the guards and the aliens, but as they fall, Martian Manhunter hears a voice calling to him, telling him that it was foolish of him to return here. But Martian Manhunter, in his mind, yells to the Martian Keeper, telling her, We can hear you! Guide us to your location! As he flies up, she says that their weapon, the risk is too great. But Martian Manhunter says that they should learn the truth. They have to. She has kept it from him when he last came. He must understand what is actually going on in the entire universe. But before they could get too far, Shiara flies down, stating that this is the problem with the Earth heroes. They think that they have the right to any corner of the universe. They do not consider the cost of their actions. Hawkgirl asks her, Oh yeah? You're one to talk. You made some kind of sick deal to bring back your dead lover. What did that cost? Shiara shouts that Thanagar was destroyed. She used the power here to rebuild a barren bank into a glorious new capital for their empire. She brought together the greatest powers of the universe. Thanagar Prime protects a secret that stretches the history of the multiverse. We have a right to defend it. And John tells her, yeah, funny story. You're all under arrest. Just then a voice calls to John telling him, sorry, but that's not going to happen. And the three are blasted with green energy. Kilowog stands there holding his ring out telling them, Actually, it's you three poosers that are under arrest. And I'm gonna need your ring and a full debrief on whatever the hell you poosers have been up to. As John begins to fight the other lantern, Shiara charges at Hawkgirl, and Martian Manhunter phases through the group and into the vault. Martian Manhunter looks at the Martian Keeper, bound and locked up with a strange device on her head, asking, What have they done? The Keep says that it's called the Absorbicon. It carries the collective knowledge and memory of the Thanagar race. 
It has long been one of their most powerful artifacts, but now it is much more than that. It is the key to Thanagar's survival. She told them to run, but if she has to die this day, she will be glad that it will be at the side of a fellow Martian. Now, listen close. To protect a great secret, the people of Thanagar Prime have wielded a great lie. Anamar Sin began the work, but Shiara eagerly took over. When the Source Wall was broken, all the Inth Metal had become far more reactive and far more powerful. Absorbicon can make memories real. It takes a great mind capable of holding all of their history and culture, and that is why she was captured. Carter Hall is a lie. The city above is a lie. If others knew how weak Thanagar had become, they would turn on them. Martian Manhunter then asks, what truth would they be so desperate to hide? And the Keep says that the reality that exists before them is not the first. It is in some ways, as much a lie as Thanagar Prime above them. There was a multiverse before this one, and its creator, she is coming back. The myth spoke of a universe before their own, a universe shaped into a predatory state by an all-powerful cosmic mother wielding the seven energies of creation. It was the story of a perpetual universe, dark and dangerous, designed to never die. It was the story of its creator and how she fell. The Maltusian scientist Krona ordered every piece of evidence gathered. They would suppress it, study it, understand it, and prepare. From one end of the galaxy to the other, they would hide her mark, the signature of her true power. The story of Perpetua was the most dangerous secret in creation. The individual that had created the multiverse before this one. And it should never be allowed to come to light. Should the meaning behind her symbol ever be unlocked, she would rise again. Martian Manhunter says that he doesn't understand. He thought the symbol originated from Mars, or at least the top aspect of it. It stood for justice. And the keep then goes on stating that the line across represents the source wall. The seventh line beneath represents the dark energies of creation that were sealed away by Perpetua. The seven lines above represent their most positive aspects, unbound and vibrant in the universe. For all of history, the balance has remained positive, but the old energy is meant to be locked away for eternity. They are reawakening, bestowing new and terrible power upon individuals. Even what Shi'ar has been able to do with the Absorbicon, to rewrite reality itself with the memories that Thanagar once was, would be impossible without those energies freed. However, she is dying. She is dying and there is so much more that needs to be known. So listen close, for when I pass and the illusion of Thanagar Prime falls, chaos will unleash itself across the universe. As Hawkgirl and John continue to fight outside, the Keep 2 continues her stories. She goes on stating that as time passed, the Maltusians evolved into the Guardians of the Universe and the knowledge of Perpetua was hidden here on Thanagar Prime. However, the Guardians still feared that she would one day rise again. There was a part of the myth that spoke of her great army, a dangerous and predatory race that dominated her universe. That race was built from the DNA of humankind and Martian kind blended together. When the universe was put right, Perpetua locked away. Their species were split apart. Humans carried the fire that Perpetua sowed in them, but it left them weak in body and mind. Martians carried the power that she instilled, but feared the fire of passion in all of its forms. Despite the Guardian's efforts to keep all of this secret, a small group of Earthmen unraveled the truth. The scientists understood that they were less than they were meant to be, so they found the means to pierce the veil of time. Before, Haranmir's curse took their people, so that they could use Martian DNA to re-engineer her army. You see, this is the part of the story that I so desperately wish to hide from you. The abominations formed by the human scientists. They would never be possible without the source of DNA that they pulled from Mars. It would never have been possible had they not abducted you, Martian Manhunter. He steps back shouting, what is it that you are saying? And the keep tells him, you've seen glimpses of yourself as a boy in a cage. You know I speak the truth. Do you ever wonder why in all their planet, only you were saved by Airdrill's experiment? You were marked, marked by the story of Perpetua. The lie served its purpose and has run its course. And now the secrets that covered it are laid bare. You are ready to face the truth. Though I cannot hold on any longer, Shiara is pushing the power to its limit. All that I know is passed on to you. Martian Manhunter screams out, No! You cannot die! And the Keep tells him, I survived the death of Mars, survived tens of millennia, thinking my species had been lost only to find you, rescued through time. I'm glad to have met you, to have known you. The symbol has two meanings, doom and justice. You must tell the multiverse which shape to take. 
Just then, Chiara breaks into the vault, shouting that she will not allow this. She will use the Absorber Con to rewrite reality through the keep. She will make her young again so that she will live forever. And as the keep passes, the knowledge is passed on to Martian Manhunter, and the walls of Thanagar Prime begin to crumble. Shortly after, John flies in with Hot Girl Kilowog, and Kilowog asks, All right, what the hell is going on here? Martian Manhunter holds his head and says the world is destabilizing. He then grabs onto Shiara as she tries to rewrite reality, telling her that she must go. This power will kill her. She thought she could master it, but she never could. The only way forward is to rebuild openly and honestly, and if she does not, she will doom what is left. Shiara releases a blast, knocking everyone back, and then she takes off the Absorbicon, stating that she is sorry for all of this. Let the universe see it then. Let them see how weak Thanagar truly has become. Soon the wingman guards turn to dust. And she tells the image of Carter that she created that she doesn't want to say goodbye again. She falls to her knees, stating that she was trying to do what's right. And Kilowog says, okay, now she's under arrest. Hot Girl tells him, no, this isn't right. The universe is terrified. But it has every right to be. Locking her up will solve nothing. We just need to get out of here before. She stops her telling her that they can't. The disturbance has triggered the locks. They are sealed down here. There's no escape and it's hopeless. And that's when a voice tells him, no. It isn't. Part of Perpetua's symbol shines as a portal begins to open and through it. Starman, followed by Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman step out. Starman looks at Shiara, and Hawkgirl says that it's strange seeing them like this. As Shiara says that she's never met him before, Starman reaches into her chest, pulling out her essence. He tells her that he knows that they've never met, but he still knows her. The totality broke the chain of resurrection, splitting her between two lives. Perpetua didn't want them whole. Shiara asks, what is he doing? And Starman says what he was sent here to do, to make things right. He releases the essence into Hawkgirl, and as she stands back up, she says it's like a piece that's been missing in her since she died at Shiara Hall. It's back inside, but how? Starman says that there are many broken things in this universe. It's time they started fixing them. Shiara then asks, where does that leave her? Did he rip her soul out? And Starman tells her, no, the soul is her own. He's simply given it back. Thanagar Prime needs a leader, and she can still rebuild it without the Absorbicon. So Kilowog leans in and tells John, I understand there's a journey that you're going on, and I get that, but next time there's some big, crazy cosmic crap and something goes wrong, don't be a poser and call for backup, John. After bringing everyone to the surface, Starman opens up the portal and says that it's time to go back to Earth. He hasn't eaten since 1988, and this kind of power does a lot to you. Batman looks at Martian Manhunter asking, we find what he's looking for? And Martian Manhunter thinks back, telling him, Yes, I suppose. But I need to find someone. Someone who might be the key to tipping the scale back to justice. As everyone gets ready to leave, Hawkgirl notices Starman staring at her, asking, What is it? Is something wrong? And he tells her, No. It's quite the opposite, really. I can see it now. How things are starting to line up perfectly. You're finally ready to fulfill your cosmic identity. It's time to fix the source wall. There are many beginnings in this universe. But there has only ever been one end. A place where all slowly lose perspective. It is called the Promethean Galaxy. However, it is not truly a galaxy. It is a place of gods and giants as old as creation. And home to the farthest finite border of reality itself. The Source Wall. For many members of the Justice League, it was their first time seeing something that they had only ever seen in psychic images or holograms. Each one of them looks and turns away, everyone except Hawk Girl. Her eyes remained focused, as if the wall itself is calling to her. And deep down, it makes her want to scream. The ship they're in comes to a stop, and Starman exits, making his way to the wall, telling everyone to get ready and open up the first portal. Starman has come up with a plan to help repair the broken source wall. The method? Sealing it with the remaining Omega Titans. He can sense the doubt in everyone's mind, but he's paid no mind to it. He knows that this plan will work. The energy flowing through him is the totality of power in the universe. All of its fundamental forces exist in a spectrum inside of himself. He was sure that it would work. He knew that this would work. He could perform wonders that would make reality tremble, and if he could reseal the source wall, the end of all eternity would be prevented. As the first portal opens up, Orion of the New Gods states that he has acted. The Wonder Titan is ready. That's when the second portal opens, and through it, Ganthet of the Green Guardians brings the Wisdom Titan into position. Finally, the third portal opens, and Shiara Hall and the last fleet of Thanagar bring in the Mystery Titan. 
Hawk Girl watches, stating that this is really happening. This is... But before she could finish, she feels a powerful energy running through her wings and she shouts, No, not yet! Starman rushes back asking if she's okay. And when Hawk Girl tells him that she's fine, he tells her that it's just anticipation. She's just about to fulfill her cosmic destiny. Are you ready to save the multiverse, Hawk Girl? However, this plan was brought to her attention only two weeks ago. Starman sat with her and said that he had a plan to repair the source wall, and it involved her. Her wings, they show the map of a higher plane of existence, and that has something to do with the totality. Part of her mind was rebuilt after Luther destroyed it, and it was restored with the energies of the totality. Now that Starman is completely attuned to the hidden energies of the universe and the defense system meant to keep them locked away, he can see how things in the universe are supposed to be. The source wall was a protective bubble between them and the void. A shield meant to guard this universe from the unknown, and that shield was punctured in the battle with Barbados back in DC Metal. That brought forth the Omega Titans. They were the multiverse's first line of defense. They would find worlds ripe enough with their respective energies, absorb them, and then seal the wall with that energy. Brainiac made a miscalculation in the No Justice event when he pulled the four teams together. He didn't include Hawk Girl. She would have been able to communicate with the Omega Titans. Hawk Girl asks, what is he talking about? And Starman smiles, telling her that she too is a part of the last line of defense. The Entropy Titan was killed on Earth, but he can channel its energies through her wings. Along with the other Titans in place, they can heal the whole together. He's already discussed this with the rest of the Justice League, and they are currently working with Steel and the Titans. It's not just the League, it's also Oa, New Genesis, and Thanagar. They've all agreed to help seal the wall. Hawk Girl asks if this is already in motion. How can he be sure that it'll work? Starman tells her, because he can hear the heart of the multiverse. It wants this to happen. Hawk Girl then asks what will happen to her. What is on the other side of the source wall if she's involved in this? If her wings use her to bind the wall? Starman looks at her and says that that is what he wished to discuss with her. Back in the current time, the Titans are placed along the holes of the source wall, with the Martian Manhunter stating that the Titans, they're docile, content, like they know that this is their purpose. A few moments later, Hot Girl flies out in a full suit of Nth armor. She says that she is in the suit that Starman designed, and that she's gotta say it's surprisingly comfortable. Batman radios in asking, does she know where she's going? And Hot Girl tells him, yes, it's strange, like an instinct. The wall is opening a place for the Entropy Titan, but she can feel it calling to her. This is her place. The energy of the Entropy Titan, it's in the wings. Before placing herself into the Entropy Titan's place, there's a flash in her mind as she sees herself taken away to a wonderful place. She asks what is going on, and Martian Manhunter tells her that it is the psychic world, a construct in her mind, a slice of heaven, she could say. It's made from all of her favorite places. The beings inside of the wall, the ones that bound here for all of eternity, guarding this multiverse. They're still conscious, and he wanted to make it more comfortable for her. If this works before they leave, he will put her into a trance and let her live here in this heaven. She begins to cry, and Martian Manhunter asks what's wrong. She turns back kissing him, so Martian Manhunter pulls back telling her to wait. And she tells him that she knows he had a wife, and she's been with Carter in many lives, but this life it's different. This ending is all hers. She wanted something that she could call her own. She knows it's selfish. Martian Manhunter tells her that no, it's not. There's something wrong out there, back in reality. Superman stares, stating that he's supposed to be dead. He died in his arms. And that's when Brainiac and his ships appear. Within the ship, Brainiac tells the drones to attack. It was also two weeks ago that Brainiac opened his eyes again. And the first thing that he told Lex was that he made a mistake. Lex asked him what did he miss, and Brainiac told him that he didn't understand what he had. He tortured Starman to retrieve knowledge on the seven hidden energies of creation without understanding that he contained each of them himself. Starman could have been the key to unlock Perpetua from her prison, but know that he is the key to a graver threat. Lex holds up the doorknob, stating that he already has the key. But Brainiac tells him that he's only unlocked four of the seven needed energies. The other three are unreachable as it stands. He will explain it in simple terms for simple minds. The Justice League has a key that fits two locks. They need to direct it to their lock, to the totality, to free Perpetua. If you're wondering who Perpetua is, she is the being that started it all. She is the creator of the multiverse and she 
is not a creator of goodwill. Superman crashes into Brainiac's main ship with Lex shouting that it's foolish to bring the totality in the midst of their enemies. Brainiac tells him that the ship can withstand the Kryptonian's futile efforts. The totality is stirring. She can feel him out there. Over the wall, Hawk Girl readies herself to be locked in place, and Starman tells her that he can channel the entropy energy that they need. The wall will feed on it and seal around her, and soon after, this whole affair will be over. Please forgive him, but this will hurt. He begins to pour the entropy energy into her body, and as he does, a small device hits him from behind. Moments pass before he reaches back to destroy it, however, it's too late. His powers, they're gone. Inside a Bradiac ship, there's a blinding light radiating from the totality, and then a pair of eyes open. Fury inside of them, palpable, all-consuming. The giants, her great warriors, cry out from the wall, bathed in her energy, expelling it from their now open eyes. Everyone stops, everyone turns to see something is wrong, something that was never meant to be released. Perpetua, the first creator who made a dangerous self-sustaining weapon. She would be sealed in the source wall, but now she is free and she will not be imprisoned again. The gods of New Genesis can feel themselves being pulled away, but before they can do something, they vanish. And that's when the source wall begins to explode. Once. There was one hole. Now more appear, shards of the wall breaking off, the Omega Titan screaming in pain, and then crack a doom The sound, it's deafening, shaking the very foundation of reality. The death of the source wall echoes in the souls of all of those who are present and beyond. The heroes watch, defeated, as Brainiac's ship fades away. They've lost, and now the multiverse will die. Later, at the Hall of Doom, Brainiac asks what they should do now. Lex tells him that though it would be obvious for someone of a higher intellect, it's simple. They prepare for a war unlike anything the multiverse has ever seen. But not only is this the end of the multiverse, but there's something else that needs to be handled. What if Martian Manhunter knew a little prehistory of Lex? What if they knew each other? What if they could work together to prevent Perpetua? As Martian Manhunter stands in the ruins of Sha'an Valley, once the holiest of places for the Martians, he says in his language, the word Sha'an was sacred. It meant place of ancient memories. This place, no non-Martian has ever set foot here. If anyone knew his kind, his friends, if the Justice League knew. But before you decide your next move, just know that by bringing you here, I trust you right now more than anyone else alive. A gun is placed at the back of Martian Manhunter's head, and a voice tells him that that's unfortunate because this is where it ends for you. Memories begin to play out of Martian Manhunter and his family long ago. And Lex Luthor says that he's guessing, that's your family? The memory fades and Lex goes on stating, I'm afraid that there will be no more visits to memory lane. My suit projects a field attuned to telepathy, blocking it, along with your shape-shifting powers. You have five minutes to explain why we are here. Martian Manhunter tells him, fair enough. I need help finding someone someone I once met as a boy. He was a part of a group called the Legionnaires Club. There's no record of him. No tricks, no weapons up my sleeve. Lex stops him and says there's no weapons up his sleeve, but one behind his back. Martian Manhunter holds out Jaro, and Lex says, Did you think that you could use him against me? Jaro has already been poisoned by a psychic toxin. Nice try, though. Martian Manhunter pauses for a moment and says, No. What have you done? Lex laughs, telling him, don't be a sore loser. But Martian Manhunter tackles him, shouting, we need to move! Just then the ground rumbles as a giant creature bursts out trying to bite the two of them. Lex yells, what the hell was that? And Martian Manhunter tells him that he didn't bring Jaro here to trick him. Jaro was brought here to fend off the corners. The two narrowly escape, and Martian Manhunter begins to tell the story of the person that he met when he was a young boy. He was kept in a cage, and there were many people who came to see him. But with that group was a boy. He kept gesturing to his shirt, and that's when he saw it. The infinity symbol meant eyes and 10 to the 14th power, infrared light. When his eyes adjusted, he could read what the boy wanted him to see. He said that his name was Albi. Lex ignores the story, asking, what the hell are those things out there? But Martian Manhunter then explains that they are the corners, thought to be extinct. They nest in moons and sometimes planets. They feed on psychic energy, specifically on memory, longing, and regret. Jara was brought to block such emotions during their meeting. Lex laughs, stating, Regret? The way those things are going, they're gonna feast on you. Martian Manhunter says that he's not wrong about his regrets, but that is not what they're here to discuss. He asked him here to appeal for help for finding the man that he spoke of. 
If he can find this man, Albi, he'll go willingly with him anywhere. Lex says that there are many men named Albi. Hell, three work for him. Do you really expect me to believe that? Martian Manhunter places his hand on Lex's gun, telling him, I do, because it's true. This place, as I said, was sacred to my people. I came here once every 10 years to pray. We would come together and take bad memories from the great mind, our most painful ones, our regrets, and chant Sha'an, Sha'an. The memories would go into the ground where the corners would feed on them, and they would chant those words until the memories disappeared. Lex then says that it sounds like a religion that he could actually get behind. Dwelling on the past, where does that leave you? Marsha Manhunter tells him most often, alone. When he felt alone, the boy would appear before him. He would ask Albie where they were, but Albie said that this place doesn't have a name. His uncle is the one who runs it, but it's for the good of mankind. He then asked what did they want, and Albie told him a sample. One where they can make something from Martian and human DNA. Albie also said that no matter what, they're never going to leave this place. Something about them all getting arrested or killed by the Blackhawks. They've been trying to stop his uncle's work for years, but maybe they could pretend they could leave? They would escape into their minds, a place where they were free and they were heroes. Just then the quarter screeches, and Lex says they do not have time for this story. Tell me how to escape this place or I swear that. But Martian Manhunter stops him telling him, I am telling you how to escape, just listen. One night the scientist came and told me that I was going to be set free, except Albi was crying. His shirt read that he was sorry, that they were going to kill me. Albi tried to stop them, but they wouldn't listen. He sabotaged it so that when they pressed the button, it would send me away. He told me to remember that they all weren't bad. And then one last message appeared in that infrared. Albi said his real name. He told me his name. He turned it around and it read Alex, short for Alexander. Albi was short for LB, meaning L2, Luther number two. Alexander Luther one was Lionel, your father. You're Albi, Lex. You can stop this. Lex stares, telling him to shut up, but Martian Manhunter tells him, it's true, they took your memory. Lex punches Martian Manhunter, shouting for him to shut up. The confrontation caused a psychic ripple, and the corners quickly attack. Martian Manhunter takes Jara back, stating that this is their only chance, and they can control one of these beasts. But Lex tells him that the slimy beach trash is useless. They need to. One of the corners then lunges at Martian Manhunter, but as he dodges, he slaps Jaro on top of it. And Jaro weakly says, I am not slimy. The two jump on the corner, and Martian Manhunter yells that Jaro did it as they escape. Martian Manhunter shouts that they're almost there, but he must hear the rest of the story. After the escape, the Blackhawks came for his father and his team. They let him live, but they erased his memory of the whole ordeal. They left him with nothing more than a sense that he had once been a part of something grand. Left Lionel a drunk and broken man. The father you knew, that you grew up in the shadow of. But he'd taken precautions. He left you something, a clue, a relic that you've been using. A piece of the totality found in the past. You once told me that humans were good. That you were good. The Martian keep wiped my memories. Both of us were taught to forget the pain, the regret, the hurt. It's who we are. It allows us to reach higher together. As the coroner gets closer to the two portals, Martian Manhunter says that they did it side by side. Don't go to your portal, Lex. Come with us. Lex struggles to make a decision, realizing that in his past he worked with Martian Manhunter, that there is good in man. But as the coroner crashes, Martian Manhunter jumps through the Justice League portal and Lex jumps through the Legion of Doom portal. As Martian Manhunter lands, Batman asks, did it work? And he tells him that he should have told everyone his intentions. He just needed to. But Batman stops him asking, did it work? Martian Manhunter tells him that he doesn't know. He can only hope that some part of what he said got through. Meanwhile, over in the Legion of Doom headquarters of Lex, Brainiac asks, where is the Martian? He was to capture him and bring him so they may gather information. Lex looks away, telling him that the Martian has nothing worth learning. As he goes to his room, he holds the relic in his hands. Any chance? Sha'an. Sha'an. As Superman flies above the buildings of Metropolis, he gets a call from Batman stating that they are ready. They have made the necessary preparations to call upon him. Superman lands in a rather snowy part of Metropolis, with Flash stating that the weather is exactly what Day 90 predicted it to be. Altogether, the combination should fool him into thinking it's time for him to return. But just before he could finish, the ground begins to shake and Superman calls out to everyone to be ready. They're about to face one of the most powerful beings in all of existence, Mr. Mixel Pitalik. From within the small cage, there's a spark and a blip. And inside of it, 
Mr. Mixel Pitalik stands up proud. Well, well. Flash Terror is asking, is it really him? And Batman tells him, this is him. Mr. Mixel Pitalik is a fifth dimension imp. His powers are off the charts. Wonder Woman then adds that the cage is made from black diamond, capable of trapping even Calypso. It should contain him and keep the city safe. Mr. Mixel Pitalik's eyes glow red and he asks, should it? You thought you could pull a mischief on me? Well, this cage might keep the city safe, but who's going to keep you safe from the city? Just then, the lightning strikes down and all of the buildings grow teeth and they begin to eat one another. As the debris begins to fall, Batman tells Superman the Daily Planet just ate his building. Flash begins running towards Mr. Mixel Pitalik, stating, I don't really know who stole your lucky charms, but there's no way you're going to. But before he could finish, his feet stomp as his legs sink into concrete. Green Lantern John Stewart holds out his ring, and just before he can make a construct, Mr. Mixel Pitalik points at him, shouting, It's like a circus in here! John blinks and his ring turns into a boxing glove, and his ears are replaced by light bulbs. Soon cars come alive trying to eat everyone, and Martian Manhunter shouts, We are not your enemies! Mr. Mixel Pitalik rolls around laughing, <laughs> and you all thought a ridiculous cage would hold me. No, no, I want to hear you plead and beg. Everyone begins to state, okay, plead, plead, and beg, beg. Mr. Mixel Pitalik wipes the tears from his face, stating, yes, you're all at my mercy. The smile quickly fades, and he says, okay, what's the real mischief here? Superman tells him it's simple. Martian Manhunter is telepathically making his subconscious repeat his name backwards to neutralize his abilities. Mr. Mixelpedalic sighs as he sits back asking, Why would you do this to me? Just to belittle me? Superman tells him, No, in fact, we did this to ask you for your help. You are all powerful and an incredibly dangerous creature, but at your core, you're not evil. What we are, Mr. Mixelpedalic stops him. I know all too well what you face and what we all face. Later, at the Hall of Justice, everyone sits with Mr. Mixel Pitalik and Martian Manhunter stating that they have recently learned that Hawk Girl's wings hold a pattern that can help them fix everything. Superman then says that they believe it's a map to the fifth dimension. And Hawk Girl then says, where is the fifth dimension? So Mixel Pitalik laughs. <laughs> where? Well, my dear, it's here. It's all around you. The first dimension is just a stupid point. Boop. The second is a line. Boring. The third is, well, it's material stuff. The fourth is TikTok time. And the fifth, well, <laughs> the fifth is imagination. It's everywhere at once. You can't see it, but if you could, you would see that it's freaking dying. Mixel Pitalik points to a hole in his head stating, ever since your tiny brains broke the source wall, imagination has been running wild. The fears, the hopes of every living thing, the imps, we can't keep up and we're wasting away. Our lifeblood is well, Never mind. the fifth dimension is not where the map is pointing. It's pointing to the sixth dimension. Wonder Woman tells him that there is no sixth dimension. But Mixel Pitalik says, ha ha ha, but there is, and it is the key to everything. Here. Mixel Pitalik holds out a plate showing the multiverse as a whole, pointing to each of the dimensions. But what they don't see is that there is a sixth dimension. The best way that he could explain it to their small minds is that it's a control, a realm for the thing beyond the imagination. There are four beings who could even exist there. The Brothers Three, the Monitor, the Anti-Monitor, and the World Forger, and the one who set it all up, Perpetua. The evil being that Lex is trying to call with the totality. When they are destroyed, they are sometimes reformed there, as the World Forger likely did after their little battle with the Dark. Martian Manhunter asks if it's possible to create a portal to the sixth dimension. And Mixel Pitalik says that it would take all of his abilities, but there would be one person who could go. Him! Mixel Pitalik points at Superman and Superman asks, Me? Mixel Pitalik goes on telling him, You would be the only one able to comprehend it. Over the years, I may have been infusing you with fifth dimensional energy to protect you. Superman then asks, You did that because you knew that this would happen? And Mixel Pitalik smiles, Of course, I exist outside time. Starman then asks, since you exist outside of time, is it possible to know if this will even work? And Mixel Pitalik says, Haha, no space hippie. Even this is beyond my perception. Superman slams his fist on the table. Do it! Open the portal! But Batman yells, wait a damn second! We're dealing with something beyond our understanding here. And Superman tells him, we are running out of time! This is far bigger than us, yes, and it's terrifying. But we have to reach higher. We are the Justice League. Anyone opposed? No one speaks up, and Superman looks back at Mixel Pitalik, telling him, This is it. Open the portal. Mixel Pitalik concentrates all of his power into his hands, and then, pop! 
a door to the sixth dimension opens up. Superman walks through it, looking back, telling everyone, it's okay, I'll be back. And as that door shuts, Batman says, we don't know how long this is gonna take. So for now, we should. But before he can even finish, there's a knock at the door and a much older Superman wearing a gleaming white suit steps out, telling them, sorry for being gone so long, but it's good to be back. Batman then asks Martian Manhunter, can you tell if it's really him? So Martian Manhunter tells him that yes, it is the real Superman. Superman then tells everyone, it is me. I've spent the last decade in the sixth dimension following billions of threads of possibilities. The good news is I found a way to save the universe. Now come, let me show you. Batman asks, how can we? The universe still needs protecting. But Mera and Starman stop him, telling him that they will stay behind to keep an eye on things. Superman then says that he has set the energy portal to handle their signatures when everyone is ready. So, everyone walks through that portal and they step out on the other side and they feel the warm sun shining down on them. Batman asks, what just happened? As Superman motions to all of the League's older selves, stating, it's simple, we've won. Now come inside, let me share the story of how we saved everything. But elsewhere, in a dimension hidden away from everything, a man stumbles in the dark. He calls out asking if anyone can hear him, but he gets no answer. He trips on something, and he flares up his eyes to see dead bodies all around him. Superman screams as he fires a heat vision blast into the air, stating, It can't end this way! It can't! Back in the sixth dimension, the future Superman tells everyone, Let me be the first to welcome you to the House of Justice. Martian Manhunter says that he doesn't sense any defenses, and future Superman tells him, because it's open in every sense of the word. It's more of a museum now. A tribute to justice and how it won the day. The full justice banner is more than a flag. It's the shape of the multiverse now. Just then a young winged Martian looks at Martian Manhunter and Hawkgirl, stating that it's so odd to see their younger selves like this. He senses that they are still like strangers to each other. The future Hawkgirl tells her son, Shane, yes, it was a different time then. Batman says, speaking of time, we don't have much of it. And Wonder Woman adds, yes, if we're going to go to war with the minions of doom, what is the battle plan? Future Wonder Woman says, you fear that the truth is more frightening than you know. And Flash says, we already know that things are scary. The source wall is, but before he could finish, future Flash infused with himself and Wally tells him, yes, destroy. Luther is raising a cosmic goddess. Future John then says, to top it off, the multiverse is hurtling through the void. And John asks, okay, how do we stop it? The future Superman tells him, that's just it. You can't, that is the lesson of this place. It is what I learned exploring every option. In fact, what we need to do is speed it up. We all know that the multiverse is flying through the void, but the question is to where? In the Omniverse, when any one of the multiverses break before its final evolution, it's sent back to the banks of which it's created, back to the super celestials like Perpetua. Perpetua was the rogue of the group, a bad seed. She created our multiverse using the seven unnatural energies. She wanted to create something more vicious so it would live forever. But her sons, the ones known as the Monitor, the Anti-Monitor, and the World Forger, alerted the others like her and she was forever imprisoned into the Source Wall. Perpetua's goal was to turn our multiverse away from justice and towards doom, to turn it into a weapon, one pointed at her brethren. So right now we must take control from her and help it achieve a higher form so that it can reach the banks of judgment, so that it will be deemed worthy. Batman says, I was skeptical at first coming here, but I'm listening now. How do we do that? Future Superman sighs, telling him, Forgive me. It's just odd hearing you ask when you were the one who... Look, it doesn't matter now. Tomorrow we can talk plans. But today, please go. Explore the world. There are hard days ahead, but on the other side, it's a dream come true. Back in the past, Mera wakes up Jaro from a lovely dream of him being the best Robin that there was to ask him questions. Jaro asks what does she want, and Mera tells him that it's Mr. Mixel Pitalik. He's grown some kind of energy cocoon. The readings are off the charts. What is he thinking? Jaro focuses and says, there's a voice. It's telling him, you must do what we agreed upon, Mixel Pitalik. Back over in the sixth dimension, the Justice League looks at all of the things their future selves have built and created, but for one person, it's different. He looks over a bright and happy Gotham. And the future Superman says that he knows it's a lot to take in, but it's a testament to his dream, his work. The future Batman says that he would like to thank him, not as Batman, but as his family, as Dick Grayson. Future Nightwing pulls off the mask and goes on telling him that no one gave more for this war than he did. His sacrifice, even his life. They all know that he expected to fight forever, but here, Batman is what he always wanted it to be, a symbol of what's best about them. Batman says that he has questions first, where the hell are all the villains? 
But elsewhere, as the night falls, Martian Manhunter and Hawk Girl watch all of the spaceships coming in and out of the port. And Martian Manhunter says that it's odd. Their future selves spoke about them being the shepherds for everyone. They also mentioned concealing part of the truth from the others. Hawk Girl then asks, what does he mean about them not telling the world what really happened to the source wall? He thinks that they should have told them the truth. Martian Manhunter sits back, telling them that it's what his entire journey has been about. It's what she taught him. That pursuing the truth, good, bad, ugly, it all matters. But just then Shane shouts to them, No! You mustn't tell them what you feel! You must flee! Now, this place, these people, they're not what you think! Here, I'll show you! And Shane connects his mind with Martian Manhunter and Hawk Girl. And Martian Manhunter says, No, it can't be! Meanwhile, in the hidden dimension, Superman tries to find a light to escape, but the harder that he tries, the more that he can feel his powers draining. Each time that he fails, he falls shorter than the last time, but then a voice calls out to him. Superman steps up, and his future self steps out of the shadows, telling him, I think it's time that we talked. Moments later, Superman charges forward, punching into his future self, but the future Superman laughs, stating, you must see that there's no point to this. I've already explained the truth of everything, and Superman shouts, asking, What kind of monster are you? The future Superman sighs. <sighs> he stops Superman's punch with just a single finger. He then grabs Superman by the wrist, flipping him over, slamming him into the ground. Future Superman then asks, Are you done? Good. All of this has happened many times before. Still, I come here out of respect for you. This will be your final chance to answer, but know this, fight anymore and you will be killed where you lay. Superman coughs. You won't be able to fool my friends for much longer. They will stop you. Future Superman tells him, I'm not trying to fool anyone. I'm trying to save them. Save them from the one person that dooms them and the multiverse in every possible future. You! Superman slowly gets back up stating, even if you trap me here for... But Future Soups interrupts him. Yes, yes, a hundred years. You will reach my universe and stop me. You've said it all before. I've heard it all before. But now I have my answer. Goodbye, Superman. Back in the sixth dimension, Batman sits with Future Nightwing, having a cup of tea when suddenly he hears Martian Manhunter telepathically shouting, We need to have a meeting. Seconds later, Batman is brought into a psychic boardroom and he asks, What is it? Martian Manhunter tells him, it's this place. It's not what we think. Batman tells him, I don't understand. So Martian Manhunter shouts, This future! It's a path that we would never take! Our host! And Shane yells, He could be here any second! Shane is the child of Hawkgirl and Jon Stewart in this future. Open your minds to me and I'll share with you what he's really done and what this place is! He will! Just then, everyone is struck with an energy blast and the future soups slams down onto the table telling them, If you want the truth, I'll give it to you. Manhunter shouts, he is not our Superman, and Future Soups tells him, On the contrary, I'm the only Superman that can save you. So Batman asks, where is our Superman? And Future Soups tells him, he's safe. Now, I intended on revealing myself eventually, but first I wanted you to understand this universe without being intimidated by my true face. We must team up if we're going to win. You know me as the first son of Perpetua. Brothers to the ones that you call the Monitor and the Anti-Monitor. The one who creates from an idea and hammers everything into existence. I am the World Forger. This multiverse is my masterpiece, but know this, Justice League. It is also your only hope. Right now, Mr. Mixelpitalik is in your multiverse unimagining it and removing it so that this multiverse can replace it. My preference is that you will side with me willingly for the greatest heroes in existence to side with justice. Batman tells him, No. What we need to know is what you're asking us to become. The World Forger tells him, Very well. Days from now, Lex Luthor will make an argument for doom to every living being. This moment is the beginning of the end for every multiverse. In every multiverse, except where one decides a method to predict who will side with justice and who with doom. Strike first against all who would take up arms against us. John tells him, You don't take prisoners of war before war. How many beings are you even talking about? World Forger tells him, Trillions! More than half the universe! Hawk Girl then shouts, This isn't a dream future, it's a nightmare. World Forger slams his hammer down with a thundering crackoom! And he asks, You dare say that I made a nightmare? 
You were the ones who ruined the multiverse that I built. You broke the source wall so the Perpetua may wake. Do you know the cost of chaining her the last time? World Forger pauses and tells them, I'm sorry, I'm just regretful. You have acted heroically, but in this multiverse, it has evolved into a justice formation far greater than yours. Now your only hope is to make it something fast and brutal, or everyone dies when they reach the judges. John then asks, what happens to everyone in our reality? And World Forger tells him, this is where the cosmic crises are caused. Like in those times, the essence of any being who has a place will be transferred when I strike my hammer. Wonder Woman asks, what about those with no place? And World Forger says, those who side with doom will be locked away forever. Martian Manhunter shouts, that is not a choice. This is not who we are. We voted once before about whether to allow the totality to hit Earth. Every day has been a discovery, some good, some terrifying. But with everything that has happened and might still happen, I would vote the same way. Hawkgirl says that she would too, along with Wonder Woman, Flash, and Jon Stewart. And then there's one voice who says, he wouldn't. Batman. Hawkgirl yells that they can still turn this around and Batman asks, what if we can't? Since our battle with Barbados, we keep taking one step forward and two steps back. We're losing. You have to face it. The stakes, they're just too high. What do you keep clinging to? Shane tells him, hope. And Batman tells him, maybe. Maybe it's time that we stopped. Wonder Woman quietly says that Superman would never agree to this. And World Forger shouts, this is the only possible future. Make no mistake of that. Your choice is this, save only the good or save no one. It is time for you to vote once again. Answer in your minds, your hearts. I will accept whatever you choose. A few moments of silence pass and the World Forger turns leaving. So be it, you will regret this. As everyone is teleported out of the psychic world and into a dark and ugly place. John asks, where are they? And Martian Manhunter says that the smell of the fire pits. Oh God, we're on apocalypse. Flash looks up stating, guys? I think we found where they're keeping the bad guys. Martian Manhunter follows up telling them that they must find Superman so that they can. But before he can finish, a laser shoots by them and a person floats up stating, Superman is gone forever. Wonder Woman asks how they know this and the person says, because I'm the one who destroyed him. We destroyed all of them. Martian Manhunter yells, we are not your enemies. And Hawkgirl asks, who the hell are you anyway? The woman takes off her mask stating, my name is Lois Lane and I run this place. As the energy cuffs are placed onto everyone, Martian Manhunter screams that they must free them, remove these shackles so that our abilities can return. Lois tells the lieutenant to set up the Omega tasers to a very, very painful level and shut them down. The man next to Lois shoots all of them with an Omega laser and Lois clicks the button, shutting their cell stating, good work, Lieutenant Olsen. Wonder Woman gets back up asking, why are you doing this? The man that you think is Clark, he, and Lois asks, do you think I don't know? Flash asks, how could you do this to us? You're the biggest idealist among us. And Lois tells him, I was born here, born on one of the World Forger's earliest attempts at justice formation. I watched him create countless universes where they tried to save everyone. And in every attempt, they failed and everything dies. Everything. Is that the cost for winning? Is this what Clark? But Lois stops him. Clark would never bend. He never saw the truth, which is why because of Clark, we lose every time. As Lois leaves, Flash yells, this cell can't hold us. We have Batman. And then he looks around. Ah, uh, has anyone seen Batman? The World Forger sits in his tower telling Batman, you're a smart man. You're one of the most strategic minds in all of existence, which is why you can see the inevitability of this path. Batman tells him, I don't, yet I'm willing to hear you out. No tricks, no deception, just facts. The World Forger stands up telling him, my job is eternal to create worlds from people's hopes and fears. Those that might last, I usher into reality. Those that I deem unstable, I return to the forge. If there is anything that I know, it's what stands a chance and what doesn't. Batman looks away telling him, if we choose your way forward, what would you have me do? World Forger explains, right now, Mr. Mixel Pedelec is unimagining the fabric of things. Once that happens, the crisis anvil will appear before me and my hammer will light. I will strike the anvil and this universe will descend upon the vanished current one. The life energy of those beings who have been placed here will be transferred to their future counterparts. Batman asks, what is my role in all of this? 
and World Forger tells him, you will be the one to convince your friends that this is the only way. And Batman asks, what of Superman? World Forger tells him, yeah, Superman. He's locked away in a galaxy made to contain him. Its sun gives him just enough energy to sustain him, but he's trying to reach us. All other versions of him have tried and failed, but yours, the prime Superman, with him it is possible. If he does, we will fight and Superman will die. Batman looks at the device before him. My God, this is a test. You want me to move the suns away from Superman? He'll die. World Forger tells him, yes, Superman will die, but his essence will live on forever within you, locked away. Back in the cells of Apocalypse, Wonder Woman throws herself into the door trying to break it open, but just ends up being pushed back. Hawkgirl sighs, asking what are they going to do? They've tried everything. And a voice then says, maybe I can help. So Shane peeks around the corner. Manhunter yells, that's it. Shane can create a psychic blast and destroy the barrier. And Shane tells him, I don't know how to do that. But Manhunter kneels down telling him, you just have to connect to something that you feel strongly about. Love, fear, anger, sadness. And Shane grits his teeth yelling, anger, anger, this world makes me angry. The world forger says it's the only way forward, but I can feel them, all of them, locked up or killed. He screams, his energy flows out of him, and then there's a loud boom as all of the cell doors explode. As the smoke clears and everyone steps out, Shane asks, did I do okay? And Hot Girl says that he did better than okay. You opened up the door. Flash looks up stating, he opened up more than just our door. Just then all of the locked away villains step out and they begin to walk towards them. Two-Face shouts to everyone, kill them! And the league begins to run. Just as they make their way closer to the airships, they realize that they don't have anywhere to escape to. The villains get closer and closer when suddenly a voice calls out to all of the prisoners to stand down. The airship lowers itself down and Flash says that they're running out of place to, well, run. The hatch opens up and a voice says, there's no escape from this world unless you get in right now. Everyone looks up to see the older Sinestro, the older Cheetah, the older Grodd standing there. And Martian Manhunter realizes, the Legion of Doom? Sinestro holds out his hand, telling them, there's no time to argue. Jump! Once everyone hops on board, Manhunter then asks why they're helping, and Grodd says, because time changes things. Pilot, take us back to the World Forger. And the pilot says, Roger. Wonder Woman says that she knows that voice. Who is flying this thing? And Darkseid tells her, it's simple. Darkseid is. Back at the World Forger's tower, he tells Batman that it is time. He has to choose sides. Batman looks down at the control panel asking, if I send the suns away quickly, will it happen fast? And the World Forger tells him, yes, it will happen fast. Batman places his hands on the controls, telling him, I'm so sorry, Clark. There's so much I want to tell you right now, but there's no time for anything except goodbye. And for Superman, he tries to fly towards the only light that he can see, and seconds later, it vanishes, leaving him alone in the dark. Back with the others who were captured, escaped prison, and then teamed up with the Legion of Doom in the future to find a way out of the situation, Lois's guards begin to chase the escaping shuttle, with Darkseid shouting, They're gaining on us. Grodd, use the laser cannon. Grodd jumps into the gunner seat, telling him, Come to Papa. Flash asks, Isn't this the part where we're supposed to start punching each other? And Sinestro tells him, There's no time for that, I'm afraid. No time for anything but this. Darkseid, how far to the portal? Darkseid calls back that they have two to three minutes. That is, if Grodd is still a good shot. Grodd laughs, telling them, I might not be able to read your mind anymore, but I can still tell when you're screwing with me. Sinestro then goes on stating, all that matters is that we get you back to Earth to stop the World Forger. Listen, all my life I thought of myself as an anthropologist, a student of the intellectual life's many paths. But Luther, he becomes worse than any of us become all under Batman's hand. I'm sorry. We are sorry. Grodd gets up from his seat stating, all clear. And just then Lois appears in the monitors asking, do you all remember Superman's journey to Earth? How his rocket kept him in stasis for all those years? And made us wonder, what if we could do that with more difficult prisoners? What if we made our own versions of it and we called them Krypton Cradles? Just then, the entire ship shakes as the guards begin to get within firing range and they shoot into their shuttle. Meanwhile, back with Batman, the World Forger tells him, 
I know there are conflicting feelings about joining me, but the hammer is almost lit. Soon it will be time to strike the anvil and bring about the crisis. The World Forger guides Batman towards a room and he asks, what is this? And the World Forger tells him, it is the greatest seat of power in existence. Batman asks, your throne room? And the World Forger tells him, no, it is yours. Batman reaches down to the panel and it reacts to his touch, opening the doors before him. Once Batman can see inside, he simply says, My God. The World Forger tells him, Look upon your work. The Sunbox, a chair built from Element X, allows you to see into people's hearts. But you took it a step further. You built the final bat suit around the chair. Not just to determine people's minds, but to change them and rewrite them cell by cell. This was the only way, wasn't it? And the World Forger tells him, yes, you are the greatest knight of the universe. Not dark, but bright. The sun, the true sun. Just then an explosion shakes the room and the World Forger shouts, no, your friends couldn't have. But back on the shuttle, Darkseid yells, our only hope is to shoot the Justice League out of the damned cannon towards the portal. Sinestro says that they're going to do this, but before that, they must know. Batman is the greatest enemy in this battle. His weapon is a suit that will rewrite your minds. Hot Girl asks, how do they? But Sinestro stops her telling her, we have a mole on Earth. He just gave his life to destroy the suit. Wonder Woman says that they will not go without them, and Cheetah tells her, you have to go, please. As everyone gets ready, Sinestro tells John to make sure that their light never grows dim. And Cheetah tells Wonder Woman to remain true. And Grodd, he tells Flash that he still hates him. Sinestro grabs the controls and whips the shuttle around, telling Lois, don't fire, we're returning. Lois then asks, where are the others? And Grodd says, well, they're in the can. Don't ask, it's just that kind of league. But just then the cannon fires and Lois shouts, stop them before they reach the other side. Olsen responds to her telling her, Something is coming right at us, and it's picking up speed. Sinestro pushes the thrusters to max, stating, Ah, yes. That's the old feeling, isn't it? How could I forget the power of fear? He flies the shuttle straight into the middle of Lois's cruiser, giving the League enough time to hit the portal and fall to the other end onto Earth as they fall. One of you flyers is going to catch me, right? As everyone lands, Hot Girl gets up, stating that they need to find their future selves and beat the ever-living. But the World Forger tells them, you won't have to look far. Did you really think that I wouldn't feel you coming? I wrote this reality. Everyone readies themselves for battle, but that's when there's another explosion. And Batman voice tells them, you should have stayed on Apocalypse. Flash covers his eyes in the light asking, is that Batman here to help us? Batman stands up piloting one of the largest bat suits ever created stating, I'm sorry, but it's time to imagine a different ending. The two leagues clash as they fight against their counterparts, but behind them, the World Forger's hammer glows bright as he holds it over his head. He tells Batman, this is it. The Crisis Anvil is nearly formed. Mixopedalic must have unraveled your Earth. It is time for you to use the power of the Sunbox suit to affect everyone's hearts. Batman tells him, I just need one chance to convince them myself the right way. The World Forger shouts, no, do not diminish yourself by clinging to who you once were. I am ordering you to accept their fates. You are the universe's savior. A power surges through the World Forger and Batman tells him, Please, with all I'm going to give to the future, give me this one chance. I can convince them. The World Forger scoffs. Bah, then try. But know this, if you fail, I will rip their minds apart myself, so make it count. Batman turns back, bursting through the league, telling them, Stop and listen! Out of all of you, I do the most doubting. I'm the most skeptical. But here, in this place, I can see the way forward. Hawk Girl bashes Batman, giving Martian Manhunter the time to slam him into the ground. And Martian Manhunter tells him, no, you have lost your way. Batman gets back up shouting, you need to listen! And Hawk Girl asks, why? So you can rip our minds from us? This isn't what we fought for. You are a traitor. Batman releases the restraints that contain Hawk Girl, telling her, you are no match for the Sunbox suit. I built it with all of you in mind. Just then, Shane jumps up attacking them, telling him, everyone except me. Batman fires a blast at Shane and he yells, damn it, all of you. If you listen to anything I've ever said, let it be this. I've been a detective my whole life and in this place, I found the answer in how we win. The only way forward. You need to look past everything and see it. But before he could go any further, the World Forger shouts, enough. The time has come. The anvil is formed. Reshape their minds now, Batman. And Batman screams, see the light. You have to see the light now. But elsewhere, 
A withering Superman sees something. He sees the light. Warm and bright on his skin. Almost like, like the sun. But not just one, several, several suns bathing the man of steel with power. At first he thinks that he's just imagining things, but the rays, they charge his cells and he knows. And he quietly says, Bruce. With his strength returning tenfold, Superman shouts to the world forger as he flies through the suns, one after another, gaining more strength each time. No, more power than he's ever felt before. He flies at a speed beyond physics, beyond imagination, his will, his anger. And Batman calls out, that's it, see the way forward. The World Forger can feel the vibrations. And just as he gets ready to strike his hammer down on the anvil to create the crisis, he sees it. He can feel it. He underestimated these beings. And when he looks up, he sees something coming at him. Something shaped a lot like a fist. Superman crashes down with enough force to level a country. And it is all focused on the World Forger. The world trembles and it shakes at the impact, leaving behind a giant crater in its wake. Superman stands over the World Forger, telling him, Look up at me. The World Forger coughs. You destroyed my masterpiece. You've doomed us all. You truly are the greatest villain in existence. And Batman, how could you betray me like this? The feelings that I felt, you believed it. How did you trick me? Batman walks up, telling him, I didn't. I do believe you're right. It is the only logical chance for us to win. I moved the suns into a fast orbit knowing that Clark would die, believing that maybe we'd have a better chance if he did. But I also knew that if Superman pushed through, the suns would be there for him. So I gave him a chance, a chance to prove me wrong. Because he's a friend and he makes me believe things that I can't on my own. However, going through all of the possibilities, there is one that you haven't looked for. And the World Forger looks to him. What is that? Batman tells him. The one where you fight with the Justice League. The World Forger slowly gets up stating, you leave me no other choice. And Superman extends his arm telling him, there really is only one way forward, together. The World Forger scoffs stating, this is foolish. And Superman helps him up telling him, no, it's uncharted territory, which is exactly where we need to be. So let me be the first to officially welcome you to the Justice League. But back in Washington, D.C., a pillar of light forms as the World Forger opens a portal back to their dimension. And Wonder Woman looks around, stating that the damage is worse than she could have imagined. Shane asks, is this what their reality has always looked like? Smoking and burning like that? And the World Forger tells them, no, this was my doing. I did it to spread terror. Just as everyone heads into the dimly lit Hall of Justice, he says, strange. I've never seen the halls so empty. But that's when Mera and Starman run up, stating, Thank God you're back! Hawkgirl tells them, Yeah, we leave reality for a few hours and everyone gets nervous. Mera shouts, Hours? You've been gone for a week. We fought Mixel Pitalik. It's been a week since everything changed. Batman asks, What do you mean? And Mera tells them to come, she'll show them. They were first overwhelmed fighting Mixel Pitalik. They were losing and the whole world could see it happening. Then Luther showed up with the Legion of Doom and unleashed a bat might to fight Mixel Pitalik to turn the tide. The Legion of Doom used their incredible powers and they won. Lex Luthor saved the world, but that's when he said this. They play a recording and Lex stands over Mixel Pitalik's body. He tells the people, greetings, I am Lex Luthor. You know me by many faces, but as a member of the Justice League, I was one of your greatest heroes. I have from time to time been called a scourge against the world, but I am here today to show you my true face, to tell you what your heroes won't. The Justice League broke the protective source wall at the edge of their universe, and only a few short weeks ago, what remained of it broke away and all of existence is now threatened by an all-consuming void. Hundreds of worlds filled with alien life and far beyond your understanding have already been destroyed. Your universe and the multiverse that sits within is dying. Make no mistake, this is the Justice League's fault. In the face of a dying multiverse, your heroes will tell you to appeal to the better side of yourselves, to continue living good, virtuous lives. Part of you would think, yes, that is the best thing to do. That's what Superman would do. But another, deeper part of you will be screaming in abject horror. What do you do as the universe dies around you? Smile and hope for a better tomorrow or embrace the scream? Do you do what is best for you and your own? 
They call those who cling to the true emotions within themselves as villains. They called me a villain, a vain, selfish creature of ego. So be it. Let them say what they will. We have seen the hero's path and it will lead to ruin. The universe is dying. We must save ourselves at any cost. We must all be villains. Effective immediately, I am dissolving LexCorp. Every penny of my multi-billion dollar fortune will be given away to the people who will show you the way to save yourselves. Soon you will see what I am willing to sacrifice for this cause, but ultimately it will be on each and every one of you to choose your path forward, to choose justice, or choose doom. The only way to save your world is to make this the year of the villain. You'll be hearing from me shortly. Mara then says that the broadcast was transmitted everywhere. Riots followed shortly after people lashed out in fear. Batman asks, that's not all, is it? And Mara tells him no. So Superman then asks, what was Lex going to sacrifice? And Mara says, himself. First, Lex went to the White House and he took down Amanda Waller, robbing her mind of the location of the most dangerous people on the planet. The government tried to step in, but Lex went to LexCorp Tower and destroyed it with himself inside. Superman then asks, who did he give his fortune away to? Do we know? And Mara says, no, but based on the information he stole from Waller, Batman finishes, it's going to the world's worst villains. We need our eyes on all of them immediately. The World Forger steps forward stating, this is an extraordinary dangerous turn of events. This is what Perpetua needs to gain her power back. Our only hope is to find my brothers, the Monitor and the Anti-Monitor. They held her back once before. Starman shouts, no, I can feel what we need to do. We need to unlock the mystery of the power within me. I can feel it echoing through hypertime and the multiverse. Wonder Woman then says, no, we have to keep our eyes on Earth. We have so many incredible heroes that we can recruit. The Justice League needs to be bigger than ever before. Martian Manhunter tells everyone, we need to do all of it. All of it and more. There's a great war of justice and doom coming, and I fear it's about to get much, much worse. Meanwhile, over at the halls of the Legion of Doom, lightning strikes as Brainiac watches over his production of a drone. Just then, from one of the test chambers, a man breaks free and climbs out, grabbing a robe. Brainiac says that it worked, and the hooded man says, Of course it did. The body is unfinished, but the groundwork for my evolution is set. Are the drones ready? Brainiac tells him, Yes, but just say the word and they will make their way to their targets. The man steps out into the rain, stating it's time for the villains of this world to see what I truly offer them. The heroes won't have a chance when they rise with doom in their hearts. Launch the drones. It's time for the Justice League to understand that their doom has just begun. Lightning strikes again, showing enough light to reveal the face of our hooded man. Lex Luthor evolved to the Apex Predator. As the world turns, the chairman of the Justice League listens. He hears the man at the bar talk to a mysterious man in a cloak who gave him a suitcase of mechanical locusts so that he could attack his negligent landlord. He hears the woman speak to her co-workers about how the cloaked man gave her a death ray to put an end to her husband. He hears the disgruntled employee tell his colleagues that a man in a cloak presented him with a satchel full of pirate gold and that he would never have to work another day in his life. Those listening to these people don't always believe them, but they wanted to. They were all lies, of course, but... But Martian Manhunter knew that this was the work of one man, Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor had died for humanity so that they may see the truth, but many believe him to still be walking in the cold hours of the night. Every day there were more and more sightings of him. He was somewhere out there. Martian Manhunter's calm pops up with a message from Hot Girl telling him that he's needed at the Hall of Justice. However, he ignores it. The others disagree in this search for Lex that they need to prepare for something bigger. Martian Manhunter knew that he was meant for more than that at the moment, that his childhood was the reason that he chose to pursue Lex. He was Jean Jean's detective Manhunter. He would hunt this man to the end of the world and beyond. He would find Lex Luthor and put an end to this. While Martian Manhunter continues to look for Lex, the Justice League goes to the House of Heroes, the place where the heroes of the multiverse meet for aid. There they see alternate versions of themselves, and even heroes that are giant rabbits like Captain Carrot. As the council gathers, Superman explains that they are facing a destruction like they've never seen, one that came from the source wall falling in each of their universes. Surviving means that they must all stand together for the greater good. And the only way to do that would be with the help of the World Forge, the son of Perpetua, 
the being trying to end everything. The World Forger steps forward telling everyone that it is he who created their worlds, molded by his hands, and it fills him with pride to see them all ready for fighting. But for them to win over this great evil, they will need the help of his brothers, the Monitor and the Anti-Monitor. While the League goes over these plans, Martian Manhunter follows a lead from one Edna Brigham of Spring Hill, California. While driving down the freeway one night, she saw a strange figure in a cloak watching her from the edge of the road. Martian Manhunter saw through her mind to see if what she saw was real. The man in the cloak was there, in this very building. Martian Manhunter scans the area around the broken home, not sensing anything. But then again, if Lex didn't want his presence known, he could make sure that he wouldn't be found. He has something planned, something so terrifying that it will rip the world apart and it cannot be allowed to happen. So show yourself, Lex! A voice from behind tells Martian Manhunter that if he wants answers, he has come to the right place. Martian Manhunter looks back to see Lionel Luther charging at him and he calls out. But Lionel says that this place is where the story began and where it will end. Visions of the past race through Martian Manhunter's head. These moments were hidden away from him. It was a horrifying chapter of his life relived. A lifetime of nightmares all flooding into his mind. He was poked, he was prodded, he was experimented on. A powerful psychic mind can assert control over the subconscious, he tells himself, desperate to wake up. But his heart drops in childlike terror when he sees the face again. The chief scientist whose mental blocks are preventing him from seeing anything that the scientist did not want him to see. As many eyes watched him scream in pain, there was also ones willing to help him, willing to free him, give him back his life. Martian Manhunter screams the Luther name, waking up in the same tube that he was held in when he was younger, telling himself that it was all a dream. Lionel stands outside of the containment tube asking, Is that so? Because it seems very real to me. The cage is present. Not some lie created in your nightmare. You must escape. Martian Manhunter expands his body size to try and break the glass, but his efforts are in vain. Instead, Martian Manhunter seeps through the cracks and wires, and he lunges out of the computer panel, shouting that Lionel is dead. I examined the remains myself. Who are you? Lionel's face splits open, revealing an android beneath the flesh, and it tells him that there are still experiments that need to be conducted. If you would, please return to your cage. Or perhaps a bit of heat vision stolen from the Kryptonian would persuade you. That's when a pair of red glowing eyes charge up and a loud whoosh of fire rips through the air. A large man then begins to walk towards Martian Manhunter as he demands to know who's in charge. The twisted man appears on the monitors, asking who else would it be. He's found himself in the clutches of Professor Ivo. Now Amazo, put the Martian back in his cage. Meanwhile, elsewhere. Superman and the others step out onto a dead planet, with the Flash asking where are they. Superman tells him this is where the Monitors once lived, before the final crisis. Jon Stewart then asks, I thought we were looking for a Monitors, singular. The World Forger says that they are. The multiverse was once infinite, but due to the crisis set in motion by his brother, the Anti-Monitor, it collapsed into a singular universe. What would have been infinite only contained 52 universes, his older brother, the original Monitor, was reborn and splintered into many aspects. It was not until the Dark Multiverse that he began to reform his true self. A being slowly begins to appear, stating, Yes, I was reformed, only to be captured and tortured by a nightmare that I should never have forged. Have you come to stop me or help? The World Forger tells him that this multiverse has grown from infancy. It was broken. Why would they heal a multiverse that cannot heal itself when doom mastizes at its heart? The Monitor yells that the multiverse is worth saving! And damn you for not thinking so, World Forger. I will not simply let it die. Batman tells him, you shouldn't. Fight with us to save the multiverse. The Monitor falls to his knees, sighing, saying that the last time he tried, infinite worlds died. He lacks the tools he once had, his ship, his harbinger. But of all people, Flash sees it, right? He can feel the echoes, the chill of death. Is that what you've come here chasing? The Flash thinks on it and feels something, but he can't remember. He can remember the echoes, but the Monitor shouts asking how can they trust him when they could not even remember what they've lost? How can they stop their mother perpetual? Do they not know how powerful she already is? She gains more power with each passing day. What hope is there? Superman puts his hand on the Monitor's shoulder, telling him that it's hope that together they might make a difference. The World Forger holds his hand out, stating, well, I've tried to forge a new multiverse to replace this one, and it didn't work. So now I'm giving this a shot. 
Will you join the Justice League monitor? The monitor stares for a moment and says that if they're going to have any hope, they have to find their other brother, the anti-monitor of Quart. May the source save us all. Back at the old house, though. Martian Manhunter lays strapped to an examination table. Professor Ivo says that it's fascinating, really. Luther came to him with the body of Brainiac, hoping that his skill of blending man and machine could heal his injuries. It took months, but he succeeded. He didn't care for the colorful antics that Lex had in him. He was a scientist. As payment, he was given the life work of Lionel from when he was a member of Vandal Savage's Legionnaires Club. He was given a mission, solve what Lionel could not. They were called the Apex Predator, the cosmic pinnacle of evolution. The secret of the pinnacle of evolution rests inside the body of the Martian. All this time, he sought to make the perfect weapon out of machines, but Lionel sought to build it out of flesh. Truly visionary work. Now the next part is going to be extremely painful. A female voice tells him that he can say that again, and a second later, Hawk Girl jets in, swinging her mace, smashing the Amazo droid. As Martian Manhunter is freed, he asks, how did she find him? And Hawk Girl sighs, stating, does everyone forget that she spent most of her life running a spy organization? The two cleave their way through the androids, and as the last begins to fall, Hawk Girl looks at the computer and asks, what is an Apex Predator? Martian Manhunter slams the head of the remaining android, stating that the Apex Predator was the name of Lionel's creatures that Perpetua made from mankind and Martian kind, the combination of humans and Martians, the ones that made up Perpetua's armies, immortal weapons of death. As the two look up, they see a room full of empty-minded creatures, and Ivo says yes. All these creatures are incomplete, sadly. Oh, how I would have loved to have seen them work. Rage sets in and Martian Manhunter charges at Ivo, grabbing him, demanding to know where Lex is. And Ivo laughs, turning robotic, telling him, Is this some sort of joke? You all saw it on television. Lex Luthor is dead. Ivo's mechanical body falls to pieces. And Hawk Girl says that it's time for them to go. They should call the Justice League to take these two into custody. As they leave, Martian Manhunter says that he can feel that they're being watched. At that moment, a small drone flies down and the voice of Lex can be heard. Thank you for cleaning up that mess. Hawk Girl yells at that voice. It's impossible. And Martian Manhunter asks, are you alive? Lex says, no more than ever. I have an offer. Jean Jean's of Mars. I can give you exactly what you're looking for. I can give you me. The next morning, somewhere over the desert in the southwest, Martian Manhunter and Hot Girl fly to the coordinates given by Lex, and Hot Girl asks, shouldn't they at least call somebody? Martian Manhunter tells her no, Lex would know. They would lose him the second that they make contact with anybody. As the two touch down at the giant stone pillar, Lex telepathically says that if he tells her anything, this line will be cut forever and they will never find him. Put Hot Girl into a deep sleep, and then the entrance will be made for you. Marsha Manhunter asks why should he do that, and Lex says that it's simple. If you don't, you will never get a chance to speak to me again. The choice is yours, but you must make it quick. There is work that needs to be done. Hot Girl tells Marsha Manhunter that she may just be frustrated with him, but please tell her what to do. And Marsha Manhunter tells her, forgive me. Soon Hot Girl falls to the ground, and seconds later the doorway opens, and Lex steps out telling him, excellent, now follow me, Jean. Martian Manhunter steps through the portal telling him, by the gods. Lex tells him that this is an ingenious bit of technology. This entire base is just slightly out of sync with the rest of reality. The handiwork of my father and the other scientists working for Vandal, though I loathe to give them credit. The little spider drones begin to carry in Hawk Girl, and Martian Manhunter asks, what are you doing here? Lex tells him that he's making sure that she doesn't get into any trouble. She won't be hurt. You have my word on that, Manhunter. Martian Manhunter tries to look under the cloak, asking, what have you done to yourself? Lex says, oh, we will get to that, but please follow me. There's a lot to show. Soon they enter a room with a display of the world and the images of the villains spread all over it. Lex explains that this is the intelligence that they pulled from Amanda Waller's mind. Drones were sent to give his offers to the most dangerous people on the planet. Right this moment, the technology and the money that he's given them, oh, it's going to be quite the sight. And Martian Manhunter asks why? What is the point of all of this? Lex goes on telling him that it's about evolution. That's what this has always been about. Heroes have vastly overestimated what people think of them. The universe is dying. Why should any of us fight for the common good? You can feel it too, right? The Justice League is preparing for an outright war. It must drive you mad that you are pursuing this selfish route. Martian Manhunter asks, what do you mean selfish? I am doing this because, 
but Lex stops him. You're trying to save me, but that's not going to make the world a better place. You want to make yourself feel better, to make yourself feel right. It's your own drive towards doom. You may as well accept it, but alas, humankind and Martian kind, we've always been a little more than base animals scabbing for our own selfish needs. I once felt small. I hated all of the inherent power inside of Superman, that he would make any excuse to justify the insecurity for what it was. It was the knowledge, deep down, that we were meant for more, that we could be perfected. Martian Manhunter tells him, Perpetua has twisted your mind into something unnatural, Lex. And Lex shouts, She is the one who created the multiverse! How can you say that her desires are unnatural? They are nature itself, Manhunter! Lex laughs. <laughs> yes, I, I hear myself, the great scientist, becoming a zealot. I spoke with Perpetua while I incubated. If she had gotten her way, we would be a beautiful race of immortal apex predators. There was an offer made, and this is it. We would have conquered the multiverse and created an empire so powerful that no cosmic judge would ever dare challenge us. And we still can. There was an offer made, and it is this. Join me of your own free will, and together we will embrace our destiny. Together, we will form a singular being, the first of a race that will one day rule all of existence. This is our destiny! It was taken from us! Let's start making the universe right. Martian Manhunter steps back, telling him, You are insane! And Lex sighs, It's a pity, really. It didn't have to be this way. Martian Manhunter falls to the ground, screaming, and pain begins to rack his body as Lex tells him, You let me into your mind, and that was your first mistake. My technology has been mapping it, hacking it. My father once dreamed of cloning a human body capable of taking in a Martian DNA. He perfected the design. I became the design. Your mind will be obliterated and soon we will be made one. Just know that there is no malice here. I'm glad it could be you, Jean. Hot girl screams as she bursts through the wall, but Lex calls up a force field, capturing her, telling her, You can strike it all you want. It was designed to withstand your inf metal. As Martian Manhunter's body shrivels, it's absorbed into Lex's and he tells Hawkgirl, You must run! Lex is insane. His war is going to bring down the universe. Lex laughs, telling him, That's the idea, isn't it? Hawkgirl beats on the force field, shouting for Martian Manhunter. But as the last of his body is assimilated, he says, Bren will not work. Scrambled. Almost completely gone. Forgive, please. Forgive, make right. Hot girl screams and cries as she continues to beat on the force field, shouting, No! No! But soon there is nothing left of Martian Manhunter's body. Hot girl calls out to Lex to let him go, but Lex laughs, telling her, You will find that I am more dangerous than just being Lex Luthor. As the scales tip, doom will reign, and there will be no escape for you in that little Justice League. Hot girl yells, I don't care what you become. I just want you to understand this. I'm going to kill you for what you did to Jean. I'm going to rain hell on you and your legion. We are going to win. Lex smiles. That's the spirit. Guess there's only one thing left to say before this entire base destroys itself. The cloak falls, revealing Lex in his new apex predator body, a merging of Lex Luthor's human nature and Martian Manhunter's Martian nature. And he tells her, bring it on. In many ways, the universe is a giant jar. It is a space enclosed and governed by unseen rules and laws. Some born of magic, some born of science, and others more mysterious. Once in a while, though, a pocket will form in the outermost reaches of space, an anomaly, a kind of impossible vortex where the normal rules don't apply a space outside the jar. Planets formed within these pockets are called zero worlds. They are rogues and often implode or destroy themselves before they mature. However, there is one zero world known to have made it to maturity, and it's a terrible place. Everywhere else life begins, it evolves, it grows. But on this planet, a strange wild creature emerged, fully formed out of the primordial ocean. While growing plants bloomed outward on zero worlds, 
Its goal was to go backwards. On this planet, all species began at war, and their only purpose was to eliminate one another until the more merciless were left. Of those creatures, a single being rose. Star Zero, or Starro. Starro destroyed everything in his path, every civilization, every mind. He was often referred to by many names as well. The Flaming Death, the Black Star, and for eons he has gone by a single name. There are few more feared than the one that they call Starro the Conqueror. For to see him coming is to know death. No, wait. Pain. So much pain. Then death. These are the words spoken by the greatest Robin to ever live. Jaro. A piece of Starro that survived one of the battles the Justice League was in and decided to join with the Justice League, to side with hope. And now it is time to do what must be done, to bring the Legion of Doom turns to justice. But as Jaro invades the secret base of the Legion of Doom, he is reminded of his humble upbringing. For he is not a spore of Starro, he is Starro. When the universe was threatened by the Omega Titans, he watched as friend and foe alike banded together to save all of creation. The people who fought against each other for years now working side by side for a greater good. That experience changed him, and the great starfish took on one of the Titans alone. His actions gave the rest of the Justice League time to win the day, but led to his tragic death. With Starro's sacrifice, there was a dawning of a new age of justice, and it was the new age that a small piece of the original Conqueror was discovered alive and nurtured by the returning heroes in a jar. Reborn as Jaro, the one-time villain joined these incredible heroes as their friend and their compatriot, especially Batman's, and perhaps their greatest member ever, and perhaps their greatest Robin ever. And it is because he is the most awesome member of the Justice League that he will single-handedly take down the Legion of Doom jerks with a batarang that turns into a bat cannon. It didn't matter that Lex has become the ultimate creature who has six or seven dark forces that mirrored the ones known to govern the material universe. They were all about to be blown away. Or maybe not, as Cheetah smacks the bat cannon out of Jaro's hands. If that's the case, a bat nerve pinch will subdue her. Then the use of a little bat stealth and mind-controlled Brainiac to do work for him. Even though Jaro has valiantly dismantled the Legion of Jerks, he has to share some of the spotlight with his fellow heroes. But wait, there's something wrong. The heroes don't win this fight. They can't win this fight. Perpetual would rise, and in all of her terrible glory, the universe would be reshaped. All that was good would forever be doomed. No, Jaro can't let that happen. He won't let that happen. That is not how the story is supposed to end. Jaro will change the ending. He will give up everything and become the monster so that the heroes don't have to. He would become what he was designed to become, the Conqueror. He grows in size, releasing his spores on the villains so that the heroes may not be forever doomed. The heroes beg and plead for him to stop, that he mustn't do this, but it is the only way that he can save his father. Batman rips the spore off of his own face, asking, What have you done? Why is everyone covered in spores? And why are we still on the Hall of Justice? Jaro explains that he was going to take them to Zero Worlds, to keep them prisoners hidden from everything. But Batman explains that that's not winning. That's control. Jaro shouts to his father, It must be this way! It's the only way to save you, father! And Batman shouts, This is not who we are! We must be the light in this dark universe! We must work together to see this through. And for what it's worth, we're afraid of losing you too. I'm afraid of losing you, Jaro. That's why we're going to win. As a father hugs his son, Superman asks, what just happened? What's going on? Batman says, tell him. And Jaro tells everything, telling them that it's simple. They're preparing for war. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Lex is listening into the conversation along with Brainiac. He thinks to himself, saying out loud, that it is Jara that unlocks his full potential. Brainiac says that he may, but he is still just a fragment and he is no match for the original Starro, who they've currently got a piece of. Lex asks if he'll regrow in time, and Brainiac tells him yes, 
But what's even more important is that he's connected physically to all of his pieces, so that when that little fool Jaro took over the minds of the Justice League, Starro here was able to gather all of their battle plans. Lex begins to laugh. <laughs> Good. Then we've already won. The world is in ruins. There was destruction as far as the eye could see, and standing atop of the Mount of Bodies was Lex Luthor, and he was smiling. No matter what anyone tried, they all died. And then she came. Perpetua. Perpetua has risen. Doom has won. The Justice League is dead. Now bow before your new god and meet your fate. Starman breathes heavily as he stands before the League, telling them that there isn't a need to show them the rest. It's far grislier than they could ever imagine. Luther wins. Doom will win. And it will all happen in three days. His abilities allowed him to glimpse into the heart of hypertime itself, which is the cosmic flow of timelines and histories that governs their reality. This was not a dream. It was not a hoax. Not an imaginary story. It was real and imminent. Wonder Woman was the first to speak, stating that her dark team has consulted with the most powerful seers on the planet, and all of them agree that a great darkness will rise at this exact time. Superman stands up stating that this is why they've brought them all here. Because they can't do this alone. This is the big one, and if they stand a chance, they're going to need every last one of them. Consider each and every hero in this room deputized. As of this moment, everyone here is a member of the Justice League, and they need to get ready for the war. Guy Gardner asks if they're going to be passing out paper cups with poisoned Kool-Aid next, or was he supposed to bring his own? Ted Kord, the second Blue Beetle, bumps Guy telling him that Guy might not be the most tactful, but he has a point. All of them just watched him kill the entire Justice League single-handedly in that vision. Hawk Girl lowers her head and quietly says, you can't, under her breath. And as Wonder Woman stops, Sir Superman tells them that that is why they have brought everyone here today. Starman? Starman goes on telling them all that he has a plan, but they're going to have to hear him out because it's going to sound crazy. First, imagine the multiverse as a symphony of life and energy, all of its elements operating in harmony with one another. As some of the most powerful forces in the universe, it is no coincidence that some of the world's greatest heroes are tied to those energies. The speed force gives the universe motion. The emotional spectrum gives the universe feeling. The sphere of gods give the universe magic and the life force connects all living beings down to their souls. The collective unconsciousness grants them wisdom and knowledge and the dimensional superstructure of the multiverse governs all things imaginable and unimaginable. Think of those forces almost like strings stretched out across the instrument that is their multiverse. Now each of these forces also has a darker cousin, the seven hidden energies of creation. And across the last year, Luther and his Legion of Doom have unlocked each of those hidden energies. In doing so, Luther learned the truth that their multiverse had been born once before, forged with those seven dark energies instead of the seven harmonious forces. The celestial being responsible was called Perpetua, and in their original multiverse, she'd made a realm that would live forever, where the strong would feed on the weak and rule for all of eternity. But her sons, the Monitor, the Anti-Monitor, and the World Forger, they stopped her and locked her away in the Source Wall so that they could rebuild the multiverse again properly this time, governed by the seven positive energies. Lex now wields six of those seven dark energies with a piece of the totality left by his father. He is attempting to return Perpetua's true powers to her, and she is already powerful enough to have remade him into one of the original men, an apex predator. Soon he will unlock the seventh and final force, and it is believed to be tied to faith, and faith and doom is spreading. Just as Lex is connected to the dark energies with his piece of totality, they too are connected to the shard that burns inside of the cosmic rod. There are two small fragments that were separated when the totality fell to Earth, one falling into the past and one falling into the future. The plan is that they send core league members to each timeline and retrieve those and bring them back. 
the World Forger stands up, telling them all that the totality is formed and brought to them. His brother and he, with the help of the Anti-Monitor, will use it to seal their mother away for good. Starman continues telling everyone that later today, with the help of the World Forger and Monitor, he will open up the gateways to the other fragments of the totality. As the meeting ends, Hawk Girl flies off, but Superman rushes to stop her. He tells her that they need all of them for this, and if she has any misgivings, she asks. Misgivings? <laughs> no, no misgivings, just sinking doubts. Not sinking doubts, I have a soaring conviction that we will fail. Maybe this could have worked if they had had the Martian Manhunter with them. Maybe, but this, this isn't a plan. It's a wild goose chase to prolong the inevitable. Superman says that he's worried about her. He may be Superman, but he knows the dark places a mind will go when they see a friend die. Hawker flies off, telling him that she'll be fine. They have work to do. But as she leaves, a hooded man wearing a mask steps out of the shadows, stating, Yes, they do. A short while later, the World Forger and the Monitor finish their work on the gateways and Starman begins his preparations to allow travel between the timelines. Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman will take the gateway to the future, while Flash and Jon Stewart will go into the past. With both teams gone, Mera and Hawkgirl will help the World Forger and Monitor locate their brother so that they can convince him to help them. Everyone ready? Everyone nods, and with that, Starman activates the gateway, but as everyone begins to walk through it, the World Forger says that there is something wrong. The Monitor tells him that he can feel it too. What does it mean? And that's when the Hooded Man from before jumps in shouting, it means the Justice League will die. Mera leaps in the way of the man, telling him that he has no hope of stopping them, but the man dodges her attack, stating that they failed to see the fatal flaw from this plan. It has doomed them all, and there is no other way. Before Mera could strike again, the man jumps into one of the portals, setting off an explosion, destroying both gateways and any chance the League members have of returning to the current time. Somewhere in the future. Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman all fall out of their portal into a dark world, and as they get up, a voice yells, GET THE HELL DOWN! Superman looks up to see a Brainiac drone with the Doom sigil on its chest, pointing an energy blaster right at them. The drone fires as several individuals knock the heroes away. As Superman says the blast was ionized kryptonite. How did they know to use kryptonite? And as the smoke clears, a voice from before tells them, I might be able to explain it. My name is Commandy, and these animals are my friends. I'm the last boy on Earth, and you're about two weeks too late to save your future. Meanwhile, in the past, John and the Flash find themselves in an old warehouse, and the Flash asks, why is it when he looks out the windows, he can see a doom sigil strung up everywhere? John tells him that this is New York in the early 20th century, but how the hell did the symbol end up here? Just then, a yellow flash zooms by the two, and a green flame surrounds them. And a voice tells them that this is their secret headquarters, and they have some questions. John yells that they're not here to fight anyone, and the flash follows up, stating that they came from the future to save reality. Please, we need your help, but who are you? The Jay Garrick flash tells them that they are the Justice Society of America, son. You're about two weeks too late to save your past. The Flash looks at everyone and asks, Who exactly is the Justice Society of America? And Jay tells him, Oh no, son, you're in our headquarters in our time. Now you need to tell us who you are and what you want, or we're going to have to show you why you don't mess with the Justice Society. Flash tells them all to wait. Everyone knows that by hero rules that a league outranks a society. So you need to explain, right, John? John tells them, look. Me and my friend here are just shocked. We've never heard of superheroes in the 1940s, but the truth is, whoever you are, your help is needed or everything will be lost. Meanwhile, in the far future, Wonder Woman asks how did Brainiac take over the entire realm? And Commandy says that the robots started showing up about a few weeks ago, thousands of them. They overran Tiger City in just hours and then the rest of the world. From the Snake City all the way to Leopard Sea, they called it the second great disaster since the first one brought down all of humanity. As Commandy goes on, Brainiac listens in on the conversation from the comfort of his ship with the heroes none the wiser. Back in the past, Jay asks their Dr. Fate if this could all be a trick by the wizard or his injustice society trying to get one over on them. Dr. Fate stares for a moment and tells him that as unlikely as it seems, I sense that these two are who they say they are. Flash tells him, of course, I'm the Flash and my friend here is the Green Lantern. Alan Scott and Jay Garrick, the Flash and Green Lantern of the 1940s, look at each other, with Jay laughing, stating, ha, you must be confused. We're the Flash and the Green Lantern. John explains that in their time, their Starman sent them back to recover a very powerful shard that would seem to have come from a comet, but it's something far more dangerous. 
The villains who have been ravaging their cities for the last few weeks are from the future and they're also looking for that fragment. Our Man and Sandman state that this doesn't make much sense. They've never heard of the Justice Society of America. Has their existence been erased from history? Jay smiles and says that if that's the case, they should all introduce themselves. This is Our Man, Sandman, Starman, Hawkman, Dr. Fate, Wildcat, Green Lantern, and the Flash of Keystone City. All together, we make up the Justice Society of America. Flash says that they have an Adam and a Starman, but the others are strangers. In fact, it's almost like deja vu. Like he and Jay have a whole history together that's right on the tip of his mind, but all he can remember is an echo. John asks Alan if there's other lanterns from the core in this timeline. Anyone on Oa? And Alan says that he's never heard of a core or of Oa. He thought he came up with the name himself. He found a magic ring after a train accident a few years ago. It can do almost anything that he can think of, but it's weak to wood. Are there any more like them out there? Dr. Fate yells, no. It seems clear that the timelines have been altered, perhaps many times over. It is dangerous for any of us to be interacting at all. Starman then says that he might know what the Justice League is after. This Legion of Doom that we're battling, they've been targeting him, trying to steal the cosmic rod from a power source that sounds similar to their comet. However, the source was entrusted to the United States government to see if their scientists could get any use out of it. And if they get dragged into this new world war, then they took the shard to the military base in the Pacific. If they could get to it, it could mean a way home. Flash says that it sounds like they're about to have themselves the first ever Justice League, Justice Society team up. Meanwhile, in the future, Commandy guides the heroes down into the old ruins that was the Hall of Justice, telling them that no one comes here, not even the animals. A Superman begins to walk forward, he stops, stating that they're not alone. And that's when the drones charge out of the shadows and Superman and Wonder Woman quickly get to work dismantling the robots. Commandy watches, saying to himself that he's never seen anyone fight like that before. Is this what it's like back in your time? Is this why people believed in you? Batman takes one of the drone's heads and begins to sink with it. As the information passes from the cowl, he says, My god, Brainiac captured entire fragments of hypertime and imprisoned them on his ship. Hundreds of universes' possible futures have been bottled, including this one. Superman focuses and says that Brainiac must also be looking for the peace of the totality. But the peace that they're looking for is not in this world, it's in one of the bottles. And they have to beat Brainiac to it. But how can they get to the size needed to travel between worlds and not be noticed? And Wonder Woman tells him that she has an idea. But back in the past, Dr. Fate opens up a portal to a lush tropical island with a flash telling him that it's a good sign. Nothing's on fire, no sign of the Legion. But just then, The Flash and John hear Starman's voice calling out to them that they have to hurry and find a way home. They must hurry! Flash asks John if he heard that, and John tells him, yeah. And now suddenly he has a bad feeling about this. Flash turns to Wildcat asking where are they, and Wildcat tells him that they're in the U.S. territory on the outside of the Pacific. The natives call it Hawaii. Beats New York, huh? Just then, there's a siren going off in the distance, and John asks, what day is it? Wildcat tells him, December 7th. 1941. Why? What's wrong? And that's when the Flash looks up at the sign that reads, Naval Station, Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, in the future, Commandy asks if they're serious. This ship was buried under all that rubble for the last few hundred years. And Batman tells them that they built this ship using white door star technology. And Wonder Woman adds on that they use this ship to miniaturize Batman and send him inside of Superman's body. Batman flies the ship through electrons, connecting the bottle up into the computer and through to the next when Superman stops him, telling him, this is the one. The ship pops out of the glass into the next future, and as the technology of this world interacts with the ship, it overrides its systems, shutting off the ship. Batman yells to brace for impact, and the ship crash lands through a building and into the ground. Everyone gets out, and a group of people walk towards the wreckage with one stating, Greetings, Kryptonian. We're Justice League A. Unfortunately, your hopes are all for naught, because all futures belong to Brainiac. Lex and Perpetua watch over as Sinestro, Grodd, and Cheetah fly with planes after the bombing of Pearl Harbor as Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman are facing their future counterparts, and Perpetua says that she can feel it. Their soldiers are tipping the scales firmly in their favor, and all of time is slipping into the hands of doom. Lex sends out a broadcast to everyone, telling them, This is it. We've reached the end of the universe. Hear me now. Kill the Justice League at any cost! But also, at the end of the universe is a small floating island, with the Anti-Monitor stepping out asking if they see why they were sent into time to fight. Do they see the scale of this war? The hooded figure from before says that they do, and it frightens them. 
The anti-monitor tells him that it should. His old friends race here, but they will not like what they find. And now he must ask his ally, will you fight alongside him to the very end? The man takes off his mask, telling him, yes, my lord, you can count on me. You can count on Aquaman. Back in the early days of the morning of December 7th, 1941, Jon Stewart and The Flash find themselves in one of history's most notorious surprise attacks. The attack on Pearl Harbor. Jon Stewart and Alan Scott fight off the aerial attacks while Flash and Jay Garrick focus on rescuing the soldiers on the aircraft carriers below. While Wildcat and Our Man and the others help with the survivors who were overboard, Dr. Fate senses something coming from one of the battleships. It's a piece of Starman's cosmic rod, and it's on a classified aircraft carrier codenamed the Hail Mary. Starman sends out the call to the Flashes and the Green Lanterns, and the four of them quickly converge on the coordinates that they were given. Meanwhile, up in the sky, Sinestro tells Grodd and Cheetah that the League and their allies are headed back towards a specific ship, and they must be stopped. Focus all bombing on that target. Grodd begins to channel his power, stating that he can do more than just that. He can see them through the soldiers' eyes. He can twist their minds, make them see what the Justice League truly is. Target practice. Down below, everyone runs through the hallway as the soldiers open fire and Alice Scott asks, what is going on? The US soldiers are on our side. The Flash tells him that it's no use. They're under psychic hypnosis. It has to be Grodd. Starman then calls out that they're running out of time. The totality shard is just on the other side of the wall. Jon Stewart and Alan Scott then get to work tearing down the steel walls, and inside it is just as Starman said, the piece of the totality that Jon Stewart and the Flash were sent to retrieve from the present day. But before they can even step inside, there's a flash of ultraviolet light as Sinestro melts away the metal, telling the heroes, you will step away from the totality if you wish to have your deaths painless. Cheetah starts to reach out for the totality, but as she does, she begins to feel some rumbling from the outside. And it's at that moment that a giant tentacle breaks through the hull, pulling Sinestro, Grodd, and Cheetah out into the ocean. Out on the beach, Wildcat asks our man, I'm not hallucinating, right? Sharks and dolphins are pulling people out of the bay? But back in the ship, Jon Stewart asks Flash if he really thinks that it could be. And the Flash asks, who else do you think it could be? And how is it even possible? As the Flash finishes his question, a giant tentacle reaches back inside but this time, it's holding a person. The hooded man says, you have to forgive my dramatic introduction. I have made an unlikely ally who saw that you may need help. I have come to tell you something that you all need to know. Even with the totality, this mission and the others in the future are destined to fail. Doom has all but won, but there's still a chance to turn the tide. To do that, the Justice League needs its Aquaman. Jay asks, is this a friend of yours? John says, he was, but he died. How is it even possible that he's here? Aquaman reaches out, grabbing the totality, telling the others, we gotta get this where it needs to go. We're going to have to get to Atlantis, and fast. Meanwhile, in the present day, Lex's ship is traveling to the ends of the universe with a Thanagarian fleet focusing their combined attacks on the shields of Lex's ship. As the attacks are deflected, Shiara Hall sends out a broadcast that they need to fall back. Their attacks are useless and they need to send word to the Justice League. Lex listens in on the message, but instead of blocking it, he amplifies it. The Legion of Doom that is located in the past and the future reports that they do not have the pieces of the totality yet, but they're quickly closing in on their locations. However, there is a growing concern amongst the Legion, a question that cannot be answered yet. What guarantee do they have that Perpetual will return them to the correct timeline? Lex assures them to have faith. Once Perpetua achieves full strength, her powers are limitless. As the connection fades, Perpetua tells Lex that he must not be upset over the Legion's doubts. Even now, she can feel their agent's actions echoing throughout time. Doom is spreading. The League is losing. And as her power returns, the multiverse will become a brutal paradise by their own hands, as she always intended it to be. There is only one child of hers who has ever served her so. The Slayer of Worlds. The Anti-Monitor. With him at their side, their victory will be absolute. But as the final preparations and contact is made to the Anti-Monitor, Perpetua finds that her son remains in hiding. She calls out to him, stating that she understands why he hid from his traitorous brothers, but he need not hide any longer. Mother is here. The Anti-Monitor says that she misunderstands. His actions were not that of hiding, but that of preparing. The multiverse has seen such horror, and he sees now that finally the source of it all, the origin of all of this pain, including his own, 
He did not come to the end of the universe to help her. He has come to stop her. The Anti-Monitor sides with justice. Now, brothers, let's bring her down. And as a swirling light begins to fade, the Monitor, the World Forger, along with Starman and Hawk Girl, step through the portal. Meanwhile, in the future, the Justice Legion is surrounding the Trinity with Batman stating that he's got a few taser rings on hand. It might be powerful enough to break Brainiac's control nodes on those heroes. Superman tells him, no, not without lobotomizing this Justice Legion. Commandy, the last boy on Earth, looks around stating that whatever they're going to do, they need to do it fast. They're losing ground. Future Superman says, the boy is right. There is no escape. Wonder Woman quickly lassos the future Hour Man to try and slow them down, and as she does, he says something strange. He's a Diamond Generation intelligent machine colony, DNA programmed with Tyler Merkelo's gene bio software. I am Hour Man. I am the master of time, and time is breaking. Overriding Brainiac's protocols, at that exact moment, the control nodes on the back of the other heroes begin to light up as they short out, with the future Batman yelling, my mind is back! Is that the original Justice League? Soon the heroes and their counterparts begin to focus their attacks on Brainiac's drones, all fighting in unison. And with Brainiac's control broken, Wonder Woman tells everyone to consider this a family reunion. Superman then says, We all know that this isn't a family reunion without at least one good fight. As the last of the drones fall, the future Starman says that he does not know them, but he has a sense that they have seen them all before. With that, he can sense that they are here for his cosmic rod. The one that he has hidden away within Our Man when Brainiac first appeared. And as Our Man pulls out the piece of the totality that is located within his chest, Brainiac projects himself stating, You are a foolish android. Even your advanced technology is no match for the intellect of Brainiac. This is a message for the Justice League. I would like you to understand exactly what I have at my disposal. The technologies of hundreds of advanced societies belong to Brainiac now, and I am upgrading my systems. You may now call me Brainiac One Million. Prepare for your annihilation. Commandy looks up at the giant Brainiac asking what is he doing, but Wonder Woman tells him that she knows that he is afraid, but he must take this piece of the totality. He must guard it with his life. His world may be dark, but deep down he knew that this fight would not be hopeless. So right now, their friends are fighting alongside them across the multiverse. They all have to do this. They all have to fight against doom. All of them. But meanwhile, back in the past, our heroes are swimming towards Atlantis, with Aquaman stating that they must move quickly to make sure that they aren't noticed. But before they can even reach the gate, the Atlantean guards stop them, telling them that it's too late outside. Surrender to the Atlantean guard. Wildcat cracks his knuckles, stating that he's been itching for a real good fight. Aquaman calls to everyone to stand down. They surrender, and they need to be brought to the king. Off in the distance, Sinestra watches, with his ring glowing, reporting that they have their sights on the Justice League. Make sure our prisoner is ready for his grand entrance. As everyone enters the throne room, Aquaman asks where is their king, and one of the guards tells him that they will not take that tone from a surface dweller. Aquaman pleads with the Atlanteans, telling them that he is from the Atlantis of the future. He knows the king. He is the heir and he needs to speak with him. But at that moment, there's an explosion of ultraviolet light, and as the smoke clears, Cheetah holds Poseidon, telling him, the next time he hits Atlantis, try to make sure he brings down the whole city. Poseidon struggles as he tries to get up from his knees, stating, yes, my goddess. Aquaman shouts that the Legion of Doom is here. We need to speak with the king. But another voice calls out, stating that the king has ceded his authority to someone who knows what this world faces. Atlantis belongs to Vandal Savage and his Legionnaires Club. Now hand over the totality that may allow you to live. Meanwhile, in the present, the World Forger lifts his mighty hammer, swinging it with Hawkgirl right behind him. But as their attacks are deflected off of Lex's shield, Lex stands there and smiles. Hawkgirl tells him to fight, but Lex says that they're doing so well on their own. You're wearing out the last of your strength against our shields. See, I have done the math. There is no way that you could possibly win. Perpetua calls out to her children that they must understand the futility of their actions here today. This is their last chance. Join arms with her today and they shall be forgiven for their betrayal. The Monitor tells her that they will join arms today, but not with her. 
From this day forth, the Brothers Three will act as one. They will unleash the power of creation that exists within them as the firstborn children of the multiverse. Perpetua shouts that they are fools. They contain the energies of the respective domains, but they lack the power to shape them. And the Monitor responds with, then perhaps they do not have the power of the totality. But Starman does. And with his powers coursing through them, they can do this. They can merge. So the World Forger asks his brothers if they sense it. And the Anti-Monitor tells them yes. Power unlike anything that he has felt before. The Monitor tells everyone that apart, they are the Brothers Three. But together, they are the Ultra Monitor. Defender of the multiverse in all of its aspects. They are equal to Perpetua's power. And they will not let her win. Petra screams to Lex to kill the abomination that was her children. But as Lex gets ready for his attack, Hawk Girl appears before him telling him, you might want to get a new calculator because it looks like your math is a little messed up. The Ultra Monitor clashes with Perpetua, but while they battle, Hawk Girl focuses all of her strength on Lex Luthor. Lex lunges trying to grab a hold of her, but Hawk Girl cracks Lex in the face with her mace, stating that he is not the apex predator that he thinks he is. And Lex asks her, is that so? Should I tell you what Martian Manhunter's last thoughts were before his body was assimilated? The last pathetic streaks of Jean Jean's. Do you want to know? Rage fills Hawk Girl's entire being, and she screams for him to not ever say that name again. She will kill him before he does. She spreads her wings to release her power and the monitor says that that energy, Starman said that it lived in her and that he couldn't have hoped to believe it. Starman flies down yelling to Hawkgirl that she needs to stop. She is triggering her power too soon. She needs to use it to fuel the ultra monitor when the time is right. If she burns out before the team gets her with the totality, all of this will be for nothing. She shouts to Starman that that is enough. She will stop this right here, right now. And Lex calls out asking, Do you think I care about your light show? You are nothing compared to me. She takes her mace, slamming it into his head, telling him, There is an energy in her as old as the universe itself, and it's all she needs to end him. Meanwhile, in the future, as the heroes in one future charge towards the Brainiac 1 million robot, Wonder Woman tells everyone that they can do this if they work together. Brainiac 1 million fires a concentrated blast through the group, stating that that is incorrect. As Brainiac 1 million, I am growing at an exponential rate. My processing power is beyond anything that you have encountered. I have infinite futures of death at my fingertips. Kryptonite life forms from the 25th century, god killer snares from the 59th, and these kill drones, a descendant of the ones built by Batman only a century after his time. Hope is futile, resistance is futile, submit to Brainiac. Commandy watches as the heroes are defeated one by one and he tells himself that he has to do something. Wonder Woman said to get help, but there is no help here. It's just a matter of time before. Wait, that's it! Commandy runs off, and as he returns, he finds himself in a futuristic city. He says that right now, in the face of the greatest disaster, he sees a different message in the old story. They cannot fight alone, not this time. And a voice tells him that they understand. What do they need to win? And Commandy stands before Justice League Unlimited, telling them that they need more justice. Starting in the past, Cheetah leans down as she snarls into Poseidon's ear, telling him that he needs to listen very carefully. She was once cursed by his kind for speaking the truth, but today, you will hear it from her lips. And the truth is, it's time. Time for the gods to fall and the new gods to rise. Now do as commanded or die on your knees. Poseidon weakly responds, yes, I will obey. Cheetah yells, good! Stop holding back. You are Poseidon, god of the seas, the tempest, and the fury. Unleash all that power that you have inside. Destroy Atlantis and all within. As the torrents begin to rip apart the Atlantis of old, inside Vandal Savage says that his answer still remains. His Legionnaire Club has assumed command of Atlantis and they will not help the Justice Society. Aquaman shouts that the city's outer ring has fallen. And in moments, Poseidon will be upon them, you wretched caveman. John stops him. Look, we just need to talk this out. The moment to act is now. No matter what you've planned, Vandal, it won't work. I've seen it. The Legionnaires discover the nature of the totality, and instead of facing its impact, you try to move the Earth out of the way. The act ends up helping your enemies, the ones attacking at this very moment, Savage. If they acquire the totality, they'll unlock it and kill everyone. Right now, every fight in the universe, all of it, comes down to what is going to be done in this room right now. So I'm asking, 
please act with us. Savage pauses for a moment to think and then tells them, Fine. You will bring me this artifact, the Conch of Orion. Just know that if any of you fools decide to betray us, Alan then stops. You can trust us. The Justice Society will fight against Poseidon and the Legion of Doom. We'll give you all the time you need to open up that portal. Meanwhile, in the future, Brainiac 1 million grabs our heroes, telling them that it's no use. With this iteration of the multiverse dying, he and he alone will hold the history of all that came before. And then there will be new information to record. Understand, this is the end of history. All that remains is doom. And then a voice shouts, not so fast. I think Justice still has a fighting chance. Everyone, go! Dozens of heroes, if not hundreds, all charge forward, led by Commandy and they quickly get to work dismantling all of Brainiac 1 million's drones. As Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman fall to the ground, Commandy runs over telling them that he went to every future that he could get to in their White Dwarf ship. He found every Justice League and hero that he could find in all of the futures that Brainiac captured. Hopefully, it's enough. Wonder Woman tells him that he's done well. For someone who's used to fighting alone, he makes a great teammate. Commandy laughs, telling her that she was the one who said it best. When you're fighting for good, you're never really alone, right? Brainiac 1 million tells everyone, it does not matter. You will be destroyed and assimilated. The future Starman holds Brainiac 1 million back, stating that they won't hold this forever. He's gonna call out every other Starman in the entire universe, future and past. If anyone's listening, we are running out of time. Meanwhile, in the present day, Ultra Monitor is battling against Perpetua while Starman and Hawk Girl are keeping Lex Luthor busy. Starman calls out to Hawkgirl that she cannot waste all of her power on Lex. They're going to need it to power up the Ultra Monitor. This is their chance to win. They cannot risk it. Hawkgirl shouts that they might be able to hold Lex off, but she can hurt him. And right now, she's not going to waste time worrying if whether the rest of the league is going to make it on time. If they can take down Luther now, they'll cut off Perpetua's right hand. Starman hesitates, telling her to just stay close, because when the moment comes, they're going to need her to act together or they will lose. And Lex Luthor asks, telling him, Come on now, you've already lost. Back in the past, the Justice Society is holding back the Legion of Doom while Starman is finishing up his preparations, and he tells everyone that once things are ready, he'll be calling out to the Starmen of the future. If the frequency is right, they will receive his call. Starmen, do you hear me? And at that very second, the Starmen across all time hear the call. Their powers begin to connect to one another, all thinking and feeling as one. The Starman of the present cries out to the others that it is time. Send your teams through the gates to the Hall of Justice. He will open up the last portal and take them here for the final battle. Perpetua watches, stating, No! No! I will not allow this to happen! And she reaches out, but the Ultra Monitor grabs her, telling her, That is enough. Your time has come to an end, Mother. The teams in the past and the future all run through their portals to the Hall of Justice, and they make their way towards the portal to the end of the universe. With Lex distracted on the possibility of losing, Hawk Girl attacks again, but she misses. The Ultra Monitor calls out that they need her power, but as Hawk Girl is rushing over to help him, Lex stabs her in the back mid flight, stopping her from powering up the Ultra Monitor. Starman then yells that they need to keep control of Perpetua. In a few moments, the portal will open. And at that moment, the portal begins to close before it can open. Starman looks around asking, what, what's happening? And Lex bursts out laughing. <laughs> it's over! Enough of the world has sided with doom! The seventh energy is unlocked. The balance is tipped, and it's all thanks to you. Perpetua begins to stand up, stating that she can feel them, all of them. The hearts of the multiverse have sided with doom. And now Perpetua has risen. The Ultra Monitor yells out that they will stop her. They caged her once before and they will do so again. And she glares down telling the Anti-Monitor, one of the beings inside of the Ultra Monitor making him up, that he was the one who brought the multiverse to its knees. He has shown her his displeasure. She knows where his loyalties truly lie. Stop these games. Take control of the Ultra Monitor as you wanted. Take back the scale of power that you have ached for all of these years. I gift you back your anti-life. The Monitor and the World Forger try to cling onto the hold that they have on their brother, but the power that the Anti-Monitor has is too much. And now in full control of the Ultra Monitor, he stands tall in his newest form, yelling, Hell Perpetua! She then brings Starman close to her palm, telling him that he is just a little speck that stole a piece of her power. Can he sense how insignificant he truly is now? Starman looks at her, 
I thought we won. I felt all the Starmen. It should have been enough. Perpetua closes her hand, crushing Starman, stating, Alas, it wasn't. Die, Speck! Now there's a whole multiverse there to reshape in my image. Where should I begin? Meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice, Superman speaks with the Starman of the past, asking if there's something that they can do. They had the pieces of the totality. The portal was opening. What happened? Starman tells him that the connection between all of them just cut out. There's only one thing that comes to mind that Will Payton, the Starman of the present day and their league, is dead. Commandy sits in the corner telling everyone that this is the end. The last great disaster. In his time, the word disaster is formed from two words. Dis for bad and aster for stay. And if what's above them right now isn't the baddest star of all, who knows what is? Batman then says that they need to hurry up and get to Kendra and Shane. There is a team capable of traveling long distance in a short amount of time, and that's the Titans. As he hurries over to Steel's boom room, he finds Miss Martin on the floor bleeding from her nose. And when he asks what happened, Miss Martian tells him that all of that entropy, all of that hatred and fury came at her. It was a scream of rage echoing in the mind of every person on the planet and beyond. The psychic energy of the multiverse just hit a tipping point. People are angry, they're afraid. Their selfish need is being amplified by the signal. Superman asks if the signal is meant for them. Is it like a psychic warning? And Miss Martian asks, you really don't know, do you? It's not just here. The signal in the sky, that's the mark of doom. It's everywhere and everyone can see it. Not just in their world, but across the multiverse. And over in Gotham of Earth-19, Perpetua appears with a thundering crack a boom She looks at the premature Gotham, stating that this Earth has been stunted, held back to a more primitive age compared to the others of their time. This universe is rotting from the center. It heard the echoes of doom throughout all of reality, and still it clung to justice. This could not be allowed. And just like that, the universe of Earth-19 disappears. Trillions of lives gone in a single instant. There were 52 universes in this perversion of Perpetua's multiverse. Now, there are 51 for her to correct. However, it does not end there. Armies must rise, and they will be led by their general, Lex Luthor the apex predator. And he shall hold the flag high as the armies destroy worlds one after another. The eternal battle will begin where doom triumphs over justice over and over again, and he will live and fight forever. And out in space, the javelin floats with its two lone passengers, Hawk Girl and Shane. Shane is trying to activate the controls, but Hawk Girl tells him it's no use. This is all her fault. She was stupid and selfish. She has doomed the multiverse, trying to get revenge for Jean. If he was here, he would have stopped her. It's just after losing so many battles, she was sure that this was right. And Shane tells her that he can still feel his presence in Luther's life force. She did what she did because of her love for Jean. She did it to protect what she thought would be lost if Luther won, and he loves her for it. And that's when a transmission comes on with Batman yelling over the comms, asking if they can hear him. They have the pieces of the totality, and they need to know what happened out there. Shade responds, telling them that they're lost up there. Starman is dead, and the Anti-Monitor betrayed them. Perpetua is more powerful than she ever was before. She's already destroyed an entire universe. His mother was stabbed, and they're flying nowhere. And as Batman tries to press the return home button, the lights all begin to blink, and Shane realizes that the ship is crashing. Hawk Girl and Shane are going to be lost in space forever. Somebody, somebody has to find them. Somebody has to save them. Batman, please. But at that moment, Lex is rallying his soldiers, telling them that the bird has been clipped, and their focus will now be on the defeat of the League. Their victory is all but assured, but he has learned that it is unwise to underestimate the League. Perpetua tells him that she agrees. Perhaps it is time for him to prove his worth. And Lex asks how so. So Perpetua says that she'll give him everything that he needs and he will kill them all. Lex tells her that he's been waiting for this part. As a light shines on the stone altar deep within the Hall of Justice, Batman places his hand down upon it. Superman's voice tells him that this place was made of the lightest rock in existence. It was brought in from the Andromeda Galaxy. Most alien races call it the Floating Stone. Batman glances back, telling him that he knows what it is. He was there when they chose the damn stuff. Superman then asks, what is he doing in the chapel? And Batman tells him, nothing. A whole lot of nothing. Batman always figured out ways to win, because that's what Batman does. But this time, well, I just forget it. Time to make a speech, right? 
As Batman puts his gloves back on, Wonder Woman tells him to wait. They all need to rethink this. Come, let them place their hands on the altar together. The three heroes place their hands on the cold stone and Batman asks, what God are we praying to? Wonder Woman tells him none. They're praying to something else altogether. Meanwhile, on Lex's spaceship, the Godhead, Lex welcomes his Legion of Doom back, telling them, congratulations on a hard-won victory. Sinestro tells him that he had his doubts, but he's not too big of a man to admit when he was wrong. And Cheetah then says, yes, finally we can work in the service of a god who repays devotion. Perpetua tells them all, yes, your reward is coming, but first my son must prove his loyalty by killing the bird woman. The anti-monitor tells her, it shall be done, mother. Hail Perpetua. Brainiac then says, Hail Perpetua. With her rise, we can all assume our rightful places in the pantheon of demigods. I myself request the repository of all history. Everyone else begins to speak their wants, and Perpetua tells them that she hears their requests. But they all have even greater roles. Brainiac says, But I have so much information at my fingertips. How could I serve an even greater purpose? Perpetua's eyes flare with power as she tells him, Oh, you will. Suddenly, Brainiac screams in pain as his entire body is ripped apart and reforms itself into a large machine, asking, What is happening? Perpetua says that what is happening is that he is assuming his rightful place as her throne. Chidi yells that their roles were supposed to surpass their wildest dreams, and Lex tells everyone, Calm down. Surely Perpetua has a reason for all of this right? She smiles, telling him, yes, she does. And the reason is him. Just then, Cable shoot out from the throne, grabbing onto Sinestro, Garad, and Cheetah, and he begins to pull them in, with Lex shouting, there must be a reason for this. The Legion all cry out for help, with a voice in the back of Lex's mind telling him that he knows that this isn't right. He reaches out as Cheetah curses him, but once everyone is secure within the machine, Perpetua tells Lex to ease his mind, as she said before, this is for him. Lex takes a step forward and he feels a rush of power flood within him and he asks, what is happening? Perpetua says that she did this for him. Now he wields the power of all seven dark forces. He is truly her favorite son now. Just wait until he sees his army. But while Lex is siphoning the powers from his former legion back at the Hall of Justice, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman call upon every known hero. Wonder Woman tells them that Luther is coming that he has the powers at his disposal that he's never had before, that the scales of the universe have tipped towards doom. The forces that they depend on are weaker than they ever were before. They cannot stop him or the God that he worships. Make no mistake, he will crush them, as Starman's prophecy has foretold. Superman steps forward telling them that he has known Luther for years. There is only one thing that he has ever believed in, himself. He would often say that he was doing it for the greater good of mankind, but it would never last. But now he's something else. He fights for something far more dangerous than any weapon or dark force. He fights with faith. Green Arrow asks, so what are we supposed to do? It's a losing fight, right? We have no way to win? And Batman tells them, no, we don't. And maybe that's the point. We don't show them that you can win. We show them that we believe in them even when they can't. We go down swinging. If we do that, using the pieces of the totality that we rescued from the past and the future, connecting to everyone, showing them who we are, maybe it'll make a difference. Miss Martian sighs, stating that she cannot connect everyone, even with the help of the other League telepaths. She is not her uncle. And Batman tells her, No, we need Shane and Hawkgirl back here now. The boy has the power of the sixth dimension in him, but they are lost in the Promethean galaxy. Meanwhile, over in the Promethean Galaxy, Hawkgirl works tirelessly in repairing the Javelin, while Shane tells her that she must rest. Her wounds haven't healed. Hawkgirl says that her pains hurt like hell, but she's done plenty to earn the hurt right now. If she doesn't fight through the pain, they're both dead. She might deserve this, but he doesn't. Shane tells her that he understands her actions. They were motivated by love. There's no foolishness in that. And that's when a voice laughs, stating, ah, the ignorance of children. As that voice finishes, a powerful blast tears through the javelin, and the anti-monitor grabs Hot Girl, telling her, there is nothing in the multiverse more foolish than love. She struggles, yelling, you betrayed us! You turned on your brothers! And he tells her, yes, I did. And now I will crush you in my hand, just as I should have, billions of years ago. 
back on Earth, Lex flies down in his ship to the Hall of Justice, telling them to step out of the building. Lay down your weapons. Justice League, subjugate yourselves to Perpetua. You will still die a horrible, lingering death. But we don't need to waste time, do we? Batman calls out, Everyone, this is it. Get into battle positions. Lex tells Batman that he can picture him inside of that little control room with no tricks left, the oppressing walls closing in. It must feel like a tomb. Batman pushes a button telling him, When I built this place, I did have one last trick in mind. A final measure for a moment like this, when things seemed bleak. Everyone rushes outside of the walls of the Hall of Justice shake as they slowly float into the air. Batman yells to everyone that this is it. Let's finish this! Lex bursts out laughing. <laughs> Surely you're smart enough to surrender. Jaro then says, I got a newsflash. Batman is nowhere near that smart. In fact, I think we're all about to get real stupid in here. Right, Dad? Lex calls out to his army. The time has come. Kill them all. But as Lex's human Martian hybrid army charges forward inside of the Hall of Justice, the League joins together with the Star Men of the past and the future in an attempt to bring the totality back together. The Star Man of the future says that they can't connect with everyone, and Hawk Girl and the Brothers 3, they are tapped into the power. But it's a long shot. Superman shouts that they have to try. Once the totality is whole, each of us will have a connection to a positive force. We can channel those and we'll supercharge this place, and that symbol in the sky will falter. As everyone tightens their grips with one another, the piece of the totality begins to merge together. Just then, there's an explosion and the entire Hall of Justice shakes. The totality splits apart and Miss Martian tells everyone that the Sigil is back at full strength. She can't reach anyone. Superman calls out that they need Shane and Hawkgirl. But meanwhile, back in the Promethean Galaxy, the Anti-Monitor concentrates all of his strength into a beam, blasting into Hawkgirl, telling her that she is simply delaying the inevitable. She protects Shane with her wings spread open, with Shane yelling, LEAVE MY MOTHER ALONE! The Anti-Monitor stops his attack and Hawkgirl falls to the ground, telling the Anti-Monitor, If you want my wings, then you're damn well gonna have to get them yourself. The Anti-Monitor begins to charge back up again, and then suddenly everyone hears honking in the distance. As the Anti-Monitor looks back, there's a loud THOOM as the Flash car crashes into the Anti-Monitor at full force. The power from the crash throws the brothers apart, and the Anti-Monitor jumps to his feet, shouting, I will absorb the Monitor and the Forger again. Suddenly, a giant green construct of a tank appears above the Anti-Monitor's head. And Jon Stewart tells him, If he takes one more step, he'll absorb something. And it ain't gonna be the Brothers 3. Hawk Girl calls out to Jon, telling him that he needs to take Shane back. She's too weak to. But he stops her, telling her, There's no way that I can do that. No one gets left behind, Shiara. The only problem is, we don't have a ride home. As the World Forger gets up, Shane asks, Can't he open up a portal? And the World Forger stands, telling them, I could if I hadn't been drained of all my energy by my traitorous brother. To make portals, I need to strike my hammer with enough power to spark the creation of a portal. Right now, I barely have enough to even lift my arms. As the Anti-Monitor gets up, he calls out across the multiverse to Perpetua, I need your help. Your son needs your help. Meanwhile, over in the universe of Earth-44, Perpetua gets ready to destroy another Earth when she hears the faint cries of her son. She thinks to herself that she might have an idea. She picks up the entire planet, she holds it steady, and then she throws it with all of her might in the direction of the Anti-Monitor. Shane says that he can hear screaming, a psychic pain, Perpetua has done something. And the Monitor yells, you fool, you want her love, she hurled a planet at us, she has nearly killed us all. The World Forger stares down at his hammer telling them, no. Maybe not all of us. I may not be able to strike my hammer hard enough to create a portal, but the impact of that planet, it might be enough to create a small gateway. The Monitor tells him that he won't be able to survive the impact, and the World Forger smiles, telling him, I'm not sure that any of us can, but what these heroes have taught me is that there's no shortcut, no victory without sacrifice. And if this is going to be goodbye, it will not be a sad one, brother. The World Forger picks up his hammer with his newfound determination, and he tells everyone, You have milliseconds to make it through! In three, two, one! But back on Earth, the sides of justice and doom collide as everyone from each side try their hardest to put the other faction down. The Hall of Justice takes another blast from Lex's ship, and Batman tells everyone that the Hall is going down hard. Brace for impact! 
Wonder Woman yells that they need to get out of here, but the Starman from the past tells her to wait. He can feel something, and that's when everyone feels a strange power, and the Flash asks if John really did it. Superman screams to everyone that they need to reach out again. No! Lex releases one last barrage on the Hall of Justice as it falls to the ground, and he yells, it's finally over. And as the smoke clears, a bright light shoots into the sky that would have destroyed the Hall of Justice. And Lex steps out of his ship asking, what is going on? No, 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 no! The doom signal in the sky begins to change, and Perpetua asks, what is going on? The energy in that area, it tilts away from doom. What have you done? The blind light shines brighter, and Superman and the others walk out with radiant power. As Superman says, what Lex did was give us a fighting chance. As the sigil of justice slowly overtakes the one of doom, Lex begins to shout asking, Do you think this changes anything? Do you really think that because you created some bubble where you aren't totally powerless, that you are going to win? Superman tells him, We aren't here to win. And Wonder Woman says, We're just here to go down swinging. Lex gives the order to his army to part. He himself will be the one to fell the league. John Stewart leaps into the air with his ring charged, focused, telling him, I've built a lot of constructs over the years and pulled a few punches, but this? Some people just deserve the full power of a finger itself. The area turns into a bright green, concentrated willpower construct, ripping through the ground, blasting straight into Lex. Lex laughs as the dust begins to settle, telling John, You are a very creative builder. Do me a favor, look up. Suddenly the green fades as the ultraviolet shines, and Lex says, That is every construct you have ever made, everything, and it's all about to drop on your head. With a loud crackoom, the area is crushed underneath all of the constructs, and through it, the Flash charges in shouting, Leave John alone! Lex holds out his hand to fire the still force, but Flash ducks underneath it, landing a clean hit, punching Lex in the face. He tells him, I've spent a long time mastering the speed force. The still force will still take someone years to comprehend. Lex receives another surge of power, asking him, Is that so? Compared between the two of them, the Flash is nothing but an old man. The Still Force lashes out, grabbing a hold of the Flash as quickly as it begins to age him nearly to death. Lex bursts out laughing, yelling, <laughs> If only you could see your efforts! It's almost enough to warm my... But that's when Lex pauses, and with a sword in his back, Wonder Woman asks, What heart? I can't seem to find one. She pulls the sword upward, tearing Lex in two, telling him, You are an abomination, and this ends now. Lex's body slowly begins to knit itself back together, though. Maybe by the degree of what her gods are, but he is allied with a different god. And she likes him just fine the way he is. Without even looking back, he holds his arm out, releasing a blast of energy, launching Wonder Woman back across the field. Just then, Jaro jumps in, calling to Lex to take a good hard look. I'm naked, and now I'm on your face. Bring the smack down, Dad. Batman steps in, punching Lex in the stomach over and over with his powered-up gauntlets, and with one last hit, he knocks Lex away. He readies himself at his battle stance, and Lex tells him, I heard Batman always had a wicked tongue. Well, this makes two of us. And with a quick red lash, his tongue strikes out, cutting into Jaro and Lex turns his focus into Batman, shooting four tendrils out of his back. Lex grabs a hold of Batman, telling him, I've already broken your arms and legs. How about this time we break your neck? He reaches down, squeezing onto Batman's neck, and Batman asks him, What are you waiting for? Do it! Lex tells him that he isn't on anything, and Batman says, I wasn't talking to you. Just then, Lex glares at his side and Superman stops as he punches Lex with all of his might, sending him across the city and through several buildings. As Lex slowly walks back over, Superman stops him, telling him, This isn't you, Lex. We've known each other for a long time. And this, this is something else. But that's when a twisted smile appears on Lex's face and the two begin to clash with enough power to level the buildings. Superman grips down on Lex's hand, telling him, you may believe that it's people's nature to be dark, but Lex then overpowers Superman, punching him, shouting, You know nothing! 
I'm not like you and I never will be. We were meant to be predators. It is in our destiny, it is who we are! The punches get louder with every swing and blood begins to drip down Superman's face. As he tells him, maybe so, but it's not what I want to believe. Lex hesitates for a moment, a sheer moment, as a voice in the back of his mind says, listen. With a brief second, Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman all punch in unison, setting off a massive explosion, and the sigil of justice begins to shine brighter. But suddenly, it all stops as everyone is captured inside of a small force field. Perpetua shouts out, That is enough! If I must, I will handle matters myself. Lex tries to pick himself back up, and Shane flies over, telling him, Listen! There is good in you! I could sense it! Lex swings his arms, knocking Shane away, telling him, Then you should be able to sense this. Hot Girl quickly rushes over to help, but Lex grabs her next, telling her that he has had enough of her. Hot Girl claws at Lex's hand, telling him that there is something she wishes to tell him, and Lex is laughing. He is laughing at her, asking, Is that how you're going to come back one day and have your revenge? Tell me how much you hate me. She stops struggling and tells him that she wanted to say that she forgives him for everything. I forgive you, Albie. Lex pauses, and in that second, everything turns white as Shane jumps into Lex's mind. Lex asks, what are you doing? You both know this won't last long. And Shane tells him that he is right. He is too powerful, but there is someone in here that they have to speak to. The young Lex walks out, and Lex asks, did you think that you could appeal to my younger self to convince me to? But Shane says no. He's here to speak to his father. A young and caged Martian Manhunter stands up stating that they look alike. And Shane flies down telling him that that's right, his name is Shane. And right now, bad things are happening. He's here to set him free. See, they're both shapeshifters and they could trade places. The young Martian Manhunter says that he would be stuck here forever though. And Shane tells him that it's okay. The world needs Martian Manhunter. He's the strongest there is. The young Martian Manhunter asks if they even know each other, and Shane tells him that one day he will, hopefully. Now go, save the world. Out in the outside world, Hawkgirl screams for Shane not to do it, but Shane tells her that it's okay. Father is the only one who can connect to the world again. Goodbye, mom. I love you, but before he could finish, his body fully absorbs into Lex's and something else jumps out and a thundering voice shouts, I am Martian Manhunter, and now is the time for justice. The Martian Manhunter stands radiant in his power. He suddenly is. He can feel the heat from the burning hell, the smell of spilled blood. Whatever has happened, all he knows is that they are going to end this. He can hear everyone calling to him, asking if it's really him, but deep down, they're all asking if he can do it. Can he connect the world together like he once did? Can they really win? Perpetua telepathically tells him that he already knows the answer to that, and she lunges at him, but he shouts at her, No! I will cast you out of my mind before you can catch it. I will go beyond myself, racing past myself and you and them, faster and faster and faster until I pass on to you. I am with you. All of you. I am just a voice, but I can feel all of your fear and your anger. See the heroes and what they stand for. They do not fight to win, because truthfully, they can't. They fight to show that even without hope, your heroes will fight on. They fight together in love, in hope, and they dream that maybe they will reach higher than their own. But a counter offer has been made. A God who instead of wanting them to reach higher, wants them to reach down. Become their past selves, to become one with the basest elements. She asks that they serve her by serving themselves, but now a choice must be made. And they have chosen her over you, over each other. They may choose her again, but know this. They do not fight because they are your heroes. They fight because it is the people who are the true heroes, who they aspire to be. Perpetual punches Martian Manhunter yelling, that is enough! And a light shines with Hawkgirl calling out that something is happening to the totality. People, they're listening. Martian Manhunter shouts to use it, to cage her once more. 
and perpetual cries to her followers to kill the false heroes, to embrace the God who loves them. A God that will help them evolve into beings that they were always meant to be. Tell them, Luther. Tell them all. Luther tries to collect his thoughts and he says that he is sorry. In that moment of doubt, the shackles of the totality begin to bind at Perpetua, and she screams as she curses Martian Manhunter. Martian Manhunter calls out to everyone once again for their answers. Will they join the side of justice? Something then begins to happen in the sky, and the sigil of justice fades, and there is an ear-splitting crack a -a doom as the doom sigil reforms and shines brightly in the sky. Superman tells them, I don't understand. They were listening. They heard you. What happened? Batman pauses. We lost the vote. Perpetua crackles. (laughs) Yes, you did. But don't feel bad. It could never have gone any other way. You wanted to make your case to humanity. You wanted them to plead to be full hearted. Allow them a chance to decide. And still, they chose me. I wanted them to see the choice was real. That in this world, There is no longer any place for any of you. Superman tells her, wait. But before he can finish his sentence, there's a massive thoom as the light engulfs everyone. As the light fades, leaving nothing behind, Perpetua smiles, stating that this is the final truth. And no mind, dear Martian, is fast enough to escape it. Now that your people have chosen to side with me, now that Earth is one with doom, We can end this story as it was always meant to end, so I can begin a new universe, a new people, and give what I have promised. Elsewhere in space, Martian Manhunter begins to form from nothing, and he tells himself that this cannot be. He has to try again and again and again if he must. Martian Manhunter does just that, but for the first time in his entire life, his thoughts stop at his own skull, and he is alone. No. He will die trying. He will call out until his final breath. He will. And a voice tells him that it is no use. Batman, along with all of the other heroes, have been stripped of their powers. And they tell him that they are not heroes anymore. They can't hear you. No one can, Manhunter. The seven heroes look upon the earth. And the doom sigil is shining brightly. And Jon Stewart asks, are we dead? Aquaman says that he was just dead. And this, this is something else. Superman tries to fly, but he falls to the ground, and he looks up, stating that they told everyone their message, that there should be hope and justice, and they can save them. This can't be how this ends. It can't. Martian Manhunter tells him that he knew that this would happen. He had a premonition of exactly this moment when the totality first rocketed towards Earth. The invisible spectrum, the graveyard of the gods, finding heroes in the past. He just thought that maybe this was something that they could debunk or change or stop but he should have known. He saw it all. Another voice tells them that they did as well, and a blue glow washes over, and Batman looks up to see six figures, and he asks, is that a quintessence? Ganthet tells him, yes, this was always their fate. Batman shouts spitefully that they're supposed to be the most powerful beings in existence. Their names alone inspire awe. Why the hell didn't they help? And the High Father glares, telling them that they are the ones who saved them. So do not be so insolent when you don't understand any. The Phantom Stranger stops the High Father, telling Batman it was because we were protecting something. As everyone's powers slowly return, Superman asks, what is it that they were protecting? If it's anything that they can use to fight back with, they will try. And Wonder Woman says that they have to slow down. If this option is something dark, some deception or a lie, something that changes who they are, they must stay true even in loss. And Flash asks, are we just supposed to give up? And Aquaman tells him no. But things rise and fall with the tides, and this moment, maybe it's not theirs. Ganthet says that the Atlantean is right. What happened here was never going to work. They fought valiantly, but the darkness that overcame the universe, the lack of faith that Perpetua thrived on and used to win, it crept in on too many fronts. Events that unfolded outside of their purview. Some disconnected from the reality altogether, but were still deeply felt and impactful. Even if they had won, Perpetua would have returned. And Superman asks, what is the option that they've been protecting? Tell us. The Spectre tells him, no, they will show them. Behind the door lies a path that connects all actions, past, present, and future. This fight is bigger than justice or doom. It is everything. The Phantom Stranger then says that they must be warned, though, that in opening this door, they will bring everything to bear. It will give reckoning to every story, every event throughout history, the ones that they know, the ones that they do not. 
Now what is their choice? Superman and Batman look at each other and Superman says that they have to try. And Batman tells them that if they lose, with everything in play, Wonder Woman tells everyone to listen. Perpetua's great lie is that they matter alone. The truth is that they matter by making every life matter, honoring every story. So that's how they fight her. They make everything matter. As everyone runs towards the open door, Wonder Woman yells that they fight one last time for everything. Now the story doesn't officially end here. It actually moves into the Death Metal storyline and I'll link both Dark Knight's Metal and Death Metal down below. Maybe one day we'll do a massive combo of all of these videos as it's technically Scott Snyder's trilogy, but as it stands, click the link down below and enjoy. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again.